Hey guys. Here's part 2 of Uchiha Naruto, The Sage. Enjoy, Chapter 6, The Silent Crowd. Konoha was buzzing with a lot of activities. Everyone within the village wore a smile. All problems were forgotten, everyone chose to be happy. It was as if heaven was showering the village with bliss. Business owners were somewhat one those who the happiest of all. People from other villages had been inside the village and were buying a lot of things. More visitors meant more profits for them. Despite it being a profitable time there was still competition with the businesses. Competition did not go away, it was what drove successful businesses. Most people were making bets. The finals of the Chunin exams had arrived. Some people just wanted to enjoy good fights while some wanted to enjoy the good fights while making some money off the tournament. No one could be blamed really for making bets, it was what made the tournament worthwhile watching. Well the streets were full a few hours ago, but now they were all quiet. Only a select few could be seen within the streets of the village. The majority of people were gathered at the stadium which the finals are to be held. The stadium was full of people. There were no empty seats, each seat was taken. To some the stadium was a bit too small since not everybody could get inside the stadium. The Fire Lord as well as other leaders of other countries were also present at the stadium. Even some leaders of small villages were present at the stadium, all in the name of the Chunin Finals. They were present to observe the next generation of powerful shinobi and also to see the strength of genins from other villages. Konoha had the most genins in the finals it was good because it also gave them a chance to see if Konoha was still producing strong shinobis as it had been over the previous years. Naruto and the other contestants stood in the middle on the stadium where all could see them, they were the main attraction of the finals. Everyone had come to watch them battle, to see their prowess as genins, to see if they had what it took to become chunin. They were also representing their villages. Performing well would bring glory to their villages at the same time performing bellow par would surely take a bite on the image of their villages. Potential customers and allies were watching, it was for the benefit of their villages to do well in front of them. Each of them had trained hard for the past month, readying themselves for the finals. Each was determined to win, it was obvious in each of the contestants' face. Nobody wanted to lose in front of the whole stadium. It would be hurting to a person's pride to lose while everybody was watching especially if one bragged about being a victor at the end of the tournament. Naruto stood with his hands crossed on his chest with an impassive look on his face. Nothing much had changed with him, only his hair had grown just an inch long. Naruto's hair grew at a faster rate while he kept himself hidden at the hideout than when he was at a place where the sun was welcomed. His hair still covered his right eye. He had trained a bit during the last weeks. What he had been doing most was perfecting his ninjutsu arsenal and better control over his Mangekyu Sharingan. He had yet to be a master of the Sharingan. He did not train his speed, he figured it was fine where it was at the moment. Today was one of the days that he would surely remember all his life, the day Konoha became aware of his heritage. It would certainly be worth smiling upon seeing the face of Konoha when becomes aware of his heritage. The Sandaime looked at Naruto with questioning eyes. Beside him was another man who was a cage like him, the Yondaime Kazekage. Two men wearing Anbu gear stood behind the Kazekage, they were his bodyguards. The Kazekage was present as his genins had reached the finals. Sunagakur was the only great village to have participated in the exams aside from Konoha, who are the hosts. It was understandable, the others did not get well with Konoha. The look the Sandaime was giving Naruto was pushed because Naruto had disappeared from the village for three weeks after turning down Jiraiya. He was curious as to where Naruto had gone to after disappearing. He was positive that Naruto was not inside the village those three weeks. He had his Anbu search for him and the best sensors but none were able to find him. His chakra signature had just disappeared without a trace. And they had not been able to get inside of Naruto's apartment, not even the Byakugan could see through the walls of the apartment. He had wondered how Naruto was able to make a seal that could make the Byakugan's abilities ineffective. From what he had observed, Naruto showed no mastery in Fuinjutsu. He did not have Jiraiya break the seal, seeing that Naruto would surely notice that they had broken into his apartment. He did not wish to unsettle the blonde any further. Jiraiya suddenly appeared behind the old Hokage with a grin planted on his face. He was to act as the Sandaime's bodyguard in duration of the finals. I told you he would return. Jiraiya said to his former sensei. The Sandaime smiled slightly without even looking back at Jiraiya. He had been thinking that Naruto had abandoned the village. Jiraiya had said he was sure that Naruto would return to the village. Jiraiya was indeed right Naruto had returned today for the finals. I guess you were right, though I still wonder why he would disappear like that without telling anyone. 
he said, is everything set? He asked still smiling. Yes. Jiraiya replied with a nod. Jiraiya had found out that Orochimaru was planning to invade the village during the finals. They had made preparations to encounter the threat. The Sandaime nodded, good he said his eyes focusing on the arena. It certainly is lively in here. Don't you agree Hokage Dono? The Kaze Kage suddenly spoke. One could not see his face clearly due to the cage robe he wore. The Sandaime looked at the Kaze Kage and smiled, it certainly is. Before the conversation between the two Kages could go further a man appeared before the Hokage. He had shoulder-length brown hair which hanged about his face with brown eyes. He wore a forehead protector like a bandana, and a standard jonin outfit and a senbone in his mouth. Should I start with the finals, Hokage-sama? The man asked. The Sandaime nodded in approval. All the contestants were already present along with other important people. There was no need to keep the crowd waiting any longer. He was surprised though that Kakashi had brought Sasuke in time for the finals. He had thought that the Jonin would be late along with Sasuke that was why he had made preparations for Kakashi to be looked for if he did not appear in time. He could not be faulted about that given Kakashi's laid-back attitude. Genma stepped forward and jumped at the middle on the arena just in front of the contestants. He smiled at them before looking back at the crowd, which had become settled. Welcome everyone, he said loudly for everyone to hear him, my name is Genma Shiranui, proctor of the finals. I would like to welcome you all to Konoha's Chunin Selection Exam Finals. Genma yelled out to the crowd who welcomed his words with cheers, we will now begin with the matches between the contestants that have worked hard and reached the finals of this tournament. Genma said and made his way over to the proctor's seat. He looked at the contestants, contestants of the first match, Uzumaki Naruto, Hayuga Neji. The rest of the contestants please go back to the contestants booth. The rest of the contestants left the arena. Sasuke shot Naruto a glance before leaving. He had trained hard and gotten strong during his time with Kakashi. He wanted to test the power he had attained against Naruto. Naruto was someone he was sure would give him a good fight. He had always wanted to fight Naruto. The exams had brought a good chance for him to fight the blonde. Genma looked between Naruto and Neji. Naruto still had his impassive expression Neji had the same expression as Naruto. The rules are the same as the ones that applied during the preliminaries, Genma said, first match of the Chunin exam finals, Uzumaki Naruto vs Hayuga Neji, Genma yelled, begin. He yelled motioning with his hands for the genins to begin the first match. Naruto unfolded both his hands from his chest. Before the exam Zetsu had told him something he had taken into account. Jenins did not give him a match. Only a select few could land a hit on him. He had always ended a match quickly because it annoyed him dragging himself against someone who can't land a hit on him. Zetsu had told him that if he did not want to get bored with fights he should at least play with his opponents. Or he would get bored with most of the fights he fought. Zetsu was basically telling him to give his opponents false hope and then crush that hope mercilessly. It was the same tactic Orochimaru used but Orochimaru had a tendency to underestimate his opponents. It was a blunder he would hope to avoid given his current level of power. The crowd began to mutter in anticipation. Some were picking who would win the match. Some were gunning for the Hyuga prodigy, while a select few gunned for Naruto to win. The air in the arena was thick as Neji stared at Naruto blankly. He was confident he could win the match. He was a prodigy after all and anyone who was fated against him was fated to lose. A clone puffed into existence beside Naruto. He took a few steps back and set down Indian style with his eyes closed. Zetsu's advice weighed down a bit, but he would test his opponent's strength with a clone before fighting himself. He would rather not waste his energy fighting someone who could not defeat his clone. If Neji could defeat his clone easily he would have his fun just as Zetsu had advised him. Fighting Neji would give him a chance to experiment. The clone Naruto had made was a solid clone. It had little chakra as Naruto did not want it to drag the fight for too long. Neji seemed insulted by Naruto's actions. Anyone would have been insulted. What is this, aren't you going to fight me? Neji asked looking at the real Naruto. Naruto stayed as he was while his clone spoke, I will, but that is if you defeat me. I'm just a clone, one hit and I will dispel. The clone stated impassively. The clone's words drew question marks all over the stadium. People were wondering if it was just arrogance to say something like that. Neji was a prodigy and he could surely defeat a mere clone. None felt more insulted than Neji. But the Hyuga was able to contain his anger. He did not think that Naruto would have the guts to do something nor say something like that. He was not expecting it. 
but he would not be shown up by someone who was once considered a dead last. Byakugan. Neji yelled as veins around his white eyes bulged. Neji ran towards the real Naruto ignoring the clone. He could not waste time with the clone when he could fight the real person. What Naruto had done was an insult to his skills and his pride as a shinobi. To make him look like he was not worth an effort to fight and have him fight a clone instead was degrading. He could not allow anyone make him sink any lower than that. Naruto stopped Neji in his tracks by standing in his way. If he wanted to make the real one fight he had to defeat the clone. With a fighting style of the Hyuga Kan, his speed would have to keep his distance because a single hit from Neji would destroy him. He was faster than Neji, that would prove to be an advantage to him, but he was not as fast as the real one. Fighting a Hyuga was not a good thing for a clone. The chances of being destroyed in a single direct hit were high. Neji glared at the clone before raising his palm, which was glowing with chakra. He tried to hit the clone Naruto at the chest. The clone jumped back, dodging the blow. Neji wasted no time he dashed at the clown making it jump away from him again. Are you going to keep running away from me? Neji asked while getting into his clan's taijutsu style, the gentile fist. The clone responded by charging at Neji. It swung its right leg when it had reached the Janan. Neji crouched down to avoid the kick and raised his palm to try hitting the clone. The clone disappeared suddenly and appeared behind Neji. Neji spun around quickly to block the oncoming punch sent towards him by the clone. The Byakugan gives me clear view of the battlefield, I can see your attacks. Neji stated his hand still blocking Naruto's punch. The clone responded by making a distance between itself and Neji. It looked at the real Naruto for a second. A second was what Neji needed as he suddenly appeared before the clone hitting it with his palm and sending a chakra pulse at the clone's chest making it disappear in a puff of smoke. But not before saying something more to itself than to Neji, I let my guard down. Neji smirked and turned around facing Naruto. Naruto was already standing up looking at Neji blankly. I have defeated your clone easily. It did nothing but delay the inevitable. Neji said arrogantly. Naruto gave no response to Neji's words. Neji got back into his taijutsu stance, fate has deemed that you will lose against me. You were once considered a dead last at the academy but now you are not. I don't believe that you are no longer a dead last. You are still a dead last running away from his fate, but no one can escape fate, as fate cannot be changed, Neji spoke impassively, what you are now is a mask hiding what you once were called at the academy, a dead last. I will defeat you today and remove that mask exposing who you truly are, a dead last. Neji said believing that he could defeat Naruto and remove his mask. Naruto responded by holding a single hand seal. Fire release, great fireball Naruto muttered as he breathed out a large fireball that sped at Neji. The fireball was twice as big as that which Sasuke could make. Neji seeing that if the jutsu hit him he would be toast, literally, made a quick escape without getting hurt. Sasuke had wide eyes upon seeing Naruto do his favorite jutsu with one hand seal. It bothered him greatly that Naruto could do that jutsu better than him. He had never seen Naruto do that jutsu, Naruto had never shown any skill to use ninjutsu before. Performing the fireball jutsu with a single hand seal meant that he was accustomed to doing the jutsu and had mastered it. It infuriated him, he was an Uchiha, all Uchihas were supposed to be masters of the great fireball. The jutsu had originated from the Uchiha clan after all. It was unacceptable to see someone do the jutsu better than he could. So he is going to reveal his true power the Sandaime thought with a smile. He too was a bit surprised that Naruto could perform the fireball jutsu with a single hand seal. It would not have been surprising had it been an Uchiha. Uchiha clan had a natural affinity to fire release so it would not be surprising. This is certainly turning out to be interesting. I heard that Uzumaki did not display any skill in ninjutsu. But seeing him perform a jutsu like that makes me curious. The Kaze Kage said to the Hokage curiosity dripping from his tone. He was wondering why Naruto did not use any jutsu at the Forest of Death. Both Jiraiya and the Hokage nodded but offered no words. They just wanted to watch what Naruto could do. Back at the fight. After dodging the fireball Neji appeared several feet away from the jutsu. Naruto suddenly appeared before Neji. Neji was shocked as he was caught off guard. He had not been expecting Naruto to attack him after sending the fireball jutsu at him. He had not even seen Naruto move. You are really annoying when you start talking. Naruto stated impassively. Neji had been expecting him to attack him given that he had been caught off guard. 
If Naruto had attacked when he had appeared before him he would have hit him since he was in no position to defend. He was not a bit curious as to why Naruto did not try to land a blow on him. Neji glared at Naruto for saying he was annoying. He smirked, you had an opportunity to let a hit on me, but you did not use it. Such an opportunity will not come again, and I will make you regret it. Neji said impassively. His palm rushed at Naruto's left shoulder. Naruto shifted aside to avoid Neji's hit. Looking at Neji's face he was positive that Neji was not going to stop with his attacks. Neji tried hitting his right shoulder. Naruto dodged forcing Neji to try to hit another target. Naruto dodged all of the attacks while his eyes were firmly on Neji. He might not have worked on his speed before the finals, but he was still fast. His speed was the reason Neji could not land a hit on him. Naruto jumped back creating a distance between himself and Neji. He was doing his best to avoid being hit by Neji's attacks. It would be rather troubling if he were to have his chakra paths blocked. Neji's strikes aimed at blocking his chakra paths. If his chakra paths were blocked it would make him immobile. But at least for him for a moment, having his chakra paths blocked was something he could deal with. Neji ran at Naruto at a faster speed than before. His hands were still glowing with light blue chakra. To his shock Naruto's hands began to glow with chakra. One had to have good chakra control to be able to do what Naruto had done. Neji had been moving at a faster speed than Naruto had thought he would. But it did not mean that he could not handle it. Naruto blocked Neji's attempt to hit him at the chest with his hand. It was laced with chakra to prevent its chakra pathway from being blocked. Naruto continued on to block Neji's attacks for 4 minutes straight. He only received two hits on both his shoulders but he dealt with it quickly by forcing chakra to pass through the blocked pathway. It was a rather uncomfortable process. But other than that he had no injuries or bruises. Neji on the other hand was slightly worn out. He was also frustrated because he had failed to give Naruto an injury. All his attempts to hit Naruto had been fruitless. Naruto suddenly gripped Neji's right hand. He held it tightly making Neji wince. Naruto spun around along with Neji. Neji spun around in air while his hand was held by Naruto. He knew that Naruto was going to release the hold on his hand. But if Naruto did that it would send him flying. Naruto let go of Neji's hand. But before Neji was thrown away from him he hit Naruto's right hand making it immobile. Neji was sent crashing towards the wall. He recovered quickly, but his body slightly bruised and his clothes slightly tattered. He got up and looked at Naruto. His eyes could see that Naruto's hand was immobile because he had blocked its chakra pathways. Your right hand is immobile now. With only one usable hand left I will easily remove that mask you wear. Neji said with a smirk. Crowd. Sakura looked down at the stadium. Beside her were Kiba, Shino, Hinata, Ino, Ten Ten and the three Jonin senseis of Team 7, 8, 10, and Team Guy, Hatake Kakashi, Yuhi Kurenai, Asuma Sarutobi, and Maito Guy. Doesn't Neji realize that Naruto is not wearing a mask and the dead last was the mask? Sakura asked particularly to no one. I don't think he does. Ino replied her eyes firmly at the battlefield. The Jonin just continued watching, each with different thoughts in their heads. Kakashi was wondering about something. Naruto did not seem to be fighting the way he usually did. Normally Neji would have been lying somewhere with a broken body at this given. But the fight had been going on for a while and still Naruto had not land a hit on Neji. To trained eyes one could tell that it was not because he could not, but because he did not want to. Kurenai saw Kakashi's thoughtful expression, what is it Kakashi? Something seems to be wrong here. Naruto is stronger than Neji that much I know, but why he is not ending the fight is making me curious. I have watched Naruto fight many times and he never plays when he is fighting someone with Janan strength. Kakashi replied. Kiba responded before Kurenai could respond, what are you talking about Kakashi-sensei? Can't you see that Neji has Naruto on the defensive? He said. After Naruto had humiliated him at the preliminaries he had learned to resent the blonde. Naruto had beaten him like he was a fly. Guy shook his head, Naruto seems to be holding back for some reason. He is on the defensive because he wants to not because Neji is forcing him. Guy stated observing the fight. Why? He did not seem to be capable of holding back at the preliminaries. Kurnai asked. It is most likely he is just playing with Neji. But that would be out of character for him, Kakashi said, let's just watch and see what happens. He said getting the Jonans to nod in agreement. Back to the fight. Naruto sighed inwardly and forced chakra on his right hand to open up the blocked chakra pathways. 
He was better at controlling his chakra because of his Senju DNA. Senju were known to have had perfect control over their chakra. It was easy to unblock his chakra pathways. He disappeared and appeared in front of Neji. He did not attack just as he did last time. Neji smirked as he stared at Naruto. He would make the blonde rue his choice of not attacking him while he could. You are within my range. Neji stated. 8 trigram 64 palms, Neji said his fingers going at Naruto's body, 2 palms, Neji said as his hands hit Naruto, 4 palms, 4 hits at Naruto's shoulders blocking his tenketsu points. He hit Naruto with his strikes until he reached 64 strikes. Naruto had taken each strike without trying to block. Remarkably he was still standing, only his shoulders were slumped and his eyes were staring down at the ground. I have hit you with 64 strikes. Your body should not be able to move, I suggest you stay down and accept what fate has decided, Neji said, you were fated to lose this match and thus you have lost. Naruto's eyes left the ground and traveled towards Neji. Neji spoke again seeing Naruto look at him, give up, you have no power to defeat me. Neji said believing that his opponent was weaker than him. It was not fate that you hit me, Naruto corrected, you only hit me, because I wanted you to as I wanted to see what would happen if your technique hit me. The whole stadium was silenced by Naruto's proclamation. Some hung their mouths open while others blinked several times and a few just raised their brows. It was just unbelievable to them no one would dare take on those hits just to see what would happen. That would be unless he was shot of a few brain cells. You are lying. Even if you let yourself be hit the damage is done. I can see your tenketsu points are blocked with my eyes. Neji said not believing that Naruto had let himself be hit. Naruto released a wave of chakra forcing his tenketsu points to open. The chakra he released picked up debris around him for a moment before the dust cleared. Naruto stood still his tenketsu points now open with his eyes fixed on Neji. Naruto closed his eyes and opened them revealing a fully matured Sharingan. A Sharingan he had managed to keep hidden from everyone within the village. Well the crowd could only see his left eye as his right was hidden by his hair. Everyone within the stadium was shocked. In everyone's wildest dreams they had never imagined Naruto with a Sharingan, the Dujutsu of the Uchiha clan. It was a sight that many had never expected to see. Some did not actually care they just wanted to see a good fight. Visitors from other villages were greatly surprised as they had heard that the Uchiha clan was massacred. Only a few outside of Konoha knew that there was one survivor, Uchiha Sasuke. While others were shocked, Sasuke was both shocked and infuriated. Naruto was no Uchiha it meant that if Naruto had the Sharingan it had to have been implanted. He refused to accept people who implanted his clan's dujutsu on themselves. It was different with Kakashi because Kakashi had his given to him by his dying friend. He did not know where Naruto got his. Naruto Sasuke growled to himself with his Sharingan activated. Unlike Naruto's his had yet to fully mature, it only had two tomos in each eye. Everyone beside him could see he was shaking in anger. Sasuke was about to storm into the battlefield and demand answers from Naruto but Shikamaru quickly restrained the young Uchiha with his shadows. He was also curious but storming in there would only disturb Naruto's match. He was not sure if Naruto would welcome someone disturbing his match. Let go of me Shikamaru. Sasuke yelled trying to break free from his restraints. This is troublesome, Shikamaru said his hands held together as he did not let loose of his jutsu, calm down Sasuke. Naruto will come back here after his match. You will get to question him then. No I want answers now. Sasuke yelled out again. The situation was becoming somewhat comical as the other participants were snickering at Sasuke's frustrations. Kakashi seemed to have known what was happening as he suddenly appeared in the contestant's booth. He had figured that Sasuke would overreact seeing Naruto wield a Sharingan. Kakashi touched Sasuke's shoulder, calm down Sasuke, I'm sure Naruto has a good explanation. He tried calming his student. Sasuke glared at Kakashi but he was no longer trying to escape from his restraints, did you know? He demanded. No Kakashi replied as he shook his head. Sasuke said nothing, his eyes traveled back to Naruto as he settled for glaring at the blonde. Cage booth. The Kaze Kage had wide eyes, his eyes were bigger than the Hokaye's, who also had wide eyes. It was unbelievable that Naruto had the Sharingan. He quickly got over his shock and laughed maniacally inwardly. Naruto was proving to be quite an interesting person. The Sandaime and Jiraiya were obviously shocked as everyone else. They had not even suspected that Naruto could have the Uchiha clan dujutsu. 
The San Daime could not believe that Naruto had hid something that from him and from the whole village. I thought there was only one survivor of the Uchiha clan massacre Hokage Dono. The Kaze Kage spoke snapping the San Daime out of his thoughts. There is only one survivor. The Hokage replied with his eyes firmly placed on Naruto. Then how come Naruto has the Sharingan? I don't know, I don't really know. The San Daime Hokage replied shaking his head. Anyone could see that he was being honest. The Kaze Kage decided to drop it seeing that the Hokage knew nothing. Back to the fight. Naruto ran at Neji at Jonin level speed. He reached the Janan and swung his right leg high trying to kick Neji at his temple. Neji crossed both his hands and blocked the kick. The kick had much power to send any Janan flying, but Neji was not just any Janan. He was only pushed back a bit, but told himself never to try and block another kick from Naruto. Naruto brought his feet down and raised his left leg waist level high. He tried kicking Neji at his waist but Neji jumped back to avoid being hit. Naruto stopped with his attacks for a moment and stood still as if he was strategizing. The crowd had now gotten over their shock and were watching the fight with anticipation. It was now proving to be interesting as Naruto was now attacking Neji. Neji seemed to be blocking Naruto's attempts. Neji ran at Naruto with his right arm stretched forward. He tried hitting Naruto's chest but Naruto sidestepped the attack and gripped Neji's arm. Neji swung his free arm trying to hit Naruto. His attempt forced Naruto to let go of his arm and jump back. Naruto dashed towards Neji and seemed to passing him. But he suddenly spun around with his legs swinging at Neji. Naruto kicked Neji on his face sending the Janan flying away. Neji recovered quickly by flipping in midair. But when he landed down the ground a hard kick to the chest welcomed him and sent him crashing towards the wall. Gah! Neji grunted as he hit the wall hard creating a dent. Naruto gave the Janan an opportunity to recover. The results would be the same regardless of what action he took. Neji got up and glared at Naruto. Naruto hit as hard as Lee. But Lee hit harder because of the weights on his legs. He rushed at Naruto again but this time with both his hands stretched forward. Hit tried hitting Naruto, but Naruto jumped back. He could predict Neji's moves before they reached him. And because he was faster than Neji it became impossible for Neji to hit him. Naruto blurred out of sight and appeared before Neji. With almost 360 degree view of the battlefield Neji was able to see Naruto. He turned around quickly but was unable to block or dodge a kick to his chest. The kick connected with Neji's chest and sent him flying. Naruto appeared above Neji while he was still in air and brought his hands together. He smacked the Janan down the ground. Neji was sent crashing down like a bullet. He hit the ground hard and created a crater. Neji's crash created debris where he had crashed. Remarkably when the debris cleared Neji was still standing but his body was bruised and he was bleeding albeit not profusely. He seemed to be out of breath as he was breathing heavily. He did not like where things were going but he refused to be beat. Fate could not be changed. Naruto had been fated to be defeated by him and he would make sure of that. Naruto rushed at Neji and attempted to gut him. Neji dodged the attempt albeit barely. He was not given time to catch the breath that was escaping him as Naruto appeared in front of him and kneed him on the gut. Neji coughed bodily fluids while clutching his stomach in pain. The crowd was cheering seeing the turnaround of events. Naruto stared down at Neji, who was now on his knees still clutching his stomach, there is no such thing as fate. Fate is something you created on your own ideals to escape from your miseries. Naruto said his tone and facial expression never changing. Neji stopped clutching his stomach and glared at Naruto you know nothing about misery. He spat, my life has been fated to become a servant to the main branch. As far as I could remember I have been branded with this, Neji said removing his forehead protector. There was a seal on his forehead Naruto knew what it was, it's the caged bird seal, I will live with it and die with it that is my fate. And your fate is to lose to me. Neji said as he tried hitting Naruto in anger. Naruto punched Neji on his face sending him flying away from him. Neji winced as he felt the pain the punch inflicted on his body. He hit the ground and gathered his strength to get up. He was still breathing heavily and was now bleeding from his mouth. Despite his condition he got into his taijutsu stance signifying that he could still fight. Naruto ran towards Neji but when he reached Neji he sensed a buildup of chakra from Neji. He did not stop trying to kick Neji though. Kaiten! Neji yelled as he began to spin furiously and while he released chakra from his tenketsu points. The chakra he released created a dome of chakra that rotated around him at a fast speed. Naruto's foot hit the spinning chakra and was sent back. 
he flipped in mid-air and landed down the ground. That was unexpected. He said to himself. Neji stopped spinning releasing his defense jutsu. He smirked at Naruto, this is my ultimate jutsu, the ultimate defense jutsu. With this you cannot touch me anymore. He said confidently. Those of the Hyuga clan had wide eyes seeing Neji perform the kaiden. It was a defense jutsu only taught to the skilled members of the main branch. For Neji to learn the jutsu on his own only proved that he was truly a genius. No one could doubt that he was indeed a prodigy of the Hyuga clan. But despite his skill he was facing someone who seemed to be beyond his level. Ultimate defense you say, Naruto said, shall we test that? The way Naruto spoke made Neji wish he did not say the kaiden was an ultimate defense. Naruto did a single hand seal, fire release, great fireball another large fireball sped towards Neji faster than the first one. It was just as big as the first. Due to Neji's current condition he could not escape the jutsu by running away from it. Naruto was aware of that. The only way for Neji to defend himself was to use his kaiden. Neji saw the fireball coming towards him. Kaiden! He yelled as he activated his defense technique again. Both techniques clashed but the kaiden held on. Naruto ended his jutsu allowing Neji to do the same. Neji was breathing heavier than before and was barely standing. The kaiden was taking a toll on him. The kaiden had passed Naruto's first test, but barely. Naruto held another single hand seal again readying for another jutsu. Fire style, dragon flame caterwaul. Naruto yelled as five small flame fish-like creatures with two large fangs raced at Neji in five different directions. It was a jutsu Naruto had learned from Madara. All creatures seek out their targets till they hit. The only way to stop them was to make them hit something. Neji gathered his remaining chakra and called upon the kaiden again. One by one the flame dragons hit Neji's defense. When each hit it exploded and the fire it created became one with Neji's rotating dome of chakra. Neji realized this when he felt the heat rise up and stopped spinning to avoid being burned to death by his own jutsu. But he did not get away without suffering slight burns on his clothes and skin. Neji fell on his knees while sweating and breathing heavily. The heat that had surrounded was too intense for him. His chakra was also spent. It is not a perfect defense thought Naruto to himself. He decided to try another jutsu. He had yet to try it while fighting with someone other than his clones. Neji provided him the opportunity to test the jutsu. He flashed through several hand seals and expanded large amounts of chakra, well to others who did not have much chakra as Naruto had. Fire style, majestic flame destroyer. Naruto breathed a mountain unimaginable wave of flames that covered the whole space in front of him reaching the walls of the arena in width. The wave of flames went straight at Neji who had wide eyes like everyone inside the stadium. Only the Sandaime had seen a fire jutsu that big. Despite it being big it was not as big enough for Naruto's liking. Still the flames were powerful enough to incarnate everything they touched. The flames burned everything on their path as they made their way towards Neji's position. The heat of the flames was too intense as everyone close to the battlefield felt the heat. Neji began to fear for his life he could no longer do the kaiden. He also could not escape to anywhere, the flames had blocked each path he could take. Backwards was the wall, he could not go anywhere. He closed his eyes as the flames reached him. Naruto ended his jutsu and narrowed his eyes behind him. Genma was holding Neji with both his arms. He had saved the Janan but at some cost. His upper right side of his body was burned by the flames. He knew that if he had allowed Neji to be hit the flames, the flames would have burned him to ashes. He was the proctor and could not allow necessary deaths to occur while he watched one ed. Neji was now unconscious, it was because of chakra exhaustion and some shock he had thought he was going to die. Genma placed Neji down the ground and ignored his burns. He looked at Naruto, who was still in the same position as he was. He had yet to move, only his eyes narrowed at Genma. Genma let loose of a sigh of release after a few moments. When the flames hit him he thought he too was going to die. But he had made it. It looked like Naruto was trying to kill his fellow Janan. First match of the Chunin exam finals is over. Genma trailed off remembering that the Sandaime had said he would announce the winner of this match. He looked at the Sandaime nodding for him to speak. The Sandaime stepped forward and cleared his throat. He was going to say something important. The crowd had already been shocked once but he had to do it for the sake of the village. Naruto turned around he was the victor of the match. His Sharingan was still activated as he walked towards the contestants booth. No one was cheering, the stadium was just full of mummers. 
winner of the first mock Namikaze Naruto. The Sandaime said in a loud voice. Naruto stopped walking and narrowed his eyes at the Sandaime. His Sharingan morphed into its Mangekyu form for a second before returning back to normal. That was something he was not expecting the Sandaime to say. He had figured the old man would eventually announce his other heritage to Konoha but did not think he would do it anytime soon. The Sandaime might have done it to free himself from the secret, but there was another ulterior motive, Naruto knew that. When Konoha came to accept that he was indeed the son of the Yondaime Hokage they would start to love him. When loved by the villagers he would have no reason to abandon the village. What? Some yelled out in disbelief upon hearing that Naruto was a Namikaze. The thought that he wielded the Sharingan had escaped their minds. Others stared at Naruto with wide eyes cursing themselves for not seeing it. There was only one person to have had bright blonde hair and blue eyes, the Yondaime Hokage, Minato Namikaze. Naruto was like a chibi Minato and yet they could not see it. It would now explain why the Yondaime had chosen Naruto as the Jinchuriku of the Kyubi. The majority of people thinking those thoughts were the ones to have never hated Naruto. While those few that still hated him refused to believe it. Despite their refusal to believe one cold not deny the resemblance. One woman stood up from her seat and clapped her hands. Soon another person joined her, they were followed by almost everyone at the stadium. Naruto walked away towards the contestants' booth. The only reaction he gave towards the reaction of the crowd was a raised brow. After Naruto had reached the contestants' booth the clapping of hands and cheers were replaced by mummers. Naruto stopped walking when he saw Sasuke in his way with a death glare. Naruto brushed aside the glare and decided to just walk past Sasuke. Sasuke was not going to let him off without getting answers he needed. Naruto, Sasuke called out stepping in front of Naruto again, where did you get that Sharon gun? Sasuke demanded. Naruto's face remained impassive, how did you get your Sharon gun? Sasuke? Naruto replied with a question. Sasuke in his current mindset did not fully understand Naruto's question, answer me Naruto. Sasuke yelled his death glare intensifying. I just did. Naruto responded nonchalantly. Shikamaru spoke before someone got hurt, calm down Sasuke, Shikamaru said in his usual bored town, Naruto answered your question. He asked you how you got your Sharingan. The answer is you awakened it like any other Uchiha. What Naruto is saying is that he awakened a Sharingan, that's how he got it. But leads to more troublesome questions. Shikamaru spoke while other contestants watched on. Awoke? How? You are not an Uchiha. The Hokage just said you are a Namikaze not Uchiha. Sasuke said while still glaring at Naruto. Naruto had no time to play the Inaragi with Sasuke, believe what you will, but my eyes were not implanted he said, now then, get out of my way or I will make you. His face remained impassive but the tone he used could send chills to anyone. Sasuke stepped aside and allowed Naruto to pass. Naruto wanted to watch the next match. Sasuke looked away from Naruto emotions welling on his features as thoughts ran rampant within his head. Naruto had just said his Sharingan was not implanted meaning he had to have Uchiha blood running through his veins. His father was not an Uchiha which if he truly had Uchiha DNA in his body he got it from his mother. Still the thought of Naruto being an Uchiha brought him a lot of emotions. Tamari had Naruto with thoughts running through her head. Being the son of the Yondaime Hokage made Naruto someone like royalty. But judging from what she had seen off him so far he did not seem to act like one nor tried grabbing people's attention because he was the son of the Yondaime Hokage. In fact he looked distant unattached to anything as if he did not care about anything else around him. Cage Booth Well that was certainly interesting, the match itself rather than the secret you have just revealed Hokage Dono. The Kaze Kage spoke clearly interested. Naruto possessed far greater skill than he let people believe. His interest in Naruto had surely grown. The Sandaime nodded, the match was truly interesting. It was not only the fight but the things that were revealed during the match. You certainly have a skill Janan in Naruto, Hokage done. The Kaze Kage said again honestly. The Hokage smiled, Naruto was certainly interesting. Naruto did fire style jutsu at a higher level. He was sure Naruto would give Itachi a run for his money when it came to fire style jutsu. He is truly skilled. He finally said. I'm surprised that you could hide something like this from the village, though judging from Naruto's reaction he already knew of it and did not seem to happy that you announced his heritage. The Kaze Kage said trying to act as normal as possible. 
he already knew that Naruto was the son of the famed Yellow Flash, the man who stood in his way of becoming Hokage. Sarutobi did not respond he had his reasons for keeping the truth away from Konoha. He did not have to explain his actions to another cage of another village. I believe you now sensei, he truly is skilled just like his father, Jiraiya spoke, now I have to force him to become my apprentice given his skills. Jiraiya said with a grin. Sarutobi responded by chuckling slightly at Jiraiya's words. The Sanin had not entirely believed that Naruto was a skilled and capable shinobi. He had said he would believe if he saw with his own eyes and now he had seen with his own eyes. Naruto was skilled enough to be called a prodigy. He could not miss the opportunity to be a sensei to someone like Naruto. He put much effort into making Naruto his apprentice. Chapter 7 Genma looked at the burns on his body and winced remembering how it hurt when he got burned. He looked at the crowd and smiled, second match of the Chunin exam finals, Subaku no Gara vs Rock Lee. Genma said aloud. Both contestants made their way to the battleground. Genma looked between Lee and Gara. he could tell that the two were going to give the crowd a good match, are both fighters ready? He asked earning a nod from Lee while Gara gave no response his face just remained emotionless, begin. He yelled and jumped to his seat where a medic was waiting for him to take care of his burns. One could tell Gara was a bit excited about the match because the moment Genma said the match could begin San shot out from his gourd and swirled around him. Lee studied his opponent for a moment. Guy had told him that his opponent was dangerous and he should be careful. He had also been told to take off his weight should the situation require him to do so. He did not have to ask for permission to take off his weights this time. Lee got into his taijutsu stance and motioned for Gara to come at him with his right hand. Gara wasted no time as his said shot towards Lee at fast speeds. Lee jumped back to avoid the sand. When he landed on the ground the sand was waiting for him. He was forced to use his great reflexes to avoid the sand from catching him. Guy had warned him to avoid being caught by the sand at all costs. Lee rushed at Gara, who had been in the same position since the match began. He attacked Gara on his left side by attempting to kick him. Sand blocked Lee's foot preventing him from hitting Gara. Lee blurred to Gara's right attempted to kick the sand Janan again. The sand protected Gara, again, forcing Lee to jump back. Sand shot towards Lee at a fast pace. Lee readied himself and when the sand reached him and attempted to kick it away. A mistake on his part as a part of the sand was blown away by the force of his kick and a part was not, the part that remained almost wrapped itself around his leg. He did enough to blur away from sight. Lee landed on the ground and studied Gara. The sand made it difficult for him to hit his opponent. He needed speed to bypass the defense. Lee ran towards Gara with a plan and thought. He appeared in front of Gara looking as if he wanted to punch the Janan. Gara's sand tried to wrap itself around Lee, only for Lee to disappear and appear behind Gara. Lee swung his leg attempting to kick Gara from behind. But just as he was about to land a hit the sand appeared and blocked his kick. Lee jumped away from Gara. Bypassing Gara's sand was proving to be harder than he had thought it would be at his current speed level. The crowd was cheering as the fight was certainly entertaining even when none had landed a hit on one another. At the contestants' booth, Konkuro had a wide smile admiring Gara's sand. No one had ever landed a hit on Gara. Gara was untouchable with his sand and there was no way Lee would be able to touch Gara, well that was according to him. Lee appeared in front of Gara and attempted to punch Gara with the strongest punch he could master. The sand tried to block his punch but the punch broke through. Just as it was about to make contact with Gara, another wave of sand appeared in its path and this time blocked Lee's punch. Lee did not stop with just a powerful punch. He spun around swinging his leg bringing forth his most powerful kick. Gara brought forward his sand to block the kick. But the sand did not stand a chance against the power behind Lee's kick. Lee's foot marched towards Gara's face but again just as it was about to hit more sand blocked its path. But the results were different this time, even the sand shielding Gara, he was sent flying away towards the wall. Gara's sand created a cushion before he hit the wall. Gara smiled maniacally at Lee and walked a bit towards Lee before he stopped. He moved his sand with his hand this time. When he was moving it with his hands it was moving at a faster speed than before. A wave of sand almost wrapped Lee from behind but Lee disappeared from sight dodging the sand, albeit barely. Lee rushed at Gara dodging waves of sand that were trying to wrap themselves on him. Lee dodged each sand attack skillfully. When he reached Gara, he was unable to attack the Jinchuriku as he found large amounts of sand waiting for him. Lee quickly disappeared from view avoiding the sand. If Lee was going to break through Gara's defense, he would have to step up his game. 
Li looked at his sensei as if asking for permission. Guy nodded making Li smile. Despite Guy having already given him permission to take off his weights during his fight it felt right asking for permission again. He took of the weights on his legs and held them with both his hands. Gar only raised an eyebrow wondering what his opponent was up to. Li let go of the weights. Boom! They hit the ground and shook the stadium slightly. The weights created two craters on the battlefield. Almost everyone had wide eyes at the effects of Li's weights. It was just unimaginable how a young lad like Li could be able to wear such heavy weights and still move as fast as he had been moving so far in his match against Gara. Guy just smiled proudly at a student. It was not easy for Li to be able to wear such heavy weights but through hard work they did it. It was his efforts along with Li's dedication to being the best taijutsu user that made Li became what he was today, a shinobi he was proud to call his student. Li took a taijutsu stance with a serious expression on his face. Li vanished from his spot. Only a select few saw him move. The others just blinked a few times looking around the battlefield. Their efforts were rewarded as Li appeared behind Gara. Gara turned around with wide eyes showing his shock at Li's speed. Li swung his right leg at Gara. Gara's sand was unable to react fast enough to leap into his defense. Li's kick connected with Gara's face. Gara was sent flying but before he could hit the walls Li appeared above him facing down and kicked him hard on the face. Gara crashed down the ground creating a crater. Li landed on the ground gracefully and waited for his opponent to recover. Gara stood up from the crater and brushed his fingers against his mouth. He looked at his fingers and saw blood. To some it was most shocking because none had ever seen Gara bleed before. It was shocking to see that someone had the speed to bypass through Gara's sand and hurt Gara. Not even Jonans had been unable to hurt Gara, but a Janan from Konoha had just done it. It was unbelievable. Gara smiled maliciously, blood, my blood, he said to himself then looked back at Lee, mother wants your blood, Gara said maliciously, I must feed on your blood to prove my existence and erase yours. Lee looked at Gara showing a bit of confusion but he later shrugged it off and dashed towards Gara. Only small gusts of winds could be seen upon where he had been standing. A large wall of sand appeared in front of him blocking his path. Lee jumped up passing the wall. While he was still in air he began to rotate furiously towards Gara. Konoha Senpu. Lee yelled as he delivered a spinning kick to Gara. Gara's sand came to the rescue and blocked Lee's kick. Lee spun around and attempted to kick Gara with his other leg but the sand blocked his kick again. Lee flashed out of sight and appeared behind Gara. He swung his right hand and delivered a punch at Gara's face. Gara had been unable to block due to the speed on the attack. With his full speed Lee was able to bypass Gara's defense. The punch sent him flying but Gara quickly recovered and landed down the ground gracefully. Lee watched with wide eyes as sand around Gara's face began to peel off. Gara's thin layer of sand reformed again on his skin. It was his secondary defense mechanism. Lee gritted his teeth in frustrations. So far he had not been able to damage Gara. It was like all his efforts were pointless. To win he had to risky measures. Lee suddenly blurred out of sight. He was running at his speed's peak. Lee kicked Gara into air and used Shadow of the Dancing Leaf to get behind Gara while still in flight. He let loose of his bandages and wrapped it around Gara, restraining him as gravity began to pull them down. This should end the match. Lee exclaimed confidently. He and Gara began to rotate furiously while they fell down the groan as a spinning vortex. Gara hit the ground head first. Lee was also hurt as the technique was a double edged sword. But Lee, being the user of the technique, received less damage than his opponent. Lee panted as he watched the debris where Gara was lying. The crowd began to cheer, applauding the technique and also thinking that the match was over. But everyone's celebrations were cut shot as Gara let out a maniacal laughter. Lee could not believe what his eyes were showing him as he watched Gara stumbled up and stood up with a maniacal grin, and blood dripping from his mouth. His sand swirled furiously around him, I must really drink your blood mother wants it. Large torrents of sand began to fire at Lee mercilessly. Lee did his best to dodge all of the attacks. But keeping up with Gara's sand was tiring him. Gara was sending the sand at Lee tirelessly without even taking a break. With the smile on his face it was obvious that he wanted to crush Lee with his sand. Lee found himself backed against the arena's battle floor. He was left to only think of defense as Gara had been attacking him with his sand furiously. A wave of sand appeared in front of him stretched as if it was welcoming him for an embrace. Gara grinned and made a fist encasing the sand around Lee. Subaku Q. Gara said as his said seemingly wrapped itself around Lee. 
nothing happened there was no blood that fell rain down the ground. Gara was aware that he did not catch Lee because he did not feel him on his sand. Lee appeared a few feet away from his previous position. Some let out a sigh of relief seeing that the match was not over. It seems that I cannot defeat as I am, Lee said seriously looking at Gara. then I must. He trailed off, first gate. Gate of opening. Lee yelled as the aura around him began to change, second gate. Gate of healing. His skin began to change its normal color, third gate. Gate of life, fourth gate. Gate of pain, fifth gate. Gate of limit. Lee yelled. He was surrounded by a blue aura and veins around his body had bulged. Gust of winds picked up where Lee was standing. The crowd was awed at the power Lee was emitting. It was defiantly not the power of your normal Janan. This will surely end it. He said and disappeared. Only Jonans were able to follow his movements. Others did not see him move. Naruto was able to see him he had his Sharingan activated, he did not deactivate it after his match with Neji. The next thing the crowd was Gara in flight. Lee was striking him at inhuman speeds. It gave Gara no chance to defend himself. Lee suddenly appeared above Gara, reverse lotus. He yelled as he hit Gara with a final powerful punch and kick at the same time. Gara was sent crashing down like a bullet. He hit the ground creating a large crater. Some with experienced eyes saw that Gara's gourd turned into sand and created a sand cushion before he hit the ground. Lee landed at the unwelcoming ground harshly due to the use of his technique. He had already closed his gates as he could no longer contain them. His body was bruised and his clothes were tattered. His breathing was labored and he was on his knees as he was unable to stand. The technique used too much power at once and left him without strength. It was why he used it as a last resort. The crowd cheered gracefully at the power of Lee's attack. They thought that it was surely over, as they believed that no one could stand again after crashing down the way Gara did. The dust cleared revealing Gara lying down in a crater. Sand was peeling of his skin and more blood continued to drip from his mouth. His sand had absorbed much of the damage he could have suffered. Sand coffin. Gara said with his hand raised while he was still lying down. Lee found himself at the mercy of Gara's sand. He tried to escape but his muscles were torn apart and he was out of strength because he had opened five gates and used reverse lotus. The sand caught Lee's left leg and hand crashing them. Arg. Lee screamed in pain as Gara's sand crushed his hand and leg. He landed on the ground harshly. Gara got to his feet slowly looking slightly worn out but had no significant damage on his body. Gara chuckled darkly, Mother will now have your now have your blood. He yelled like a crazed person. Gara's sand short towards an immobile Lee. Guy tense knowing that Lee would surely die if Gara caught him with his sand. In his condition, Lee could not do anything it was now up to him as a loving sensei to protect his student. He rushed to the stadium to save Lee. He was not alone a bandaged Genma had the same thoughts as him. Guy was able to get to Lee before Gara's sand. He took Lee out of the path of the sand while Genma appeared before Gara. This match is over. He said sternly. Gara ignored him and looked over to Guy and Lee, why did you save him? He asked his features having returned to his emotionless and cold facade. He is my student, my pride and joy. Guy replied almost breaking into tears as he walked away taking Lee to the medics. Lee had pushed himself too far. Opening the gates did damage to his body and Gara's last attack did further damage, he feared the worst looking at his unconscious student, who had passed out because of pain that had gripped him. Genma looked at the murmuring crowd, winner, Subaku no Gara. The crowd applauded they had witnessed a truly great match. Gara silently made his way back to the contestant's booth. He did not need a medic, as he was fine. Naruto was somewhat pleased with what he had seen. Both Gara and Lee were capable genins. Lee had reached an amazing feat. To be able to compete with a Jinchuriku at the level he was. The boy was truly something, possibly the best genin in terms of hard work and dedication. Will Subaku no Konkuro and Uchiha Sasuke step forward please? Genma called out. Sasuke smiled excitedly and went into the arena. He was finally going to test himself against capable opponents. After watching Gara fight, he now wanted to him also. Konkuro stepped forward but stopped before reaching the middle of the arena, Proctor, I forfeit. His words were welcomed with boos all over the stadium. Konkuro seemed not to care about the jeers. The crowd had been waiting for Sasuke to fight. Some had come to the finals just to watch the only survivor of the Uchiha clan. With Konkuro giving up they were being denied an opportunity to see Sasuke fight and observe what he was capable of. 
Many saw Sasuke as a genius as he was the best student at everything he did when he was still at the academy. Genma looked at Konkuro without interest. He thought that if he did not W he should have never come to the stadium. Sasuke was now fuming. He wanted to fight and would do anything to get that opportunity. He turned and stared at Konkuro with his Sharingan eyes, why? Are you afraid of me? Sasuke said with a smirk trying to get Konkuro to reconsider his decision. The crowd seemed to think the same way as Sasuke. However, it had no effect on Konkuro. He turned around and walked away. Sasuke gritted his teeth seeing that his attempt had failed. He held out his right hand and lightning began to sparkle on his palm. No sooner than later, a sound of chirping birds rang throughout the stadium. Jonins recognized Sasuke's jutsu as Kakashi's trademark assassination jutsu. Chidori! Sasuke yelled as he ran towards Konkuro. If Konkuro did not want to fight he would force him to. Many did not see a problem with Sasuke's actions, in fact they cheered. Konkuro was alarmed and turned around. He saw the jutsu at Sasuke's hand widened his eyes. He did not actually think that the brat would go that far. Lucky for him Genma knew how dangerous the jutsu was. Genma intercepted Sasuke and gripped his right tightly making him lose control over his jutsu. The Chidori burst into sparkles of lightning before disappearing. Sasuke gave Genma a death glare but Genma ignored it. He stared at Konkuro, you are lucky I stopped him if I had not that jutsu would have killed you. Konkuro scoffed and walked away earning more booze from the crowd. Let me go. Sasuke yelled as Genma was still holding his arm. Genma ignored Sasuke again and looked back at the crowd, Uchiha Sasuke will proceed to the next round. He said. Kakashi as Sasuke's sensei appeared beside Genma and Sasuke. Genma let go of Sasuke. Kakashi touched Sasuke's shoulder and both disappeared in swirl of leaves. They appeared where the rest of the Konoha 12 were. Genma sighed, will Nara Shikamaru and Tamari step forward please? Both contestants walked into the ring. Tamari looked like she was the only of the two one to be prepared to fight. Shikamaru had his usual bored expression. Genma looked between both fighters, are both fighters ready? He asked earning nods from both fighters, final match of the first round begin. He said and jumped back to his seat. Tamari being the only who seemed to be eager to fight charged first at Shikamaru. She had seen him fight once and did not think that he could beat her. She thought no believed that she was going to get an easy win. Her large fan was in her hands as she attempted to smack Shikamaru with it. Shikamaru dodged her attempted and landed down as he began to compute ways of winning the match. After a minute, he had already computed several ways to end the match. The fight continued on as Tamari showed her skills with a fan. The fan was used to generate powerful wind jutsus. Tamari was certainly a skilled wind user which was no surprise as Suna was famous for breeding wind users. Wind affinity despite being very powerful was very rare. Not a lot of people had a natural affinity to wind. It was a joy to see someone such as Tamari demonstrates her skills with a fan. While Tamari was on the attack Shikamaru was running around the battlefield dodging Tamari's attacks and throwing explosive tags at the girl. Luckily for Tamari none of the explosives tags hit her. She was not once caught in the explosions. Despite dodging most of Tamari's attacks Shikamaru was unfortunate and was hit by one of Tamari's attacks. Luckily, for him it did not give him much damage all did was to give him a few cuts. Shikamaru was also trying to catch Tamari with his shadow possession jutsu. He was skillfully trying in the best way he could to catch her. It was most surprising at how hard Shikamaru seemed to be fighting. None had ever seen Shikamaru try anything that hard unless a life was in danger. The results had gone the way Shikamaru had predicted. He finally was able to catch Tamari and restrain her with his shadows. He forced her to pick up a kunai and point it to her neck with his shadows. He was controlling her movements and could make her to whatever that he wanted her to do. Tamari had thought that the match was over and she had lost but Shikamaru ended up forfeiting the match. She was surprised that he could forfeit the match when he was in the position to win. His reasons were that, it was too troublesome to continue on, he had little chakra left and he just wanted to get the promotion. Tamari could have refused to accept that she was winner of the match but she accepted it. Her pride as a kunoichi had taken a bite because she did not proceed to the next round because of her skills but because her opponent had chosen to give up when he had her backed against the wall. The match in whole was rather worth watching. The crowd loved it and cheered at the end despite Shikamaru forfeiting when he could have won the match. Genma stood in the middle of the arena, we will now take a 20 minutes break before we. He trailed off as Gara shunshined into the battlefield. 
I don't need a break, let us continue now. Gara said emotionlessly. Genma sighed and looked at the Hokage as if asking what to do. The Sandaime just smiled at him telling him to do what he felt was right as the proctor. Okay, since one of the competitors seems not to need a break we'll begin the second round, Genma said earning cheers from the crowd, which seemed not to want the break, the matches will be as follows, winner of match 1 will face winner of match 2, and the winner of match 3 will face the winner of match 4. Genma said. The first match of the second round will be you. He trailed off remembering something important. A young woman from the crowd sitting at a seat near the fighting area of the arena spoke for him, Namikaze Naruto. The young woman earned chuckles from some spectators. Genma coughed to get everyone to return their attention to him, thank you, he said looking at the young woman, the match will be Namikaze Naruto vs Subaku no Gara. Now since Gara is already here will Namikaze Naruto step forward please. Naruto appeared in the middle of the arena in a burst of flames. You can begin. Genma said returning to his seat. Gara grinned maliciously at Naruto, mother has been waiting to feed on your blood. Naruto raised a single brow. It was not the same time he had heard Gara say mother and blood. He figured it was the Shukaku whispering things to his mind. Given what Zetsu had gathered about Gara's childhood it was not surprising that Gara would give in to Shukaku's influence. I have seen the extent of your power, thus I have no reason to test you myself, Naruto said not bothering to reply on Gara's words, I will not hold back. Naruto said. Naruto did hand seals and kneaded chakra inside body turning it into fire. Fire release, majestic fire destruction. Naruto expelled a stream of dense flames that ignited upon reaching their target, Gara. The fire expanded covering most of the fighting ground of the arena. Naruto held the flames for some time wanting to see how Gara's sand would hold on. Gara was in the middle of dense and intensive sand. A few were starting to fear for his safety. It was like he had been thrown in a pit of flames. Gara had seen the flames coming and had his sand created a dome of sand around him. The sand held on but the intense heat of the flames heated his sand and made it unbearable for him. The intense heat inside his sand made it hard for him to breath. The heat was sulking out the oxygen inside his shell. Naruto stopped his jutsu before he cooked Gara alive. The flames cleared and Gara's protective sand crumbled down into dust. Gara fell on his knees with wide eyes sweating and trying to catch his breath. Once he had caught his breath, he got up from his knees and stood up. Cage Booth Your Janan certainly is brutal Hokage done. The Kaze Kage said. The Sandaime nodded, yes he is. Still I am interested on how he will do against my Gara. The Kaze Kage said. I think he will win the match, so far we have only seen him use fire jutsu perfectly and I don't believe that is all he can do. I believe there is much more we will see from him. The Sandaime replied. Jiraiya nodded agreeing with his sensei. He heard when Naruto said he would not hold back he wanted to see what he could do when he was not holding back. The Kaze Kage said nothing further. He chose to admire Naruto's skills and eyes. Back at the fight. You did well surviving that. Naruto complimented. He felt he needed to do so. No one could take his jutsu not be incarnated but Gara had defended himself well against his intense flames. It was worth complimenting. But will you be able to stand after my next assault? Naruto asked rhetorically. His Sharingan morphed into its Mangekyu state. Most who knew of the Mangekyu widened their eyes, to see Naruto wielding the Mangekyu at such a young age was defiantly shocking. Not even Itachi, who was a prodigy and a master of the Sharingan, had awakened his Mangekyu at a young age. The Kaze Kage's eyes lit yellow for a moment upon seeing the powerful Mangekyu Sharingan. He knew full well what one had to do to awaken it. He had done a lot of research about it. The Mangekyu made him admire Naruto even more than he was currently. He would be so feared if he could have both Sasuke and Naruto by his side. He wondered if Naruto had the Mangekyu when he fought him at the Forest of Death. Naruto crossed his hands on his chest while Gara just watched him. A blue chakra began to form around him. The chakra became dark blue and took a form of a skeletal humanoid that surrounded Naruto. The beast's head though skeletal had dark yellow eyes and a thin skeletal chin. The beast grew to a larger size and unleashed a roar. Its size was enough for Naruto, as he wanted to be able to move freely in the confined space. The beast stretched out both its hands as blue chakra blades formed. Susano. Naruto said. Naruto Susano shocked many who had never seen anything like this before. At the cage booth the elder shinobi who were new what it was just widened their eyes. 
The Kaze Kage chuckled darkly inwardly and sat at the edge of his seat. Jiraiya and the Sandaime did not notice as their eyes were firmly on Naruto. Gara just continued to watch Naruto emotionlessly with his sand swirling around him. The crowd was awed by what they were seeing they were seeing. They never expected such a thing from a Janan at the Chunin exams. It was like watching a Jounin exam, not a couple of Jenins displaying their strength. My incomplete Susano versus your perfect defense. Shall we see which is the stronger? Naruto said to Gara monotonously. He was not expecting Gara to answer his question. Even if Gara wanted to answer, Naruto did not give him a chance as his Susano began its charge. The Susano swung its right blade towards Gara. Gara created a wall of sand on his left to protect himself from the attack. The blade had much power and broke through the defense. Gara reinforced his defense with more dense sand. This time the blade hit a wall but still pushed him. Naruto Susano swung its left blade at a fast pace towards Gara. His sand was still holding back the blade on his left and much of his effort was focused on holding back the other blade. He could not block the next attack. He jumped back abandoning his sand. The Susano's blades returned next to Naruto. Gara sent a wave of sand towards Naruto. The Susano swung its blade and propelled the sand away from it with its blade. The Susano fused its blades making one long blade and wielded it with its right arm. It swung the blade towards Gara, who created a dense wall of sand in front of himself to avoid being hit. Naruto's attack broke through the sand and hit Gara. The power of the attack sent him crashing towards the wall of the arena. Gara created a large den on the wall with his crashing. He winced as he felt like Lee had thrown his weights on top of him. The Susano brought its left hand created a fist sending it towards Gara. The punch hit Gara dead on and broke though the wall. Gara let out a scream of pain as he felt the impact of the huge punch that hit his whole body. His second protective layer of sand was starting to peel off due to the damage his body was taking. The Susano dragged Gara from the wall and dropped him in the middle of the arena. His mouth was pouring out small amounts of blood. While Gara was still lying down the Susano raised its right hand and slammed Gara down the ground. The attack created a large crater on the battlefield. The Susano did not stop with its attack it picked up Gara from the crater and threw him towards the wall. Gara's gourd burst into sand and created a cushion for him to hit, but he still created a large dent on the wall. All of his sand had now peeled off his skin. His body was heavily bruised and parts of his body were now bleeding also. His breathing had become labored. Had he been a normal person he would not have been conscious right now. The ferocity of the attacks were too intense for a normal person to take them and remain standing or alive for that matter. Because of his sand, he only had a few broken ribs. Feathers began to fall inside the stadium and the crowd began to fall asleep. Genjutsu, I guess the invasion has started. Naruto said to himself. No sooner than later fights began to break out inside the stadium. Naruto deactivated his Susano. When he looked at Gara, he saw the Janan siblings running away from the stadium with him. He looked at Sasuke and saw the Janan going after them. Naruto shook his head Gara was in no condition to fight unless he used Shukaku's chakra. The chakra would heal and make him stronger than he was. Naruto suddenly on his knees under extreme pain. Using Susano had its benefits but it put his body under extreme pain. The pain had lessened from the first time he had used it. With a lot more training he would be able to use it without any pain. Despite his body being the perfect vessel to wield, any amount of power he was still of young age and needed to grow his body into a more mature body. Naruto got up from his knees and found himself surrounded by ten shinobis. The shinobi smirked at him as if they promised him pain. They were all sound ninjas. Judging from what Naruto could sense from them, they did not seem to be strong. Do you wish to dance with me? Naruto asked nonchalantly. He did not wait for a respond as his Mangekyu activated. A second later, his Susano flared to life. With a single swipe of its blade, the Susano blew the Jounins away from Naruto. The sound ninjas were hit hard as they did not have time to react. Naruto had attacked instantly without giving them a chance to ready for his Susano's attacks. The Susano's size receded and it became a rib cage surrounding Naruto. The shinobi's Naruto had attacked got up and prepared to fight Naruto. Naruto sighed placing his hands on his waist. He was almost embarrassed for thinking that his attack had incapacitated the ninjas. By the clothing the ninjas wore, Naruto could say some of them were jounins, but their level of strength paled in comparison to the strength of jounins from Konoha. Naruto deactivated his Susano. He flashed through hand seals. Fire style, majestic flame destroyer. 
gathering chakra inside his body and turning it into flames, he expelled a large amount of flames that spread out like a wave of water. It was just as big as the one he had used on Neji. It was a good thing for him, as he had never tested the jutsu on many people. One of the jonins tried protecting himself and his comrades, water style, water encampment wall. He yelled as a wall of water tried putting out the flames. However, the flames spread out wide and were impossible to contain or dodge. One Sutan Jutsu could not stop the dense flames. The flames reached the Jounins and began to eat away their flesh. They let out screams of pain as the flames began to incarnate. Naruto just watched impassively as his Jutsu incarnated the sound invaders. He turned around and jumped on the roof of the stadium. Looking around he saw a purple barrier on top of the academy building. Naruto figured that must have been where the leaders of both sides were fighting. Naruto looked carefully inside the barrier and found that it was Orochimaru fighting the Hokage not the Kazekage. He concluded that Orochimaru had impersonated the Kazekage as he did with the Kuzan Nin at the Forest of Death. Naruto was sure the Sandaime could take care of himself even if Orochimaru was his opponent. Despite the Sandaime being old and just a shelf of his former self he was still capable of defeating even the likes of Sanins. He was by no means a pushover because he was old. Naruto acknowledged that fact about the Sandaime was still strong despite his old age. The barrier was set so that no one could enter nor leave. It was a perfect place to fight without annoyances interrupting. At the walls of the village large snake summons were destroying the village's walls. Konoha Shinobi were trying in futile to stop the summons from entering the village. As Konoha Shinobi tried holding off the summons, large toad summons puffed into existence and began to wrestle with the snake summons. It was given that Jiraiya had been the one to summon the toads given that he was the only one who had the toad contract. Naruto activated his Susano again. It was still a ribcage surrounding him. He wanted to fight deal with some sound and sand shinobi. Earth style, mud dragon. A mud dragon hit Naruto from behind. The jutsu crashed into his Susano and sent him crashing down the ground from the rooftop. Naruto was so busy with his thoughts he forgot that he was in the middle of an invasion. Naruto hit the ground and created a larger crater. He was unharmed from the attack. His Susano shielded him from being hit by the Earth-style Jutsu. The Susano absorbed any damage Naruto would have suffered. Naruto was sent crashing because the Susano was not rooted down to anything but to Naruto. It went everywhere Naruto went. Naruto got up from the small crater unharmed his Susano still protecting him. He looked up at the room to see those who had attacked him. I tend to be careless knowing that my Susano is active guess I should deactivate it. He said to himself. Deactivating would also save him from using too much chakra. Susano consumed a lot of chakra from its user. Despite his vast pools of chakra Naruto was not above acknowledging that keeping a Susano activated for longer periods would take a huge bite off his chakra. Two ninjas jumped down from the roof and surrounded him. Naruto did not move at all his Mangekyu scanned them while his face remained impassive. Orochimaru-sama has some business to attend with you. He wants you to come with us if you refuse we will take you by force. That attack earlier was just to show you we can take you by force. The one at Naruto's front said. He wore standard jounin attire and a sound forehead protector. Oh. Naruto muttered with a raised brow. I would prefer if you refused because I want to see what the great Sharingan can do, the one at Naruto's back said sarcastic while walking into his front, I bet I can take you on by myself he exclaimed arrogantly. Naruto observed both Jounins they were stronger than the previous ones and seemed confident of their abilities. However, underestimating the power of the Sharingan was foolish thing to do. That is rather foolish. Naruto said turning his one visible eye to the Jounin who dared to mock his Dujutsu. Foolish? Naruto gave no response he pointed at the Jounin, Tsukiyomi. The sound Jounin found himself warped into another world. The world he was in was bloody red and black even the sky was all red and black. All sides to be just endless void of red and black. Under his feet a giant eye in the same form as Naruto's Mangekyu Sharingan appeared. The look of the eye was menacing, cold, and devoid of any emotions. The eye brought fear to the Jounin. He was suddenly pulled up into the air with both his hands stretched, he was nailed on a cross. Naruto appeared before the Jounin. His face still showed no emotion. With his right hand he had a black blade which he pointed straight at the Jounin. This is my world, in here I control everything, I see everything. For 72 hours, I will put you through an uncomfortable situation because of your arrogance. Naruto said his tone devoid of any emotion. 
T this I is not happening it's just a genjutsu. The sound Jounin yelled. Naruto responded by piercing the man on his chest again, and again. The Jounin screamed in agony at the pain he felt. Naruto's blade entered his body second by second without mercy. No blood dripped from his body, as the blade did not leave a wound. The sound Jounin stopped screaming after a few hours. Naruto cancelled his jutsu. In the real world, the Jounin Naruto had put under Tsukiyomi fell down to the ground unconscious. Only a second had passed in the real world. Tsukiyomi is the most powerful genjutsu in existence. Only those from the Uchiha clan to have awakened the Mengeku Sharingan can perform it. The torture done in the world of Tsukiyomi affected the mind bringing psychological trauma which was almost impossible to cure unless one was a medical expert. It only required eye contacted to be casted. However, it consumed a lot of chakra and put a lot of strain on his left eye, which he used to cast the powerful genjutsu. He only lasted for 32 hours. Naruto said to himself. The other Jounin bent down to his friend seeing him fall. He touched his neck and felt his beat albeit barely. He turned and faced Naruto glaring at him with all the anger he could will. His best friend was down and he did not know what had happened to him. What he knew was that Naruto must have been there one to harm his friend, what did you do to him? He demanded. Naruto was unfazed by the anger of his opponent. Nevertheless, he did answer the question, I tortured him. He replied simply as if it was insignificant. The Jounin gritted his teeth in anger, you little bastard, I will make sure you pay from this. He said forgetting his mission. He took out a kunai and rushed at Naruto blindly in anger. He tried stabbing Naruto with his kunai several times but Naruto dodged the sluggish attacks. The man was blinded by his fury that he could no longer fight at his level best. Naruto disdained weak-minded fools of shinobi who could not control their emotions. As the sound Jounin grew frustrated, his anger reached new heights. He could explode at any moment as his frustrations added to his anger. Naruto made eye contact with the Jounin, Sharingan, Genjutsu. He trapped the man in a Genjutsu. He hated fighting enemies who had no fight in them. It was a waste of his time and efforts. The sound Jounin found himself trapped in another world. The world sky reflected a rather huge eye version of Naruto's Mangekyu Sharingan. This made the world appear blood red. The sound Jounin quickly realized that it must have been Genjutsu. However, before he could try to dispel it a monstrous shadow with nine tails appeared before him. The Kyubi stepped forward slowly in a menacing form. Its large bangs glared at the Jounin and its blood-red eyes looked through his very soul. He thought it was a Genjutsu but he could defiantly feel powerful and hateful aura the Kyubi emitted. The fear that had gripped him felt like it was real. W what's going on here? He stuttered in fear. In response the Kyubi grinned darkly making the Jounin shudder at the dark grin. It was far scarier than he had seen from Orochimaru when he was excited about something. Kai! The Jounin yelled. Kai! The Genjutsu did not disappear. It was not an easy Genjutsu to break if one was not adept to Genjutsu. Naruto had hit a jackpot the Jounin he had caught with his Genjutsu was not adept to Genjutsu. The Genjutsu Naruto used was his only Genjutsu aside of Tsukiyomi. Like any other Genjutsu this Genjutsu trapped a person inside an illusion. Despite it being easy to detect because of the change of scenery it was hard to break. The Genjutsu was similar to demonic illusions. Instead of showing people what they feared to cause trauma to victims Naruto's Genjutsu fed on the fear of a person. The more a victim became fearful the harder it became to break. It had a time limit of a single minute. The Kyubi rushed towards the sound Jounin. It raised its paw and attempted to squash the Jounin. The sound Nin was in a state of shock as he was trying to figure out what was happening to him. He thought he was under a genjutsu but it did not dispel when he tried to disrupt chakra inside his body. Still he held little hope that it was still a genjutsu. He watched as the Kyubi's paw hit him compelling him down the ground. It held him there leaving only his upper body visible. Its head closed the distance with him. He could perfectly see those cold blood red eyes. The Kyubi held the man and threw him up. It opened its mouth waiting for the man to fall into its mouth so it could devour him. The sound Jounin eyes widened when he saw that he was falling straight into the Kyubi's mouth. He let out a scream of fear as he kicked in flight trying to move away so that the Kyubi did not devour him. His attempts were fruitless as he continued to fall directly into the wide mouth of a beast that struck fear into anyone who came across its path. His body began to tremble as the thought of death sneaked into his mind. He did not want to die, he feared death despite the fact that as a shinobi he saw death each day of his life. Help me. Someone please. 
he yelled in despair but help did not come. The cubie got its meal and chewed it gracefully. The sound Jounin thought he was dead but was surprised to find himself alive. His relief was cut shot as he saw the cubie rushing towards him. He began to run away from the beast in despair. Though he did not feel any pain he was experiencing any emotion he would feel if he had come across a situation such as this one in real life. Everything felt real it was just that he felt no physical pain but emotionally he was damaged. The QB finally caught up with him and tore his body apart piece by piece while he screamed wishing for death but none came. The process repeated five times before the QB stopped as the Jounin's wife and daughter appeared before him. He could only mouth what he wanted to say as his voice had abandoned him, nevertheless, his family did not hear him. The QB devoured them again and, again while he watched. It was the most horrifying thing he could see. He felt lost without knowing what to do. His family was being killed over and over again while he watched. He could not say it was a genjutsu as everything felt real. He dropped to his knees as the situation threw him into true despair. He no longer hoped that he could escape from the nightmare. However, he kept mouthing, please stop. Please stop. As tears poured out of his eyes. He closed his eyes and when he opened them, he saw Naruto staring at him. He looked at his trembling eyes and then around he saw that they had returned to Konoha. Naruto appeared closer to him and whispered into his ear, run away. Tell Orochimaru that I refuse to follow him should he persist I will find a way to kill him sooner than I would like. The sound Jounin nodded vigorously while trembling and crying. Despite his condition, he crawled away from Naruto. A minute later Naruto sensed something behind him. When he turned around a foot crashed into his face. The kick sent him flying away. Naruto regained control over his body, flipped in mid-air, and landed down the ground with legs touching first then his hands. The kick was hard and had a lot of power behind him. Naruto had been unable to dodge due to the speed and unable to block because he was also off guard. Naruto recognized the man who had kicked him as Baki, Gara-sensei. Another thing he took notice of was that the man was avoiding eye contact with him. Baki had seen what was going on with the different battlefields. He did not like what he had seen. Konoha was winning the invasion. It seemed that they had prepared like they knew they were going to invade. If Gara had been taking part it would not have mattered. But there was another thing he could do ensure that things went his way, kidnapping the son of the Yondaime Hokage. Unlike any other children of past and present Hokage's Naruto was different. Konoha loved the Yondaime more than they loved first Hokage. Capturing Naruto would force Konoha to give in to their demands. They would not dare abandon try to abandon the only child of their greatest hero. If word got out that they had abandoned the son of the yellow flash it would certainly take a huge bite off their image and economical structure. Very few villages would want to associate them if they abandon him. Baki smiled inwardly his plan was indigenous. You will come with me. Baki said in a commanding tone. He said it still avoiding making eye contact with Naruto's eyes. No. Naruto replied as his Sharingan returned to normal. Keeping his Mangekyu activated while not using any of the Mangekyu's abilities would only tire him out. I guess I have no choice then but to take you by force. Baki said and blurred out of sight. He appeared in front of Naruto and attempted to punch him. Naruto blocked the punch with both his hands. Baki swung his right foot high trying to kick Naruto. Naruto brought out both his hands to block the kick. The power behind the kick pushed Naruto back a few feet. Baki suddenly appeared in front of Naruto with his right foot raised. He attempted to kick Naruto on his chest. Naruto blocked the kick by both his hands as he could not dodge despite being able to predict what Baki was going to do. The power of the kick sent Naruto flying away. Naruto regained his balance and touched the ground with his hands and legs so that he could stop. Naruto rose up and looked at Baki. The man was considerably strong he was worthy of being a sensei to a Jinchuriki. Fighting someone like him without his Mangekyu active would prove to be a nasty thing for him. Before Naruto activated his Mangekyu Kakashi and Guy appeared in front of him, both in battle stances. Naruto, you go after Sasuke, he went after Gara. Shikamaru, Kuji, Kiba, Shino and Neji have already gone after him, but I think they will need your help, Kakashi said, we will deal with this one. Guy nodded, yes Naruto-kun let your flames of youth burn brightly by saving your comrades. Naruto turned around, fine. He said. Oh Naruto before you go take this, Kakashi said handing Naruto a small piece of paper with a seal written on it, I got it from Jiraiya-sama, it's a suppression seal it should be able to suppress Gara's chakra should he try to use his Baiju's chakra. Kakashi said I smiling at Naruto. 
Naruto took the seal and disappeared out of sight. Baki could have tried to follow him but in front of him were two of Konoha's most powerful jounin. He could not get just past them. Guy was the fastest and Kakashi had the Sharingan and a number of jutsus in his arsenal. He prided himself in his strength but taking on both the famed copy ninja and the green beast was a bit too much even for him. Let's go Guy. Kakashi said to which Guy nodded and both man charged at the San Jounin. A few minutes later. Naruto was running at top speed outside the walls of Konoha. By the direction in which the San siblings took he could pinpoint their general location. He would be able to find them given that there would surely be battles. Sasuke and the others would defiantly be fighting the San Janans. If Sasuke was not there they would not to fight but Sasuke did whatever he wanted so he would not listen even if his comrades told him not to fight. On his way outside the walls of Konoha, Naruto had seen Jiraiya battling against several shinobis from Sunagakur in the Sound Village. Despite the numbers, being against him Jiraiya was devouring his opponents with ease. It was not a surprising thing for Naruto to see. Jiraiya was indeed powerful despite that he was no longer in his prime. The man was already above 50 and still fought like he was 20 years old. Still despite Jiraiya's impressive power he was nowhere near, the level of power Madara and Hashirama held. Naruto sensed a Baiju's chakra around the forest he was currently headed towards and increased his pace. If Gara was using Shukaku's power it meant that he was in a position to fight at the highest level. A Jinchuriki using his Baiju's chakra was not someone any normal person could fight on equal ground. A Jinchuriki fighting using his Baiju's chakra can take on wounds that would immobile anyone and continue to fight as if nothing happened. A few minutes later Naruto arrived at the location his fellow genins were fighting. A sound of chirping birds was welcomed into his ears. Naruto stopped on top of a tree and observed what was going on. He watched as Sasuke rushed at Gara with his right arm palm sparkling electricity. Sasuke was covered by flame-like patterns all over his body. Sasuke had activated his curse seal to be able to fight Gara. Gara had materialized a tail and a large right hand. They were features of Shukaku but Gara had willed them. It was not that Shukaku was trying to take control over Gara. Gara was very much in control and with the creepy smile on his face one could tell he was enjoying himself. Sasuke attempted to pierce through Gara's chest, but Gara brought out his mini Shukaku hand and blocked the jutsu. The power of the jutsu cut through Gara's hand but did not reach his chest. Sasuke gritted his teeth and tried to get away from Gara. However, before he could Gara's tail was swung hitting the Uchiha on his chest sending him crashing towards the trees. Gara's hand reformed again as he laughed maniacally, more. More. Come at me with everything you have. Gara yelled like a mentally unstable person. His bloodthirsty nature had taken complete control over him. Gara ran towards Sasuke and hit him on his chest. Sasuke groaned as he was compelled to the tree almost breaking it in half. Gara grinned evilly as he picked up Sasuke by his transformed hand. His other hand began to pummel Sasuke continuously. After a few minutes Sasuke's flame-like patterns receded back to the cursed mark of heaven. Gara kicked Sasuke into the air and waited for Sasuke fall on his path so he could kick the Uchiha again. Just when Sasuke was about to be kicked Naruto appeared in front of Gara and kicked the Sunijinan in the face sending him flying. Sasuke hit the ground with a thud. Nevertheless, he quickly got up and glared dangerously at Naruto. What are you doing? Sasuke asked rhetorically, I don't need your help I can take him by myself. Sasuke said. Naruto looked the young Uchiha and took a step towards the young Uchiha. What he was seeing picked up his interest. Ho, oh, you finally matured your Sharingan. Naruto said stretching his left hand towards Sasuke face. Sasuke made no attempt to try and get out of the way. Naruto touched Sasuke's forehead making Sasuke recall the times Itachi used to poke him on his forehead. Sasuke took a step back as the thoughts of Itachi invaded his mind. Itachi's name always and thoughts always brought a darker side of him. Naruto's hand closed Sasuke's eyes. Sasuke was consumed by his thoughts to think of what Naruto might try to do to him. Naruto swung his right hand and hit Sasuke at the back of his neck knocking the Uchiha out. Sasuke fell down to the ground with a thud. Naruto did not attempt to catch him. Hey Naruto. A voice called out behind Naruto. Naruto recognized the voice as Shikamaru's, we will take care of Sasuke you handle Gara. Shikamaru said. He was standing under a tree with Kiba, Neji, and Shino. Kiba seemed to be wounded though not badly enough to threaten his life. Tamari and Konkuro were tied together next to the Konoha genins. 
Naruto said nothing, he jumped up onto a tree branch and looked at Gara. Taking a fight with another Jinchuriki would not be good for his health if he did not fight seriously. He had been fighting for too long now and had used high-level jutsus including the chakra consuming Susano and Tsukiyomi. He was not running out of chakra, he just knew that it would end up nasty for him fighting a Jinchuriki for a prolonged time. He was also a Jinchuriki but he never used the Kyuubi's chakra. He never used it all when fighting. Naruto chose to fight with his own power. The main problem was that Gara could turn into Shukaku. If Gara did succeed in taking the form of the Aichibi, it would prove to be nasty. Nevertheless, should he be fighting with Kyuubi's chakra he would not have to worry about anything. The Kyuubi was the strongest of all the Baijuus, it would be damning to his pride to lose to any Jinchuriki when he had the strongest Baijuu sealed inside of him. Naruto activated his Mangekyu preparing to fight with the San Jinchuriki. He needed to go all out from the beginning to end the fight at a short time. Naruto, Gara called with a dark look spread across his face, Mother wants me to devour you for what you did earlier to me, and so I will. Your blood smells good to me, I can tell it is delicious. Gara said and ran towards Naruto. Gara tried slashing Naruto's chest horizontally with his claw. Naruto was able to predict the attempt thus he sidestepped. He was still faster than Gara, which made it easy for Naruto to dodge Gara's attack. Naruto caught Gara's left hand and spun around twice, picking up speed. He threw Gara and sent him crashing towards the tree. Gara recovered rather quickly and jumped at Naruto again. He was faster than before. His clawed fist crashed into a tree branch Naruto was standing on and shattered it. Naruto had jumped up, not intending to try and block the attack. The power behind the strike would have proved that blocking was useless. Naruto blurred out of sight and appeared behind Gara. He was going for a kick from behind but Gara's tail stood in the way. The tail swung and hit Naruto with enough power to send him crashing down the ground. There was nothing more annoying than getting hit by something you could see. His Sharingan was able to predict the attack but in the position he was in, he was unable to dodge the attack. Gara turned around and grinned madly, where is all that power you had? I want to see it again. Show it to me. Gara said as he jumped to where Naruto had fallen. Naruto stood up and did a hand seal, fire style, great fireball. Naruto expelled the chakra inside his body he had turned into fire. The fireball he breathed out rushed towards the oncoming Gara. Gara brought out his tail and clawed arm to shield himself. The flame's intense heat burned Gara's materialized arm and tail making melting it. The materialized parts in Gara's body crumbled down like sand. Gara fell onto the ground with his legs. Ha 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 ha, he started laughing like a maniac. That's the power I want to see. I want more of it. He said growing another tail and two hands. Naruto saw this and knew that it was a matter of time before Gara turned into Shukaku. Gara took off at a very fast pace and appeared in front of Naruto. Gara swung his right hand attempting to hit Naruto. Naruto blocked the hit and attempted to hit Gara, but the Jinchuriki blocked his attempt with his left hand. Gara caught Naruto's right foot and threw the blonde away. Naruto was sent crashing towards the trees by Gara. Naruto groaned as he tried getting up but before his attempt could be a success Gara appeared above him. Both Gara's clawed hands were speeding down towards him. Naruto could only bring both his hands to block. The power of the strike resulted in making his attempt to block useless. The double hand punch grounded Naruto. Gara jumped up attempting to squash Naruto under his feet. This time was able to escape Gara's strike. Gara hit the ground with his legs created a large crater. That would have been nasty if I got hit. Naruto said to himself. Gara raised both his clawed hands pointing at Naruto. He began to shoot sand bullets at Naruto. Naruto jumped around the trees dodging the sand bullets. Gara only increased the number of bullets he fired at Naruto. He was laughing maniacally as he was enjoying watching Naruto dance around. It was quite an amusing scene for him to watch. A dark blue ribcage surrounded Naruto protecting him from Gara's bullets. The Susano blocked all of Gara's sand bullets Naruto was unable to dodge. Gara finally stopped allowing Naruto a chance to catch his breath. Naruto deactivated his Mangekyu and prepared for another round. The sand siblings watched their brother fight against the son of the Yondaime Hokage. He had defeated Gara before but when Gara became what he was now he was almost impossible to defeat. It was why they did not want to be close to the battlefield or else they would also be caught in the crossfire. However, there was nothing they could do since the opposition who defeated them had tied them and were currently standing behind them watching the fight. Tamari admired the strength Naruto showed at the stadium. 
However, watching the fight now Naruto was at the defensive while Gara was on the attack. She was begging to think that he would not be able to pull off a victory this time. Naruto channeled Chakra into his feet for more speed. He suddenly disappeared and appeared in front of Gara. He punched Gara on his gut with a powerful punch. He proceeded to punch Gara at his face several times before jumping up. Naruto swung his right leg towards Gara. The leg connected with Gara's face sending him crashing towards the trees. Naruto landed gracefully on the ground panting slightly. He held a hand seal and converted the chakra needed inside his body into fire, fire style, flame dragon caterwaul. Naruto said as he expelled five small flame dragons. The dragons sped towards Gara. They were set to explode upon hitting their targets. Four hit Gara's arms and one hit Gara's tail. All three materialized body parts explodes exploded into flames. Gara let loose of a pain scream because of the explosion. I refuse to be beaten. Gara yelled out as he leaked considerable amount of demonic chakra. An explosion of chakra rocketed around him. Naruto remained calm despite knowing the dangers that was knocking. It was of no good losing calm because things were not looking good. If anything losing calm made a person make rush decisions resulting in mistakes that one would not have made had he remained calm. Naruto watched as the debris cleared. Gara had transformed into a chibishukaku. Naruto created a wood clone and sent it towards the mini Shukaku. The wood clone sped towards Gara and engaged him in a fight. While the clone kept Gara busy, Naruto converted chakra inside his body into dense and intense fire going through hand seals. Fire style, majestic fire destruction. Naruto said as he expelled a stream of intense flames towards Gara. The clone was to keep Gara busy while Naruto performed his jutsu so that it could not get away. The stream of fire hit Gara and the clones setting them ablaze. Both were engulfed in a sea of flames of intense heat. The fire spread out wide incarnating everything it touched. Naruto knew Gara would not be incarnated by the fire because of his form. His real body was inside of the beast he had become. The Chibishukaku was like an armor. The flames would only burn the armor. Naruto stopped his jutsu and watched as the mini Shukaku crumbled down into dust leaving a slightly burned Gara. The San Janan was breathing heavily and his shirt was burned off his body leaving him bare-chested. Gara began to leak large amounts of demonic chakra that would make anyone run away for their lives. Naruto knew what was coming. He could not put Gara under Tsukiyomi as psychological trauma to Gara would only free Shukaku since Gara's mind was already unstable. He was forced to use the chakra suppression seal Kakashi had given him. Naruto rushed to appear in front of Gara. He took out the piece of paper and placed it on Gara's forehead. The chakra Gara was leaking disappeared. Gara fell down with a thud on his back. Naruto followed him his example by following down on his knees. He breathed heavily for a minute before standing up again. Shikamaru and the others started to walk over to Naruto with their prisoner seeing that Gara was down. Sasuke too walked with them since he had already come to after Naruto had knocked him out. He was very angry when he woke up but a thought sneaked into his mind. He decided to take up the thought to make up for being knocked out by Naruto. I lost, again, Gara said weakly to himself. His eyes traveled weakly towards Naruto, how are you stronger than me? He asked surprisingly calm for someone who was like a maniac. I train harder than you, Naruto replied, but I have been once told that you can be truly powerful when you fight to protect your precious people. Precious people? People you care about. Naruto responded. Fighting to protect your precious people? Is that why you are strong? I already told you, I am strong because I train hard to become strong. As for my precious people they are all dead, Naruto replied nonchalantly, I must praise you for your strength had you fully transformed into Shukaku I would have lost. Naruto said his left eye narrowing behind him as he sensed several chakra signatures from behind. He turned around and raised a brow seeing a wide grin from Sasuke. Shikamaru was the first to speak, are you alright Naruto? Shikamaru asked with a bit of concern in his voice. He saw Naruto fall to his knees and just wanted to make sure he was alright. Naruto nodded, yes, just a bit worn out, he replied his eyes going back to Sasuke, I see, you copied my majestic fire destruction. Naruto guessed correctly. Sasuke's grin only widened. What do we do about them? Neji asked them referring to the San siblings. It is only logical that we take them back to Konoha given that they are children of the Kaze Kage. They would prove to be essential in future negotiations with Sunagakur. Shino said keeping his calm demeanor. I agree with Shino. 
Shikamaru said his tone having gone back to his usual lazy tone. No, Naruto said getting the attention of everyone, free them and allow them to return home. Naruto said. Who are you to tell us what to do? And Shino makes a good point why should we do what you say? Kiba fumed out of nowhere. However, Naruto blissfully ignored him. The other Janans gave Naruto a question look, the Kaze Kage is probably dead, Naruto said making Konkuro and Tamari's eyes widen, the Kaze Kage who was at the Chunin exam finals was not the Kaze Kage but rather Orochimaru impersonating the Kaze Kage. When Suna realized that their leader was killed they will abandon the sound and return home. Shino nodded along with Shikamaru, assuming that Orochimaru had manipulated Suna to believe that he was the Kaze Kage after having killed the real Kaze Kage, it is highly unlikely that Konoha will take any action against Suna. Shikamaru spoke his thoughts. They untied the two tied sand siblings. Tamari gave Naruto a grateful smile, which Naruto did not return making the girl frown. She tried her best not to let her temper get the best of her. She hated being ignored especially by someone she was trying to show that she was grateful to. However, in her current situation she could do nothing. Naruto disappeared away from the group making his way back to Konoha. Tamari and Konkuro picked up Gara and headed towards the wind country. After they had made a distance between themselves with the Konoha group Gara said two words that made his siblings almost cry. I'm sorry. With Naruto. A few minutes later Naruto reached the walls of Konoha. He looked around and saw that the fighting had already stopped. He had sensed multiple chakra signatures making their way away from Kanahagakura when he was returning to the village. The wounded were being treated by many medical ninjas within the walls of the village. The barrier that was set on top of the academy had disappeared also. Naruto disappeared to the Shinobi district. He wanted to allow his body to rest. He did not really care about any other details. What mattered most was that Konoha had won the invasion. Chapter 8 Normality could not be said for the gloomy clouds that reigned over the village hidden in leaves. The sound and sand invasion had come and gone. The Konoha had remained standing, she had stepped out of the invasion as the winner. Konoha had battled against two hidden villages and won. Despite the victory, it still felt like a loss to many of the broken hearts in Konoha. A victory had been ensured, but it did not come without a price. Konoha had paid a high price for her victory. A price that she thought she would have never had to pay. The death of the Sandaime Hokage, Hiruzen Sarutobi, the professor. The invasion of sand and sound might have been a failure to their end. However, Konoha had suffered a great loss. The Sandaime had lived through two great shinobi wars. He was a man of peace, loved and admired by many for his ways. He was the only Hokage to have served two terms and was the only man to have been Hokage for the longest period. The professor was indeed a great man in the eyes of many. Amongst his achievements were the three legendary shinobis, the Sanins. He had been their sensei and groomed them into the powerful shinobi they became. Unfortunately, the student he loved most over his other students was the cause of his death. Orochimaru, the snake Sanin had been the reason the Sandaime had left the world of the living. Konoha was mourning at the death of its Hokage because of Orochimaru, a traitor to the village. He was not branded a traitor because of the invasion but because many years ago the snake Sanin had been abducting children and experimenting on them. Many mothers lost their children because of Orochimaru's actions. No one held love for the Sanin after his latest stunt. Almost everyone wished they could tear him into peace, kill him and then bring him life and repeat the process until their hearts were satisfied. Naruto sat alone at the roof of his apartment building. He had not even bothered to attend the Sandaime's funeral. His views on the old man differed from other people's views. The death of the old man did not concern him. Naruto had not attachments to the old man. Death was something that one could cheat or avoid. Madara had cheated death for many years but in the end, he died. Regardless of the circumstances concerning his death, the fact is that he died. Despite that belief, Naruto also believed that death would never claim him before he achieved his goals. It was possible for his grandfather to postpone the due of his death to a later date, it should also be possible for him, Naruto believed. Things were moving faster than Naruto had thought they would be. Every piece was already on its position, all that was left was for someone to ignite the flames. Although not saddened by the Sandaime's death, Naruto had not been expecting the Sandaime to die at this time. Naruto had thought that the Sandaime would live for a few more years. With the Sandaime alive, it would make things easy for him to act. Despite being manipulative, the Sandaime held a soft spot for Naruto, and Naruto knew how to exploit it. Given the death of the Hokage, 
a new leader would have to be set. Naruto just hoped that Dansu was not chosen as Hokage or he would be forced to have Zetsu assassinate the old war hawk. If Dansu became Hokage, his movements within the village would be restricted. Dansu would surely try to control him, not that he would succeed in doing that. No one controlled Naruto, and Naruto danced no one's drumming. Only Madara made him dance, but he was no more. With so many things happening fast, Naruto was learning that he should not be expecting things from other people to work on his favor. If he was going to get rid of his problems, he had to rely on himself. There would surely be surprises along the way but he just had to be prepared for them. Even if he cannot not be prepared for every surprise, he would just have to deal with them. Hokage's Office Homura and Koharu, the former teammates of the Sandaime Hokage stood within the office. After the burial of the Sandaime, they had called Jiraiya into the office to make him an offer. Konoha needed a leader, despite the villages not suffering major causalities, there was still some destruction that needed to be corrected. To calm people down after the invasion and the death of Hiruzen they needed to someone strong to be a leader and calm the people's nerves. Jiraiya, I am sure you already know why we have called you here, Homura said to which Jiraiya nodded, so will you Jiraiya take the mantle of Hokage? No Jiraiya replied simply as if it was the easiest answer to give. What do you mean by no, Koharu said raising her voice, you have to take up this offer. You are the only one who is suitable for this job and the only Sanin who is still loyal to Konoha. Still I cannot be Hokage, I am not cut out for it. I failed to protect Sensei and besides if I became Hokage no one would be able to run my spy network and you know how important it is. I also will not be able to do my research, which is important to me. Jiraiya reasoned why he could not be Hokage. Jiraiya, you have to think twice about what you are saying. You are the strongest in the village, we need someone like that to lead the village so that we do not appear weak to other villages with the death of Hiruzen. No, I can't be Hokage. Jiraiya said with a thoughtful look, I may be the strongest but I'm not the only Sanin who is still loyal to Konoha. He said. The elders were silent for a moment before they finally spoke. You don't mean her, Jiraiya. Jiraiya nodded. But she has not set foot in the village for 20 years and has refused to come back each time she was asked to return. I know, but all I need is to convince her to come back to the village. Give me two weeks and I will return with her. Jiraiya said. Do you even know where she is? No, but I know where to look for her. Fine, we will give you two weeks if you don't come back with her by then you will be the next Hokage, Koharu said making Jiraiya nod reluctantly, you can take some Anbu with you to look for her. The elder offered. Jiraiya shook his head, there is no need for that. Taking Anbu with me will only make her feel threatened. I have someone in mind who can accompany me. Who? Homura asked guessing whom Jiraiya might be thinking of taking with him. Naruto Jiraiya responded. No. Given his show at the exams, he has answers to give to the council and he needs to be confined within the village since we still do not know if he is loyal or not. Allowing him to leave with you might just give him the opportunity to make a run for it. He will not run away. I am sure if he wanted to leave the village, he would have done it already. Wouldn't it also be better to have him answer your questions with the new Hokage in attendance? Jiraiya countered. Fine, but if he runs away it will be in your head. Moreover, you have to remember now that it is common knowledge that he is Minato's son, Iwa might try something. I am well aware of that. Jiraiya said, well then, I will be going. Jiraiya said and left through the window. Homer turned to Koharu, are you sure it's wise to allow him to take the boy with him? I am not sure it is wise or not but I doubt he will be able to run away even if he tried. Jiraiya will be with him always and we will send a squad of Anbu to tail them. Koharu replied earning a nod from Homura. Even if Naruto tried to run, he would not get away with the Anbu on his tail along with Jiraiya. Still they hoped that he did not try anything stupid. Unknown Location Orochimaru was called a once-in-a-generation genius. He was not called a genius for nothing, he smart and saw things in a way that no one did. Years ago, when he was still a Konoha shinobi he was branded the genius of Konoha. Orochimaru was brilliant, he had a brilliant mind. He was always scheming making plans. He knew things that no one knew existed. He had even invented a jutsu that would make him live for all eternity. Despite all his brilliance, Orochimaru had his faults. One fault that has often cost him greatly was his habit to underestimate his opposition. When he tried to take over Itachi's body, he had underestimated the Uchiha and was left without an arm. He had underestimated his sensei and was almost sealed within the belly of the Sinigami. 
Had it not been for the fact that the old man was already tired because of their battle he would have been sealed away. He recalled the cold fear he felt when he saw the Sinigami behind his sensei. He had screamed for his sensei to let him go. His body was giving up it was rejecting him. He needed to transfer to another body soon before his current body melted down. He could not take Sasuke's body now since the boy was not even in his possession. Orochimaru's door opened and Kabuto walked inside with a tray holding a glass of water and some tablets, it is time for you medicine Orochimaru-sama. Kabuto said holding out the medicine and tablets for Orochimaru to drink. The snake Sanin coughed before he drank the tablets. How are going to solve your problem, Orochimaru-sama? Kabuto asked worried about his master's health. I will have to transfer to a new body soon this body is rejecting me. If don't switch bodies soon I might die, Orochimaru said in a rough voice, that aside, did you conserve the blood sample I gave you after we returned from branding Sasuke-kun? Yes Kabuto replied with a slight nod. Good, study it, find everything you can about the blood sample. Orochimaru ordered. If I may Orochimaru-sama, whose blood sample is it? Kabuto asked carefully. Naruto-kun, Orochimaru replied earning a confused look from Kabuto, don't you find it curious that Naruto has the Sharingan and not just the normal Sharingan the Mangekyu Sharingan? Naruto's both parents were not Uchiha's as far as we know. However, Naruto's use of the Sharingan makes me assume that he has Uchiha blood running through his veins. This means one of his parents had Uchiha blood. I am curious as to what more secrets Naruto is hiding, studying his blood sample will satisfy my curiosity. Kabuto nodded, I will get onto it right away. Kabuto replied and walked away leaving Orochimaru to his thoughts. Naruto's Apartment Naruto was in laying low inside his apartment. He was planning his next move, what he would be doing next. He could not just let things stay as they were. He needed to be doing something that was of importance instead of playing ninja for Konoha. He had enemies to prepare himself for Konoha could wait. A knock on the door snapped Naruto out of his thoughts. He could guess who it was by the chakra he was sensing off the person. Naruto opened the door and found Sasuke standing outside. Naruto quirked an eyebrow, he wondered what Sasuke wanted from him. What can I do for you? Sasuke looked down as he was struggling to say what he wanted to say. He was acting like a shy girl trying to ask a boy she likes out on a date. Naruto sighed and told the Uchiha to enter. Sasuke walked inside Naruto's apartment. He looked around and saw that the place was neat, everything was perfectly into place. It looked like a woman lived inside the place, which reminded of how clean his home used to be when his mother was still alive. Are you really an Uchiha? Sasuke asked his tone down. I have already given you an answer to that. Sasuke gritted his teeth, sometimes he hated how Naruto answered questions. That aside, if Naruto was Uchiha it meant they are from the same clan and he was not alone anymore. True he did not like Naruto a bit but if Naruto was from his clan, it changed things. Naruto was unlike Kakashi, who has a borrowed Sharingan. Naruto was like him their Sharingans were not borrowed from anyone. Why didn't you ever say anything to me? Sasuke asked forcefully. Naruto could tell that Sasuke was forcing himself to ask the question. Because I did not want to. He replied simply. Sasuke was quiet for some time before he spoke again, you have the same eyes as that man. I know how you to awaken them, so who did you kill to awaken them? Naruto's eyes morphed into the Mangekyu for a second before returning to their normal blue color. Sasuke could not really tell what was going through Naruto's head. The only thing that changed in his face was his eyes only. The Naka Shrine, you are making use of it. Naruto said completely disregarding Sasuke's question. The only way in which Sasuke knew about the secrets of the Mangekyu was if he read from the stone tablet in the Naka Shrine located within the Uchiha compound. Only Uchiha could decipher the tablet. You know about it? How? Sasuke demanded forgetting that Naruto did not answer his question. Were you expecting me not to know of it? It is a property of Uchiha anyway. Sasuke calmed himself down, I really don't like you Naruto, Sasuke said before he could continue Naruto corrected him. No, you just envy of me. Sasuke glared at Naruto, well because it was the truth. Naruto had more power than him, power that he needed to kill Itachi. We are from the same clan and there is just the two of us in Konoha, I think we should talk. It was obvious that Sasuke used all his willpower and swallowed a chunk of his pride to say those words. He was forcing himself because regardless of his feelings they were of the same clan. 
As it stood, the clan was nearly extinct because of the massacre several years ago. All in due time Sasuke, Naruto said, now I must tell you to leave. Naruto said in a tone that left no room for saying otherwise. Naruto had sensed someone inside his apartment. Sasuke got up and left leaving Naruto alone. You broke through my barrier, Naruto said seemingly to no one, well that is to be expected from a seal master. Jiraiya appeared out of nowhere with a sheepish grin spreading across his face. You are lucky that I was inside the apartment, had I not been in here this apartment would have self-destructed. Naruto added making Jiraiya wince at the thought of an explosion setting off while he was inside the apartment. The way Naruto said it there was no reason to think it was just a bluff. Is there a need to set up something like that? What could you have hidden in here that you don't people to see? Jiraiya asked, figuring that Naruto would not go that far unless he had something inside his apartment that he did not want people to see. Hiding something? Might be so, Naruto responded, what do you want? Can't I just come here and see how you are doing? You can, I just do not want you to. Now get to the point. Jiraiya walked towards Naruto and sat beside the blonde, you have the Sharingan, can activate it, deactivate and seem to be able to use all its abilities. Only Uchiha can do that, so tell me Naruto how is it possible I knew everything about your parents. Your father was like a son to be. If one of them had Uchiha blood in them, I would have known about it. Jiraiya spoke his expression changing to deadly serious. Huh? Jiraiya, you are a spymaster, you deal with information gathering. I cannot just tell you how it is possible. Use your spy network and gather intel on me. When you get something valuable come back to me. Naruto said to Jiraiya. Jiraiya was a spymaster, a challenge like this one ought to prove interesting to the Sanin. However, Naruto knew that Jiraiya would not find anything about him. So you are not going to talk. However, it is only a matter of time before the council drags you to the council chambers and force you to tell them everything. If you refuse, they might even have someone enter your mind to find the answers they need. Jiraiya said with a smirk. Personally, he would be against the idea of having someone enter Naruto's mind but if Naruto were refusing to cooperate that would be the only choice left for the council to make. Nobody could refuse the council well except for him, but only because he was a Sanin and the strongest shinobi in the village. Naruto was just a Janan and things would not work on his favor given that certain members of the council did not love him. Make me? I would like to see them try. If that is all you came here for Jiraiya, you can leave. Jiraiya sighed, he would have to start searching things about the blonde, but first he had to start with the parents. Naruto was not going to give out his secrets that easily. That aside he had other business to attend with the blonde, no that is not all, I came here with you for a mission which you will do with me he said grinning at the blonde. I'm not interested in doing a mission with you. Naruto rebuffed. You are going on the mission whether you like it or not, Jiraiya said firmly, we have to find my former teammate and convince her to return to the village as god I'm Hokage. Like I said Jiraiya, I refuse to accept the mission. If you force me to go outside the village I won't return. Jiraiya stared intensively at Naruto. If it was someone else, Receiving Jiraiya's piercing gaze he would have cowered down in fear and given to Jiraiya's demands. Naruto was not anyone, he was trained to be able to keep calm regardless of the situation he was in. You are not doing me a favor by coming with me but you will be rendering a service to Konoha by coming to search for the new Hokage, and yet you refuse, Jiraiya said shaking his head, your father would be disappointed in you. If Jiraiya was expecting a reaction from Naruto, he got none. Even if Minato were still alive, Naruto would not care what he thought of him. The man's opinion of him meant nothing to him, Jiraiya you and I know very well that your request that I go with you to this mission has nothing to do with a service to Konoha. You only requested that I go with you because you want to get close to me. You want to take the time to convert me into your apprentice. You know very well that I would not serve any purpose in convincing the Senju to be Hokage, he paused for a moment, that being said there is no reason for me to go on the mission with you. Jiraiya could not deny that his reasons for wanting Naruto to go with him were 100% not related to convincing Tsunade to come back and take the mantle of being Hokage. He just wanted to be close to Naruto. The mission would give him a better chance to being close to Naruto. Please Naruto, let's go together. I know I screwed up but I'm trying to make up for my mistakes here, can't you give me a chance to make up for that, Jiraiya said his voice taking a pleading tone. Naruto shook his head, I told you, I don't hate you for abandoning me. Therefore, there is nothing for you to settle. I can talk to you with no qualms, but I don't need any emotional attachments with you or anyone, Naruto said truthfully. Jiraiya was quiet for a moment. 
Naruto truly seemed not to hate him, but it did not make him feel any better. Nevertheless, there was a positive in all this, Naruto was willing to talk to him. Other than talking to him and not being able to do that, he would choose to have the privilege of being able to talk with the blonde, even if they could not form a bond. Finally accepting the situation, he nodded and smiled at Naruto. I guess I will see you when I return with the new Hokage, Jiraiya said and left. Later that night. Naruto thought of something he had been relenting to do. He closed his eyes and focused. When he opened his eyes, he was in a large old sewer. The sewer echoed with drips of water. Other than the drips, it was peacefully quiet. However, there was something sinister at the end of the sewer. Naruto sensed the sinister aura and walked slowly towards it. His watery footsteps ringed around the sewer replacing the drips. Naruto stopped in front of a large gate with a piece of paper that had a kanji for seal. Two large blood-red eyes opened up and looked at him. The fearsome Kyuubi revealed itself from the shadows of its cage. It was resting its head on his paws. It was obvious that the beast had been napping. So my jailer has finally decided to grace me with his presence, the Kyuubi said with an amused tone, have you come to tell me that my prison sentence has been cut short? Naruto knew the nine-tailed demon fox was being sarcastic, is this what the great Kyuubi has been reduced to? A mere sarcastic by Juu robbed of your freedom, you shoulder hatred while calculating and binding for its time to escape from a prison created for you by a mere human. How pitiful. The Kyuubi glared at Naruto intensively with barely contained anger, watch your mouth human. I may not be able to do anything behind this bars but this cage cannot hold me forever. You will do well to remember whom you are speaking to. So easily provoked and angered, Naruto murmured but the Kyuubi heard him, I know that the seal cannot hold you forever. If you were complete, I am sure you would have already broken out. However, right now you are incomplete no longer as strong as you were when you attacked Konoha. Nevertheless, you are still the strongest of the nine despite being incomplete. The Kyuubi knew what Naruto meant by incomplete. Before he was sealed into Naruto, Minato split his chakra into two, sealing the yin half within himself and the yang half within Naruto. That was what Naruto meant by incomplete as other half was missing. Seeing the Kyuubi silent Naruto spoke again saying what he had come to say to the Kyuubi, I know you hate humans for their treatment towards your kind. You must hate me knowing that I am the grandchild of the man who called you a mindless beast that needed to be guided by his blessed eyes, Naruto paused for a moment. I have read everything about the six paths in your history to know full well that you are not a mindless beast that needs to be guided. As for your imperfection, I plan to fix that. In addition, for your prison sentence, you will have your freedom soon. Naruto said and disappeared from the sewer. The Kyuubi did not believe a word Naruto said. For years, Baijuus were as nothing but weapons for their use. Humans could not be trusted they had proved that many times. Even now, all the Baijuus were sealed into a human to be the secret weapons. He could remember well when Hashirama told him that he was just too powerful let loose and left to roam around the world. The Kyuubi never went to attack humans for no reason. He only attacked when they came after him so that they could capture him and make him their weapon. He always stayed away from humans, but still he was seen as a danger just because had greater power than theirs. Outside of Konoha. Two figures were walking at the direction opposite to Kanahagakur. Both wore black cloaks with red clouds and straw hats that hid their faces. The taller one had a large sword strapped behind his back, the sword was covered in bandages. The two men had successfully entered the walls of Konoha and infiltrated the village. They were looking for Uzumaki Naruto or rather what was inside of him. Instead of finding the boy, they had found some interesting info about the blonde that was spreading around the village like a wildfire. The Uzumaki Naruto they were looking for was not as the same as they had found. The Naruto they had found was being called by many names, some called him Namikaze, some called him Uzumaki Namikaze-sama, a few called him Uchiha. The Uchiha part was unbelievable. None of the men had expected to find the name of the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki associated with the Uchiha. Furthermore, the rumors they had about Naruto possessing the Sharingan troubled them. The news of Naruto wielding the Sharingan troubled them. They also heard about Naruto's fights at the Chunin exam finals. They both knew the abilities that Naruto was said to have displayed were abilities of the Mangekyu Sharingan. The shorter one wanted to prove everything for himself. It was unbelievable that Naruto was part of his clan. He had never heard anyone saying anything about it and Naruto had no characteristics of an Uchiha. No one could have guessed that he would be part of his clan. At the moment he did not believe it, to believe it he had to see it for himself. Kisame, said the short one identifying the taller one with a large sword strapped on his back, you go ahead to the meeting point. 
I want to go back to Konoha and confirm something. Kisame was given no time to say something as his partner disappeared and a murder of crows leaving him alone. Kisame just continued walking away from Konoha with an annoyed look on his face. He hated it when Itachi did something like that. Naruto. Naruto sighed as walked towards the Uchiha compound. Soon he would have to move into the compound and live there. The compound would also provide some security for him. The problem was Sasuke, the Uchiha's attitude annoyed him to no end. He would have just have to deal with it or he would never be able to live freely inside of the compound. He had never visited compound before. Now was the time for him to visit the compound. Naruto trolled through the compound looking at everything. The compound was still intact, there were no houses that were destroyed. The only wrong with it, was that the once lovely place was now like a ghost town. Before the massacre, one would find young Uchiha's running around the compound with wide smiles raining over their faces. The place was once lively with clan members walking around with their Uchiha pride held high was nothing more than a memory of what it used to be. Despite the fact that the Uchiha clan had lost most of its trust from the village and villagers tended to avoid the Uchiha clan members, happiness reigned over the compound. Satisfied with the condition of the compound Naruto decided to make one more stop before leaving the compound. He was able to make the stop because there was no one following his movements. It was because of the recent invasion, some Anbus were working hard to ensure that the village was still in top position. Others were patrolling to ensure that no spies from other villages enter the village. This meant to contain what was happening inside of the walls of the village. The strongest of the shinobi were obviously out of the village doing high-ranked missions to prove that Konoha could still handle high-ranked missions despite the recent invasion. What Konoha was doing now was displaying its power. Naka Shrine Naruto entered the shrine with the use of his Sharingan and the Naka Shrine Pass technique. Only an Uchiha could enter into the shrine. It was protected because it held valuable clan secrets. Naruto was positive that even though Kakashi had an implanted Sharingan he could not enter the shrine. Uchiha used the shrine as their secret meeting place. Naruto activated his Mangekyu Sharingan. He looked at tablet looking at read it. Everything he was able to read he already knew. Madara had copies of tablets at the hideout. The things he could not decipher needed the Rinnegan to be deciphered. The Mangekyu could not decipher everything about the Baijuus and the Sage of Six Paths. Naruto sighed despite not having the Rinnegan he already knew everything since Madara had already deciphered everything. The place was useful to hiding things. Naruto wanted to see it for himself. It was truly a safe place to say anything. Naruto felt someone and narrowed his left eye behind him. The man in a black cloak with red clouds appeared inside the shrine. Naruto a glimpse of the man's eyes, Uchiha Itachi Naruto said turning towards the older Uchiha. Itachi now had no doubt. Naruto was an Uchiha. To be able to enter the shrine proved that. Not even Orochimaru who could make his way through any barrier and was slippery as a snake could enter the shrine. In addition, the Mangekyu he was seeing on Naruto's left eye proved that the villagers were not exaggerating. So it is true, Itachi, said walking close to Naruto. He took off his straw hat and his face became clear. Itachi's own Mangekyu Sharingan was activated. You are from my clan. How that came to be raises a lot questions. People always question what they cannot understand or what they refuse to believe. Is it not better to question things and accept them as they are? Naruto said. Naruto figured that Itachi would want to know how he was an Uchiha. He did not tell him the same answer as Jiraiya because Itachi was someone who Naruto had some kind of respect. That respect was because the Uchiha had massacred the whole Uchiha clan. He was the strongest Uchiha aside from Tobi. It was not that Naruto did not respect Jiraiya for his strength. Jiraiya was told what he was told because he was meddling into things that did not concern him. Telling him to search for information was just sending him on a wild goose chase since he will not find anything. Itachi, Naruto was telling to accept that he was an Uchiha and not try to reason things. Itachi nodded, I had come to see if what I had heard was true, Itachi said. Your presence, does it mean that Akatsuki has begun its hunt for Baijus? Naruto asked blankly. If Itachi was shocked that Naruto knew of the organization he worked for he did not show it. No, not yet we were just collecting information on Jinchurikis, Itachi replied, how did you know? Did Jiraiya tell you? No, Jiraiya has not told me about the organization. Given how secretive the Akatsuki is I doubt he knows anything useful. Naruto replied. How do you know then? I did not think that you were the ones to be asking these questions Itachi. I expected someone like your partner to ask such questions. 
Naruto revealed something. That Itachi had a partner he never told Naruto he had a partner. By the way Naruto spoke it sounded like he knew how his partner acted, how much do you know? Anyone with half brains would be truly curious. Well, I know everything about the Akatsuki, and that there are four Uchihas alive, Naruto said getting a reaction from Itachi. Itachi's eyes widened slightly, not anyone would have noticed but Naruto noticed. Itachi knew who the fourth Uchiha was, and before I forget, I must thank you for the service you did to the Uchiha clan. Had you not massacred them, the Uchiha name would have been surely degraded and shamed. His words got another reaction from Itachi. It was unbelievable to say that Naruto was talking to him. The last time he saw the blonde, he was roaming around the village wearing an orange jumpsuit causing havoc. You have surely grown and matured since I was saw you Naruto-kun. Itachi said, with a small smile that quickly disappeared. Do you intend to tell Sasuke the truth behind the Uchiha massacre? If I did that then I would have to kill him. Naruto said. Itachi understood that in Sasuke's current condition if he was told the truth he would try to destroy the leaf village, which was why Naruto said he would have to kill him if he told him the truth. Sasuke was unstable at his condition, it made him capable of anything. He was really a disappointment, nevertheless he was still his brother and he still loved him. Next time we see each it will be in a battle, I hope by that time you will have grown stronger than you are now. Itachi said walking away. Leaving Kisame alone for a long time was not a smart thing to do. With Itachi gone Naruto was left alone with his thoughts. The Akatsuki were making their move, despite not actively starting to capture Jinchuriki, they were making a move. Naruto had not expected such a thing. He had to become strong, and the only way for him to that was to train. However, he could not train to his fullest ability within the walls of Konoha. The hideout had always provided him the perfect environment to train to his heart's extent. Training at the hideout was also good since he would have no one interrupting his training schedule. At the hideout, he only had Zetsu, who would never interrupt him while he trained. He had to leave Konoha for a couple of years to get the training he needs to become strong. Yes, when Jiraiya comes back he would have to leave the village. Whether they liked it or not he would leave to get his training done. Two weeks later. Konoha was once again happy. The lost grandchild of the first Hokage, Senju Hashirama had returned. Not only had she returned but she had returned as the god I'm Hokage. The villagers were overjoyed by the news. Now they had two of their Sanins back at the village. Senju Tsunade had returned to the village with her apprentice Shizun. The woman gladly accepted the mantle of Hokage. However, a rumor was spreading out that Jiraiya had to pay all her debts, which were a lot, promised to stop hitting on her and promised to supply her with sake from Mount Mayuboku once in a month. The sake from the hidden village of the toads was said to be a sake of highest quality. No sake from the elemental nations could rival its taste. That was just a rumor, nobody knew how Jiraiya convinced the woman to return after she had left the village for 20 years. It had been three days already since Senju Tsunade was officially installed as God I'm Hokage. Naruto had never seen the woman or Jiraiya before him. It did not concern him though. He had already prepared for his departure. It was only a matter of time. The following day. Naruto was summoned to the Hokage's office. He was not the only to have been summoned by the god I'm, Shikamaru, also summoned. Jiraiya and the Hokage's assistant Shizun were also present within the office. You were also summoned too, Shikamaru said in a bored tone looking at Naruto, this is troublesome. Naruto gave Shikamaru a rare slight smile that was only alive for a second. Jiraiya noticed it, so did Tsunade and Shikamaru. Everything else is troublesome to you, Shikamaru. Jiraiya noted to talk to Shikamaru privately. Naruto was willing to go as far as to smile at Shikamaru. There had to be something between the two that Jiraiya did not know. Ever since he returned to Konoha he had never seen Naruto smile before, but in the presence of Shikamaru he smiled, even though the smile was small it was a smile nevertheless. The god I'm cleared her throat to get everyone's attention. She looked at Naruto, so this is the son of Minato, Jiraiya told me about. He looks exactly like his father, well except for his eyes. Tsunade thought looking at Naruto. Naruto's eyes, the Sharingan, staring at his left eye that was devoid of any emotion made her feel uncomfortable. Tsunade sighed and spoke, you must be wondering why I called you two here, Tsunade said, you two participated in the Chunin exam finals. The judges at the exams made a decision to promote you to Chunin. Tsunade announced. None of the two smiled or seemed to be excited about the news. Tsunade threw them both Chunin flanks. Shikamaru, you can leave. 
Naruto stay behind. Shikamaru nodded and left with his chunin flank jacket at hand. Haim, we should go now. Jiraiya said to Tsunade. Knowing Tsunade, she probably had already forgotten about the council meeting. Tsunade nodded, Naruto, follow us to the council chambers. Tsunade spoke in a voice that made her suitable to be Hokage. Naruto followed her and Jiraiya without saying anything. Council chambers. The chamber was packed with council members. Clan heads formed the Shinobi Council, civilian council formed by two civilians from the business industry to ordinary civilians. In attendance were the elders of the village who served as advisors to the Hokage only. They also had more power than any other member did in the council room. Tsunade sat at the seat of the Hokage and Jiraiya walked stood behind her. Tsunade looked at Naruto who was standing calmly in front of the table, take a sit Naruto. Tsunade said showing Naruto an empty chair. Naruto walked towards the chair and sat down. All eyes within the room turned to him. Naruto looked at each council member with his lone visible Sharingan eye. The most influential clan was the Hyuga clan, as it was now the most powerful clan within Konoha. The clan owned more land within Konoha than any other clan did, it also held a lot of bragging rights when it came to village politics. Hyuga Hyashi headed the clan. The other clan that held more power than other clans had to be the Nara clan. Their head clan was the Jounin commander and acted like the brains of Konoha. Every strategy that the village formed was formulated by him, or had to pass through his eyes first for his approval. The other clans held equal power. One could not put them ahead of one another. They all served Konoha and provided Konoha service based on what their clan specialized. We can begin this meeting. Tsunade said calling the meeting to begin. Are you really part of the Uchiha clan? Sume Inuzuka, head of the Inuzuka clan asked. Yes Naruto replied calmly. How? Shimura Danzo asked. The old war hawk was one of the elders. He was truly curious as to how Naruto was an Uchiha. He knew both the boy's parents and none of them were Uchiha. So how was the boy part of the Uchiha clan? I cannot answer that question. Naruto replied simply. Listen boy, you will give us all the answers we need. We are the council of this village, and we order you to tell us everything we want to know. Elder Komura said firmly. Naruto was not phased by her firm voice, as I said I cannot answer the last question. Why do you refuse to answer that simple question boy? What are you hiding? Donzo asked his face showing no emotion whatsoever. Simply, because I do not want to tell you. You might be the council of the village. However, you are not my council, Naruto said. I being a shinobi of this village serve this village as best as I can. I will answer questions regarding missions and things that might trouble village security, but you cannot make answer your questions about my family when I tell you how I am part of the Uchiha clan I will be telling you about my family's secrets a family that you hid from me when you decided to throw me at the orphanage. Jiraiya might not be pleased because Naruto was not giving answers but he was happy with how Naruto was dealing with the council. It was the truth they could not legally force him to answer them questions about his family. Reminding them that they hid his parentage was a wise to say given the situation. Tsunade had the same thoughts as Jiraiya. The clan heads had to agree with Naruto. Naruto was not at liberty to discuss about his family. You dare refuse an order from the council boy? Order of the council? Well, this is your answer. I don't know how. I expect you to have the answer since you have known about my parents ever since I was born. You know of them ever since they were still children. Shouldn't you be the one to give me the answers? That was one way to avoid answering the question without sounding as if he was refusing an order from the council. Shikaku smiled that was quick thinking from Naruto. He knew it was a lie, as Naruto said before he did not want to answer the question. Nevertheless, Naruto could easily say he said that because he was embarrassed about not knowing anything about his parents. He could say that he just found out one day after a life-threatening situation that a Sharingan had awakened. Why did you keep your Sharingan a secret? I was afraid that I would be killed like the rest of the Uchiha clan members if I came out. Naruto replied with another lie. It was interesting to see the dumb and fuming faces of the council members. The lies provided him entertainment so he could get through the meeting. Chibi Shikaku was rolling around in laughter. That was a textbook answer. It was another lie, but it was also a believable reason. If anyone found out that he or she was an Uchiha after the whole clan was massacred with only one survivor, he or she would surely hide the fact that he was an Uchiha in fear of being killed. If someone had given that reason, it would have been believable. Naruto, 
you know that's not the reason you hid the Sharangan and you know who between your parents gave you Uchiha blood. Jiraiya said looking for answers. Jiraiya, this council decided to hide my parentage from me. They threw me with the other orphans and watched me, as the villagers hated me, ignored me, treated me like a demon, like an outcast. You should be grateful that I am still here in this village, instead of forcing answers from me. Naruto stated his tone devoid of any emotion. What do you mean, we should be grateful? Donzo asked with narrowed eyes. Exactly what I said. After how this village has treated me, you should be grateful that I am still loyal. I could have simply let the QB out and let it finish what it had started. However, I did not, I held on and was never tempted to do such a thing. Here I am being questioned like a criminal simply because I chose to keep a few things to myself. Naruto said as his Sharingan morphed into its Mangekyu Sharingan state. The Mangekyu glowed reddish blood as if it was daring anyone to say otherwise. Danzo narrowed his eyes at Naruto. The Kyuubi was untamed. Had Hiruzen given him the Kyuubi he would have trained it to become a weapon to Konoha and loyal to him. Because of Hiruzen's foolish beliefs the Kyuubi was making fools out of them. It was unforgivable. I think it is safe to say that what Naruto is saying it that if he wanted to betray Konoha, or plot something against it he would have done it already given his hushed childhood. Which everyone was aware of but did nothing about it. Personally I would not wish for what my own child to go through what Naruto went through as a child because of his burden, Shikaku spoke for the first time, Naruto is saying he has no plans to betray the village and will continue to serve it. Even though we allowed the villagers to do what they pleased with him. So there is no reason to be suspicious of him and the questions being asked are unnecessary. Shikaku concluded earning nods from other head clans and the Hokage. I want answers from Naruto, but I have to agree with Shikaku. Jiraiya said making it known that he was not happy with the lack of answers from Naruto but agreed with what Shikaku was saying, I also believe that Naruto is not planning anything against the village. The elders did not like where things were now. With the majority favoring Shikaku's conclusions, Naruto would walk away without having to answer to their questions. It not matter though, there was still another time. They would get him another time, and he would answer everything. One little mistake and he would regret making fools of them. Fine but next time he comes here we will not tolerate such act of disrespect. It will be seen as treason. Koharu said. The civilian council even now never said a word. It was as if someone had threatened or paid them to be quiet during the whole meeting. Naruto did not care either way. Well I guess Naruto can be excused now, so we can discuss other subjects of importance. Tsunade said stressing the word importance. Naruto left the chamber leaving the council members to discuss matters about the village stability, security and economy. The following day. Naruto was again called to the Hokage's office. He had been planning to visit the office to let the Hokage know of his plans. It would not be good if he disappeared without telling the Hokage. Tsunade was sitting behind her desk. A bottle of sake and a large stack of papers decorated the table. The woman to have been having a bad day. Jiraiya was sitting on the window with a rather calm look on his face. Tsunade looked at Naruto. He was not wearing the Chunin flank jacket she had given him yesterday. Just like yesterday, his Sharingan was active. She really needed to ask Jiraiya why it was always active. I called you here because Jiraiya has something important to tell you. Tsunade said leaning back to her chair. Naruto looked at Jiraiya waiting for the Sanin to say whatever that was important. My spy network has discovered an organization called the Akatsuki. I don't know much about the organization. What I do know is that they used to work as mercenaries, but they had changed their objectives, Jiraiya said, currently their objective is to hunt down Jinchurikis for their Baijus. For what purpose I do not know. I only know two of the organization's members and both are S-rank criminals. Uchiha Itachi, I'm sure. Jiraiya trailed off seeing Naruto raise his hand, what? I have heard enough. Naruto said, I'm aware of the organization. He revealed. How do you know of it? It took me years just to find out what I told you. Jiraiya queried. I have my ways Jiraiya. It should not be surprising that I'm aware of the organization given that I am what they are after, no rather the QB is what they are after. Jiraiya was trying not to be surprised by this. Naruto always seemed to surprise him each time he spoke. Nevertheless, the fact that Naruto knew made it easy for him to let Naruto know just how dangerous the organization was and that his life was in danger. You must know that the organization is a threat. At your current level you cannot handle S-rank criminals on your own. If they were to attack you now, they would capture you, Jiraiya said, 
I have decided to take you on a three-year training trip to prepare you so that you might be able to protect yourself. Jiraiya said with a grin. I cannot go with you Jiraiya. Naruto said, before he could continue Tsunade spoke. Jiraiya assumed you would say something like that. Which is why, she said holding a paper, this paper outlines that you were given permission to leave the village for three years on a training trip with Jiraiya. Everything is signed and approved. Tsunade said with a smile knowing that there was no way now that Naruto could refuse. I was trying to say that I cannot go with Jiraiya because I have already left the village. Now according to that document on a training trip for three years. I might have left with Jiraiya, it is because I do not need him for my training. Tsunade and Jiraiya stared at Naruto with wide-eyed. What do you mean, you already left the village? Tsunade asked. I am a clone. I have already been planning to leave the village to train. Should I have asked permission you would have denied me, if Jiraiya had not suggested it. If it was Jiraiya's suggestion I would have to go with him which I did not want. You do now that if it went for this document you would have risked being branded a missing nin. Tsunade said. I am aware of that, but to train to my heart's extent I had to leave alone, Naruto said, well, I'm out of chakra. Naruto said and disappeared in a puff of smoke. I'm going to look for him. Jiraiya said and disappeared from the window. He did not give Tsunade time to say anything. He was a little sad that Naruto had left the village without him. Not that only, should the Akatsuki find him before he does they could capture him. Minato would never forgive him if something happened to Naruto. Later that day. Tsunade sat in her office uncomfortably. The work was just too much for her to handle. The paperwork she had to sign and the orders she had to give were putting a toll on her. She was beginning to wonder why she had even accepted the mantle of Hokage in the first place. She cursed Jiraiya for making her come back to the village. If she had not come back now she would have been somewhere gambling, losing money. Even though she never won, it was fun for her. That time she could drink all the sake she wanted day and night. Now she had to focus of her work as the god I'm Hokage. It was too much work overload for her. After taking as god I'm Hokage, she had to deal with stabilizing the village because of the recent invasion. A month had yet to pass since the invasion occurred. The news and events were still fresh within people's minds. Konoha had also lost a Hokage because of the invasion, the Sandaime Hokage. It was up to her to deal with the issues. The Sandaime had been a big part of Konoha's history and position within the elemental nations. Aside from the Sandaime's death, there were no other major losses that the village suffered. A few shinobis had lost their lives, but it did not damage the village's military force. The strongest shinobi within the village were still alive and in good condition. With her introduction as Hokage, it would also influence people to be brave knowing that another strong person was leading them. Villagers could easily panic because of the recent invasion that had occurred and the mastermind behind the invasion was still alive. Their panic would be because they fear that another invasion might hit them again. Tsunade as God I'm Hokage had to ensure that the villagers did not have those kinds of thoughts. The village did not lose much from the invasion only a few buildings were destroyed. Tsunade had to make sure that the buildings were rebuilt with the funds she had at her disposal. The hospital, despite being in good condition was not at the standard she liked it to be. For it to be where she wants it to be, she had to train kunoichis who aspire to be medics. The village's economy was in a good shape. She could not complain with anything after reading the reports. The fire daimyo had been a big help for the village to recover from the invasion. He had given the village's full support and did not cut down the money he gives to the village. In fact he increased the budget so that the village could recover quickly and asset itself as the strongest of the five great shinobi villages. Konoha had gone through many conflicts with other villages but it has always stayed at the top. The economy had never faltered. Maybe it was because the village always had someone or few shinobis who were known throughout the elemental nations. Tsunade sighed as she rubbed her temple. Overseeing things within the village was a lot harder especially because of the recent invasion. Had it not been for the invasion she would have not been having so much to do. She cursed Orochimaru for invading Konoha. It was his fault that she was not having time to have some sake. She had to keep working, go to meetings discussing on how things were going to be run, the changes that had to occur. It was all tiring for her. At least he had Shizun to help her with some to the work she has to do. She had a problem with the council. It has not been a week since she took charge of the village and they were already making decisions for her and telling her what to do the elders troubled her. Tsunade had come to hate them because they liked being in control of everything. She wondered how her sensei was able to stand them and not think of a way to kill them. 
she had already thought of a few scenarios where the elders accidentally lose their lives. They were power-hungry and wanted to rule the village even though they had selected her as Hokage. At least some aspects of the village were not giving her headaches. The shinobi that made the village's military were all in working condition. Konoha could stand another invasion should anyone consider invading them. Her presence along with Jiraiya put things at Konoha's advantage. Sunagakur, the village had sent messengers to resolve the issues between the two villages. Sunagakur had taken part in the invasion that saw the death of the Sandaime Hokage. That only gave grounds to Konoha to attack the village without any other village saying anything to it. What complicated the issue was that Sunagakur and Konoha were allies when Sunagakur took part in the invasion. By being against Konoha, the village betrayed Konoha, the alliance they had made. Their reasons did not matter as long as they did go against Konoha in the invasion. To attack a village you are allied to, is a major offense, a major offense that the village had to pay heavily for it. At its current strength, Suna could to compete with Konoha. Konoha was the strongest of the five great villages and Suna was the weakest. Suna had also lost almost 50% of their military force because of the invasion. Most of their shinobis had died during the invasion which meant that the village would be eradicated should Konoha decide to invade it. Dansu had been pushing for the invasion but she successfully denied the motion. She did not want another war to start. Tsunade was aware that Suna knew that should they fight Konoha they would be eradicated. Konoha still had its military force operating almost at full power. Given the hard truth, Suna will do anything to make that that a new alliance with Konoha is formed. They will do so to save their own skins. It would be hard to form the alliance since the trust between the two villages had been lost. Sunagakur had betrayed them and there was no telling if they would betray them again. They did once, it was possible that they could do it again. Tsunade was not someone to take advantage of the situation and force things out of Suna. She wanted to settle things with Sunagakur so that the villages can move on and continue to work together as allies. With the treaty between the villages to be discussed next week, Konoha had to take to account that Sunagakur was manipulated by Orochimaru. Orochimaru had killed the Yondaime Kazekage and impersonated as him for a long time. He made the village believe that they were following the orders of their Kazekage just so he could have the village's military force in his control. The fact that Orochimaru had manipulated Sunagakur made it an easy choice for Tsunade to decide against invading the village. However, even though they were being manipulated, the fact remains, they betrayed Konoha. For their betrayal, they would have to compensate for the damage done to the village. Another issue, which she had to deal with, was Uzumaki Naruto or rather Uchiha Namikaze. However, she doubted that the boy would use Namikaze. Jiraiya had told her that he did not see or acknowledge Minato as his father. With all she has read about the boy on his reports, he is described as a distant person. With what she had seen from him ever since she first talked to him, she had to agree with the report. Another issue that was giving her a headache was that Naruto had left the village. Jiraiya had assured her that he was not defecting. From the reports, he is very secretive which was why he even decided to leave the village alone. Nevertheless, it troubled her knowing that the Akatsuki was also out there and could capture him should they get to him before Jiraiya. He was not strong enough to handle S-rank criminals. Jiraiya would have offered better security since he can take on S-rank criminals. Her worries were eased by the fact that he did say that he was gone. She just did not find found that he had disappeared from the village. She was upset because of his disregard of doing things properly. A shinobi of the village did not just leave a village without permission. If a shinobi did that, he risked to be hunted down by hunter nin since they would be forced to list him as a missing nin. By the looks of things after listening to his clone, she deducted that even if she had refused to allow him to leave he would have left. If it were not for the fact that she had a document that said he was on a training trip, she would have been forced to punish him for his insubordination. Thinking of it, he never did refer her as Hokage, or by her name. The fact that he had decided to leave without permission from her made her want to discipline him when Jiraiya does find him. He had to know that he could not do what he pleased and that she was the god I'm Hokage and her word was law. If she said no, it was no doing otherwise would be treason. She had to deal with him. She could not have subordinates who did not respect her word and authority. Tsunade also had to deal with the issue of Sasuke Uchiha. From what she had read from his profile, he was also distant as the other Uchiha, but Sasuke had other things that distinguished him. He was a cold, arrogant and a spoiled brat. The boy was obsessed with power and killing his traitorous brother. He did not care about anything other than his revenge. Sasuke was why she was waiting for Hitake Kakashi. She had been waiting for the famed Sharingan no Kakashi for two hours. 
Jariah told her about his tardiness and laid-back attitude but she did not think it was this bad. It annoyed her having to be kept waiting by her subordinate. Kakashi walked inside the office. His right eye was firmly of his familiar orange book as he flipped a page. You wanted to see Hokage-sama. Kakashi said without even taking his eye off his book to look at the god I'm when he spoke. A tick mark appeared on Tsunade's forehead. Kakashi had the nerve to keep her waiting and then not offer her an explanation. To make matters worse he was not even looking at her when he spoke. His eyes were on the orange book that Jiraiya writes. Kakashi put that book away and look at me or I will break every bone in your body and heal you just so I can beat you up again. Tsunade said dangerously clenching her fists. Kakashi gulped and put away his book. Tsunade could make her threat a reality. She had a hot temper and one of her chakra-enhanced punches was capable of putting anyone out of commission. If she did beat him to an inch of his life, she could save him given that she was the best medic in all the elemental nations there is nothing that she has been unable to heal. Good, Tsunade said leaning back to her chair, I called you here about your student Uchiha Sasuke. Tsunade said getting straight to the point. She would deal with the man's tardiness some other day, now she had important matter to discuss with the Jounin. Did he do something? Kakashi asked immediately fearing that his revenge-driven student might have done something stupid. Tsunade shook her head, no, she replied making Kakashi sigh in relief, you are aware that Orochimaru has already marked Sasuke and that he wants him to be his next vessel. The council fears that if Orochimaru comes back and promises Sasuke more power than he already has given Sasuke will defect and follow Orochimaru. Tsunade said. Kakashi nodded, I have seen it in his eyes. He would not even think twice should Orochimaru try to get him. He said sadly. Yes, that is what the council fears. They have decided to give Sasuke what he wants the most, power. Giving him power will make sure that he does not defect. The council does not want to lose their precious Sharingan seeing how the Uchiha clan has become nearly extinct. Tsunade said, saying the last part bitterly. How is he going to be given power? You are going to take him on a three-year training trip. You will train him as hard as you can. Tsunade replied. Kakashi was quiet for a moment. He was not surprised that the council was going this far to make sure that Sasuke stayed in the village. They had done it before, when they ordered him to train Sasuke for a month before the Chunin exams finals. He was also the only one suitable to train Sasuke since he was also a Sharingan user like Sasuke. Okay, Kakashi said with a small eye smile. Going away from the village would give him a chance to read his book without interruptions and he would not have Guy challenging him, but what about my other students? I cannot just leave them behind. Kakashi raised a concern. He would be a bad sensei if he were to leave his other students without making sure that they were taken good of. Do not worry about them. According to Sakura's profile, she almost has perfect chakra control. I want to take her to train under medical ninjutsu. What needs work is her fangirl attitude. Tsunade said. Well that is one of his students taken care of, what about Naruto? Tsunade went through hand seals activating a privacy seal so that no one did not overhear what she was about to tell Kakashi. What I am about to tell you is known to me and Jiraiya only, Tsunade said, Naruto left the village. Tsunade revealed seriously. Kakashi widened his eye, he could not believe what the Hokage had just said, he defected? Kakashi said in disbelief. Tsunade shook her head making Kakashi let loose of a sigh of relief, he went away to train. The brat left without even asking me first. When we found out that he had left, we were telling him which turned out to be his clone that Jiraiya was going to take him on a training trip so that he could protect himself against the Akatsuki. It appeared that he already knew about the criminal organization. Kakashi nodded, even if he went to train. Was not it better to have left with Jiraiya-sama who could offer him better security? I did point that out. Nevertheless, the reason he left without permission was that he knew he would not be allowed to leave alone and he said that he did not need Jiraiya. So he left alone even though it risked him being branded a missing nin. But still leaving alone is not the wisest thing to do. Naruto might be strong but he cannot take on S-rank criminals on his own. Kakashi said believing that it was suicide for Naruto to leave the village without someone like Jiraiya protecting him. He seems to be rather smarter than Sasuke. Therefore, I have I feeling that there is a place he went that he knows and we do not so that he could train while also hiding. Given how informed and secretive he is, it should not be surprising if he did something like. Tsunade said not knowing how right she was. Still, leaving on his own was not the wisest thing to do. I agree with you on that. Nevertheless, 
Right now we can only hope that Jiraiya finds him before the Akatsuki does, Tsunade said, as far as the council knows, Naruto is on a three-year training trip with Jiraiya. I would like to keep it that way. Understood Hokage-sama. Kakashi knew that if the council got a wind of the fact that Naruto left the village alone they would try to punish him or even brand him as a missing nin. You are to be gone by tomorrow morning. Jiraiya will visit you occasionally to see your progress so let us know of where you go. You will also receive an S rank pay each month to take care of yours and Sasuke's expenses. Tsunade said going back to Kakashi's training trip with Sasuke. Kakashi before you go. I want you to search for anything you can find on Naruto's whereabouts while in your training trip, do it discreetly. Hi. Good you are dismissed. Tsunade said dismissing the Jounin. Kakashi left in a puff of smoke. He was going to the memorial stone to say goodbye to Rin, Obito, and Minato-sensei before he went to tell Sasuke to get ready. Tsunade went back to her paperwork. She had a lot of it to sign and approve. A few days later, Naruto's hideout. Naruto stared at the collection of Sharingan eyes that Madara had collected over the years there were hundreds of Sharingan eyes stored safely. Naruto wondered what Madara wanted to do with so many eyes. Well he could have just been keeping them safe from Nanuchihas who would try to get their hands on the powerful Dujutsu. Even though a Nanuchiha could not use the Dujutsu's full abilities, it was still a powerful tool even the hands of a Nanuchiha. Kakashi had become famous with his use of the Sharingan despite not having Uchiha blood he used it efficiently. If Madara stored this many eyes, he must have also preserved his original eyes. The eyes he wielded before he took his brothers to gain the eternal Mangekyu Sharingan. Naruto spoke as Zetsu appeared from the shadows of the dark room. Yes, he did. Do you want them? Zetsu asked. Yes, I need to gain the eternal Mangekyu Sharingan. Madara's other eyes are with Nagato, I can't take them to gain the eternal Mangekyu Sharingan given my current level of power and I also want to awaken my own Rinnegan. Taking Nagato's eyes would complicate things. Naruto said. I will go and get them. I know where he hid them. Zetsu said before he disappeared. An hour later Zetsu came back with a pair of eyes. Naruto led Zetsu to a room mainly used to experiment. Implant them on me. Naruto ordered and lay on the bed. Zetsu did as told and implanted the eyes. He took Naruto eyes and stored them elsewhere. Three days later. Naruto stood at his training ground with Zetsu watching. He had been testing the power of the eternal Mangekyu Sharingan. Naruto had though that there was no difference between the MS and the EMS. He thought that the difference was that with the EMS, one did not suffer from blindness. However, he was wrong the EMS had more power than the Miz. Naruto turned around and looked at Zetsu, Zetsu, I want you to do something for me while I train, Naruto said, I want you to search the elemental nations, do not leave a stone untouched. Try to find if there is another Uzumaki beside me and Nagato that is alive. Zetsu did not bother to ask why. He just nodded and disappeared to begging with his search. Naruto examined his hands before holding a ram seal. It's time for me to use the unique ability of the cage bunshine to fast track my training. Naruto said to himself. Tajuu cage bunshine no jutsu. Chapter 9, The Nest of the Serpent. Two years, eight months later. You are finally going out. Zetsu stated the obvious as he watched Naruto walk past him. Naruto had grown taller over the past two years and eight months. His spiky blonde hair had grown longer, as it was now under his shoulders. His hair parted to frame the sides of his faces covering his right eye, the bangs framing his face reached his chin. He still wore his usual black attire added with a shinobi dress Madara wore in his days consisting of a bright red armor similar to that of samurai worn over a simple black suit. The armor was constructed with numerous metal plates, formed into multiple protective guards along his body, in particular, chest, waist, shoulders and thighs. The chest plate left his back exposed. On his back, there was an Uchiha clan's crest, and the Uzumaki swirl. Black boots accompanied his attire and gloves, with the Konoha forehead protector partly visible on his forehead, as some of his hair covered it. On his back, Naruto had the gun by Madara had given him, but the tomos that were on its face were replaced by the Uzumaki swirl and the Uchiha clan's crest. Naruto also had a belt sash holding a sword. Yes, I have trained enough. Naruto replied as continued to take giant footsteps towards the exit of the hideout. Where are you heading to? Zetsu asked following Naruto from behind. He was truly curious, as he wanted to see Naruto fight against someone else. 
After the training Naruto had put himself through with the help of shadow clones it would take a miracle for someone to beat him. Madara would have been proud if he was seeing Naruto now. Rochimaru's secret hideout in the borders of Otto to get the Uzumaki girl you found and the Sinigami mask, if it was Orochimaru who took it. Naruto replied his Sharingan eyes gracing the light of the world for the first time in months. While he trained, he never went outside the hideout. He always kept himself busy within the dark shadows of the hideout. You might come across Orochimaru if you are going to that hideout. He usually spends his time there experimenting. Zetsu warned. Orochimaru's presence is nothing of importance. If I find him there, I will make good use of him. Naruto replied looking at the sunny sky. Now that you are going out there, Jiraiya will be able to get to you. What will you do if he finds you and tries to force you back to Konoha? In addition, there is Dansu and the Sandaime's teammates. Zetsu asked knowing that Jiraiya had been looking for Naruto ever since he left the village. Jiraiya could search wherever he wanted to but he could never find Naruto anywhere. Now that Naruto has decided to show himself to the world, Jiraiya would be able to get to him. With the manner in which Naruto left the village, it was possible that he might try to force Naruto back to Konoha. The Council of Konoha was also aware that Naruto was not with Jiraiya as they were informed. If they were able to get their dogs near Naruto, they would surely try something. Knowing Dansu, he will surely send his Rudonbu to try to either assassinate Naruto or capture him. It would be amusing to see them try though, since none of the Rudonbu has the strength to kill or capture Naruto. I will deal with it then, Naruto replied without a hint of worry in his tone, now let's go. You will stay in the shadows. Naruto said walking away from Zetsu. Rochimaru's hideout was waiting for him. The hideout in the borders of Oto was the one that was most hidden than the other hideouts within Oto Gakur. The Uzumaki girl Zetsu had found spent her days at the hideout. Zetsu sank into the ground without any further word. Things were surely going to be interesting from now on. He could not wait to see how things penned it out when Naruto reveals his power. However, he doubted Naruto would reveal his full strength soon. River Country The grass was burned, trees broken, the landscape seemed to have gone through a reshaping phase. It was what seemed to be the results of a heavy battle, a battle between strong fighters using high level of jutsus, a clash of titans. The landscape had gone over a makeover. Two battles had taken place over the belly of the earth. The first match was Hitake Kakashi vs Jiraiya and the second match was Uchiha Sasuke vs Jiraiya. Despite the impact the battles had on the surrounding area, the fights were just sparring contest. While Kakashi was training Sasuke, he had also been training himself. Ever since he left Anbu, he had stopped training taking more of a laid-back attitude. He had watched Sasuke train harder every day. He gave the Uchiha training methods that Anbu employed. Sasuke never complained once about the harsh training. He trained like a possessed man. Kakashi realized that Sasuke trained hard because there was a reason he wanted to get strong. Sasuke had an ambition that he wanted to make a reality. Kakashi questioned himself, what was his dream in life? He found out that he had no dream, but he wanted to protect his comrades. His thoughts conceived another question, could he protect his comrades if he did not have the power to do so? He knew the answer. With how Sasuke trained, the Uchiha was bound to surpass him, Sharingan no Kakashi. For him to become stronger and not become weak he had to train. It had been years since he ranked as an a rank ninja. He had yet to pass that level, but he knew if he trained more he could pass that border and become s rank. His rival and friend, Guy could make s rank whenever he opened more than 5 gates. Guy was physically strong between them, thus he was able to open that many gates, but he had an arsenal of 1000 jutsus, the Sharingan at his disposal. Should he train more, he could finally cross the border of a rank and become s rank. Rank did not matter to him, but level of strength mattered. In his current level, he could not protect what was precious to him from S-rank shinobis. He could take on other A-rank shinobis by himself but S-rank he could not. S-rank criminals were hunting someone that was like a brother to him down. Despite never admitting to anyone, Kakashi saw Naruto as his little brother given the Minato Naruto's father was like a father to him. Kakashi had trained beside Sasuke. He trained so hard that guy would be proud of him. If you had trained as much as you in the past two years after you quite Anbu you would have been stronger than me Kakashi. Jiraiya commented looking at the Jounin sensei. Kakashi had truly given him a run for his money in their spar. If he had trained hard after quitting Anbu, he would have been on par with Asanin. However, his strength level now was satisfactory. He could take on an S-rank ninja on his own without worry. Kakashi smiled, 
he had not only trained but he had also worked on his character, becoming a bit more serious than he usually was. His laid-back attitude was the source of his laziness. I guess you are right. Kakashi said. He felt strong and confident with himself after the training he did. The biggest surprise though was Sasuke. I never expected the brat to land a hit on me while I was serious. So to think that the Uchiha would do as much as to injure him was unthinkable. Sasuke has really improved in his own strength. His use of the Sharingan makes him a tough opponent to face, well not for him. The brat might be impressive but he was not in a level where he could actually beat him easily. However, Sasuke was able to wound him without even using the power of the cursed seal of heaven. The seal doubled Sasuke's power and gave him more chakra at his disposal. If he gains the same eyes as Itachi and Naruto added with the cursed seal, Sasuke would surely become one of the strongest in the elemental nations. He could as well be able to defeat him with the Mangekyu Sharingan and the cursed seal of heaven. Sasuke scowled upon hearing Jiraiya call him a brat. He hated Jiraiya for that. The man almost never called him by his name, it was always brat to him. Sasuke had trained hard and achieved so much power that he thought he could even take on Itachi now. Speaking of Itachi, have you found him yet? Sasuke asked looking at Jiraiya. Because Sasuke had discarded his cold attitude and had a little bit of change of personality, Jiraiya had been looking at Itachi for Sasuke. Still, he did maintain his arrogance and superiority complex. He was no longer focused on killing Itachi as he had been in his younger days. Kakashi had worked overtime to get Sasuke to think of other things other than his revenge. He had made Sasuke take things seriously and have another goal other than killing Itachi. He did not tell Sasuke to forget his revenge but he made Sasuke understand that revenge was not the only thing one could live for. I have been able to track his movements for a while but he often goes off the grid like a ghost. Last month one of my men saw him crossing the fire border towards the wave country. I believe they were looking for Naruto. Jiraiya replied. Sasuke nodded, still there was also the issue of Naruto. What have you found out about him? Jiraiya sighed, nothing. I do not think I ever will find anything unless he decides to stop hiding from wherever he is hiding. I have searched all over the elemental nations and I found nothing about his whereabouts. Jiraiya said. He did not know whether to be happy or angry. Happy that Naruto was able to hide for such a long time from both him and the Akatsuki. Angry that he was not able to find the blonde anywhere despite all the resources at his disposal. I'm going back to Konoha to give Tsunade both your progress reports, Jiraiya said. Kakashi I think you should get the brat to do some missions to gain fighting experience. I don't think there is anything else you can teach him. I was thinking of doing that. Kakashi said. He had also thought of getting Sasuke missions. There was nothing else for Sasuke to train. What was left was for Sasuke himself to hone his skills and improve where he can. Well I guess I should be going. I will talk to Haim and see if she can provide a mission for you guys. Jiraiya said and walked away. He was going to Konoha but first he had to do some research. He had promised his publisher that he would be giving him the next edition of his Make Out Paradise books. How strong do you think Naruto is if he was training as hard as we were? Sasuke asked truly curious. He had trained hard enough to think that he could take on anyone. However, he was curious as to how strong Naruto might have become, given how strong he was more than two years ago. I don't know Sasuke. We will just have to wait and see when he does appear. Kakashi replied not trying to give Sasuke an honest answer. If he said strong, it would only serve to upset the Uchiha. Kakashi had thought that one of the reasons that Sasuke trained so hard was that he could surpass Naruto. A week later. Naruto stood at the entrance of Orochimaru's hideout. The base was well hidden, had it not been for Zetsu's unique ability, he would have never found it on his own. Orochimaru was good at hiding things. Not he who knew most things in the elemental nations knew all of Orochimaru's bases and hideouts. The snake Sanin was dangerous when it came to gathering intel. Orochimaru loved to experiment, that was why he was obsessed in knowing all the words knowledge and secrets. However some secrets were not meant for him to know. Looking at entrance one could not really tell if it was an entrance or not. Nevertheless, Naruto knew better. He did not need to sneak inside the base. Given that it was secret hideout, it probably had no guards. Naruto looked at the stone that was in front of him. It was the entrance to the base but he had no idea of how to open the secret door. To anybody it was just a normal rock, the rock was natural so there was no reason to suspect being a secret doorway. Fire release, great fireball. Naruto expelled a large fireball that hit the rock and blew it up creating a path for him to enter. 
even if his way for entering might alarm the base's occupants Naruto had no worries, he could handle whatever challenge he met. He was that confident of his own abilities. Naruto saw three dark passageways upon entering the hideout through the path he created. The darkness within the hideout reminded Naruto of his own hideout, which lacked light. It was so much like Orochimaru to make a hideout like this. Snakes never did like doing things in the light, they prefer to do things in the shadows. The place was carved off the rock it was located at. The rocks were just caved into a passageway, nothing more was made or added in the walls of the hideout. According to the information Zetsu had given him the middle passage led to Orochimaru's throne room. Zetsu had only gone only that far. It meant that taking the middle passage he was likely to arrive at Orochimaru's throne room without encountering traps. It amused Naruto how Orochimaru had thrones in every hideout that Zetsu had been able to find. The man saw himself as king and prided himself in his abilities. He was the king of his own village and his shinobi worshipped him. That was enough to up his ego to extraordinary levels. Naruto walked through the passage calmly his armor making an echoing noise that echoed throughout the passage as he walked deep inside the hideout. Naruto walked for minutes before finally arriving at what seemed to be a hall. In the middle was Orochimaru's throne. Behind the chair was a statue of a large snake that glared its eyes at Naruto. Orochimaru was sitting comfortable on his throne with a wide dark grin spreading across his face. Yakashi Kabuto Orochimaru's right man man was standing at his master's right hand. It appeared that they had been waiting for Naruto to appear. Well, it seems you have been waiting for me, Orochimaru. Naruto stated with an unreadable expression on his face while crossing his hands on chest. Yes, I have, Orochimaru with a rough voice, you have grown quite nicely over the past years. If it were not for your hair, I would have mistaken you for someone else given your appearance. Orochimaru commented with a chuckle. Kabuto just watched on with a small smile gracing his features. Mistaken me for someone? Yes, I'm sure you are quite familiar with him given that you dress like him. Orochimaru said his grin never faltering. Well that is true, I do dress like him, Naruto said. Anyone who knew Madara, or studied the man's history would be able to tell that Naruto dressed like him and he could be mistaken for the dead Uchiha legend if it was not for his blonde hair. You have something and someone I want. Naruto said getting down to business. I did some digging on you and studied your blood. I found some interesting things. Orochimaru said ignoring Naruto's words. He wanted to speak about his own subject other than Naruto's own agenda. Naruto raised an eyebrow. He was not even panicking that Orochimaru had found out the secrets of his body. His features calm, Ho, oh, what did you find? Naruto asked sounding amused. Orochimaru's grin widened, just a few interesting things, Orochimaru said, you have both Uchiha and Senju DNA. I am guessing that you were able to use wood release, though thus far you have yet to show it. For someone not a Senju to posses the Senju DNA only means that you implanted Hashirama's DNA. Naruto never lost his calm despite Orochimaru knowing some of the things about him, you have found quite a lot. Well I guess I had to expect it from a snake that seeks to attain all of the knowledge of the world. Naruto said. I find it curious though. How you were able to get Hashirama's DNA. Orochimaru paused for a moment, I find it hard to believe that you, Naruto-kun was able to implant Hashirama's cell which leads me to conclude that someone who is knowledgeable about Hashirama's cells did it to you and for you. The question though, is who? Naruto's features took a bit more of an amused expression, I see that the Sandaime was not mistaken in naming you a once-in-a-generation genius, Naruto commented, I would kill you now for knowing that information. However, if I do that I can't get something from you if you are dead, Naruto said simply, well, I will just kill you after I get what I want. Naruto said as if killing Orochimaru was the easiest thing to do. Orochimaru let loose of a sick and dark chuckle at Naruto's words, do you actually think you can kill me Naruto-kun? Think? I know I can kill you. Naruto replied. He had no doubts that he could kill Orochimaru. It might prove to be a troublesome task given Orochimaru's abilities. Nevertheless, nothing was impossible for him to achieve. Now, now before anything happens. I would like to propose a deal with you, Orochimaru said his voice and eyes calculating ways to convince Naruto to join him. I know that you ran away from Konoha and Jiraiya is searching for you. Given how Konoha treated you as a child I'm sure you would like to get even with it. Join me and we can make Konoha fall on its knees. Orochimaru said, and you would prove to be an interesting experiment object for me Orochimaru finished with a thought. Orochimaru's words amused Naruto. Orochimaru, a pitiful snake was trying to get him to join him. 
Orochimaru was beneath him, how could he, Uzumaki Naruto, Uchiha Naruto be recruited by someone beneath him? Orochimaru should be the one begging to join his cause. Orochimaru did not understand that he was superior to him. Naruto held a tiger seal gathering chakra inside his body and turning it to fire. In an instant, he released a large fireball. Fire release, great fireball. The fireball sped towards both Kabuto and Orochimaru. The two avoided the jutsu. The fireball hit the throne destroying it. The jutsu was not meant to hit or injure them, it was used to make it clear that he did not come to join Orochimaru but rather to get what he wants. Kabuto, I will fight him. I want to see how strong he has become by testing him myself. Orochimaru said with a smirk. Hi, Orochimaru-sama Kabuto replied. Orochimaru looked at Naruto with his smirk firmly in place. It should prove quite interesting when he sees how strong Naruto has become. From what he has heard from Kabuto, Naruto left Konoha for training. Just by looking at him, he could see that the blonde was strong. How strong? Orochimaru wanted to see. Orochimaru judged at Naruto. Naruto stood in the same position, his Sharingan eyes watched Orochimaru come at him, predicting what he would do. Orochimaru appeared on Naruto's right side, his foot raised. He attempted to kick Naruto at his shoulder. Naruto raised his right hand to block the kick as he was able to see through it with his Sharingan. Orochimaru retrieved his leg and swung his right leg. Naruto swung his left foot intercepting Orochimaru's kick. Both legs contacted and the force and power behind the attempted kicks created a small shockwave. Orochimaru jumped back before attempting to punch Naruto in the face. Naruto leaned back to avoid the punch. He attempted to kick Orochimaru on his gut. Orochimaru disappeared from view and appeared behind Naruto. He brought his right leg attempting to kick Naruto with a powerful kick. In a swift movement, Naruto spun around and blocked the kick. The force behind the kick pushed him a foot back. You are taking this a little serious. Naruto commented seeing how Orochimaru was coming at him. To be able to test your strength I must take this a little serious as you say. Orochimaru said with a smirk. Naruto spoke no further, he rushed at Orochimaru and threw a right hook, which Orochimaru dodged. Naruto attempted punch Orochimaru with his left hand. Orochimaru intercepted the punch with a punch of his own. The two fists met and engaged in a battle of dominance as they tried to overpower each other. Naruto brought forth his free hand and tried to hit Orochimaru on his face. However, the snake Sanin blocked the attempt with a punch. Orochimaru jumped back creating a distance between him and Naruto. Both opponents charged at one another and met in between. Their hands were locked together, as they tried to overcome each other. Orochimaru felt that Naruto was getting the better of him and pushed back with more effort to overpower Naruto. In a battle of pure physical strength, not everyone could win against Naruto. He had trained his body to be physically fit and strong ever since he was still little. For someone like Orochimaru who preferred to be slippery like all snakes was no match for Naruto. Naruto pushed back the snake Sanin with a lot of power nearly forcing Orochimaru to his knees. Kabuto watched his master test Naruto. With how things were going so far, he could tell that Naruto had an advantage when it came to physical strength. Orochimaru seeing that Naruto was overwhelming him brought out his right leg and kicked Naruto on his left side with a power kick. The kick sent Naruto flying but he quickly recovered before he hit the walls of the throne room. I believe you have tested me enough Orochimaru. Naruto said and disappeared in a blur. He appeared behind Orochimaru and swung right foot trying to kick Orochimaru. The kick landed on Orochimaru, but the Orochimaru Naruto hit crumbled into dust. Naruto looked from behind him. Orochimaru was attacking him from behind. Orochimaru raised his right hand, his left supporting it. Many hidden snakes. Orochimaru said as multiple snakes sprout out from his shirt sleeve. In a swift and fast movement, Naruto took out his sword from his sash. He cut every snake within a second and put his sword back to its sash surprising Orochimaru with his skills with a sword. You are very good with taijutsu and you handle a sword well, Orochimaru commented with a smirk, I wonder though, you have yet to use your Mangekyu Sharingan and that war fan strapped on your back. My Mangekyu Sharingan? Naruto said not expecting Orochimaru to answer him. Orochimaru if you don't take this serious you will die very soon, which would be disappointing, Naruto stated calmly, come at me with all you have and don't worry about looking into my eyes I won't use Genjutsu on you. Naruto said. You are rather sure that you can kill me Naruto-kun. You seem to be forgetting that I am the strongest of the Sanins. 
Orochimaru said confidently. Orochimaru blurred out of sight to prove his point. Within seconds of going out of Naruto's sight, Naruto was sent flying away by a powerful kick from Orochimaru to his chest. Naruto was slightly surprised that Orochimaru could move that fast. Nevertheless, he never showed any surprise on his expressionless face. Orochimaru appeared above Naruto and pummeled him to the ground. Naruto flew down like a bullet and crashed to the ground creating a large crater. Orochimaru smirked it went through hand seals. Earth release, mud dragon, he yelled whilst still in flight. The mud dragon roared its way towards Naruto who was still lying down. Naruto moved quickly and got away from the path of the mud dragon. As soon as he landed a few feet away, Orochimaru appeared behind him and spun around attempting to kick him from behind. Naruto spun around and blocked the kick with both his hands. The force behind the kick pushed Naruto back a few feet back. Orochimaru landed a few feet away from Naruto with a sickening grin. He had proved his point. You might just come close to killing me if I do get careless, that is unlikely though, Naruto stated as he recovered from Orochimaru's assault. Shall we continue with this dance? Naruto blurred out of sight and appeared in front of Orochimaru. The snake Sanin's eyes widened at how fast Naruto closed the distance between them. Naruto punched Orochimaru with a powerful punch to the gut. Orochimaru groaned in pain and clutched his stomach for a second. Naruto spun around his right leg swinging along with his movements. He landed a powerful kick to the snake Sanin's neck. The kick sent Orochimaru crashing towards the walls of the room. Orochimaru hit the wall and broke through it as a testament to the power behind Naruto's kick. Orochimaru's crash created a small amount of debris at the other side of the throne room. This is what I meant when I said you will die soon. Naruto stated simply looking past through where Orochimaru had crashed. He was continuing where he had left off after Orochimaru had began to attack him. Orochimaru had proved his point he had proved his. Orochimaru walked out of the debris back to the throne room looking unhurt by Naruto's assault, something like that cannot kill me Naruto-kun. Orochimaru spoke with a smirk. That was not meant to kill you. I just wanted to show you that I could hit you anytime I want. Naruto said. He just wanted to show Orochimaru that he would be killed easily if he did not take this seriously. Orochimaru went through hand seals and then slammed his hands on the ground. Multiple snakes appeared in a puff of smoke. The snakes rushed at Naruto while Orochimaru just watched his snakes run towards their prey. Naruto did a few hand seals preparing for a jutsu. Fire release, fire breath. Naruto expelled a powerful stream of fire from his mouth. The fire traveled towards the rushing snakes, burning them. The fire continued to speed towards Orochimaru who used Shunshine to avoid taking a hit from the flames. The jutsu was easily be ranked snakes stood no chance of survival against the jutsu. Orochimaru lunged at Naruto. He swung his hand to punch Naruto on the face. Naruto blocked the attempted and followed with an attempt of his own which was blocked. Orochimaru's arm lengthened in no way possible for a human's arm, it was inhuman. The arm wrapped itself around Naruto. Naruto brought out his right hand, which was free and drew out his sword. He cut off Orochimaru's arm. Orochimaru hissed when the sword cut through his hand. He leapt back creating some breathing space between him and Naruto. Few seconds later, his arm regenerated from a number of snakes that transformed into his hand. You really have turned yourself into a snake, Orochimaru. Naruto commented seeing how snake-like Orochimaru had become, literally. The only response he got was a chuckle from the snake Sanin. Naruto ran towards Orochimaru with his sword at hand. He attempted a swift cut across Orochimaru's chest but the snake Sanin leapt back, dodging Naruto's attempt to cut him. Naruto ran towards Orochimaru again, swinging his sword vertically. Orochimaru again dodged but the blade of the sword cut a bit of his hair. Orochimaru had very good reflexes. It was what one should expect from a Sanin. Orochimaru's heavy style of fighting made him a rather difficult opponent to fight in a taijutsu fight in Kenjutsu. Orochimaru opened his mouth and a snake carrying a sword came out of it. It was the sword of Kusanagi, the sword said to be able to cut almost through anything. It was Orochimaru's most prized weapon, which was why he kept it hidden within his stomach in a snake. Orochimaru took the sword with his hand and charged at Naruto. He quickly tried to cut off Naruto's head with a swift swing of his sword. Naruto parried the attempt with his own blade enhanced with wind chakra so that it did not shatter into pieces. His own blade was made from a strong material, adding wind chakra only made sure it survived. The Kusanagi would shatter his sword without the added protection from wind chakra. 
Orochimaru attacked Naruto with his sword. He kept swinging it again and, again but Naruto parried or dodged each time. Orochimaru's attacks were rather barbaric and straightforward. Naruto guessed that it was because Orochimaru believed that because his sword could cut through anything most opponents would be afraid to fight him in a sword fight knowing about his sword. Even if they tried to fight, the sword of Kusanagi would break any sword. It gave him an advantage. With Naruto, he did not have that advantage, as Naruto was not reluctant to engage the Sanin in a sword fight. Naruto jumped away from Orochimaru creating a space between the two, how barbaric, Naruto commented on Orochimaru's kenjutsu, your attacks leave you wide open, vulnerable to being attacked. Orochimaru grinned he did not believe what Naruto said to be true, why don't you show that to me, Naruto-kun. Orochimaru had been fighting for many years and none of his opponents has ever said that his kenjutsu was barbaric. In fact, many have commended him for his kenjutsu. Naruto rushed at Orochimaru swing his sword. Orochimaru parried the attack. Naruto using his superior speed grabbed Orochimaru's hand, which held his sword with his free hand. He gripped it tightly making sure that Orochimaru did not go away. Naruto kneed the snake with a powerful right knee that made the snake Sanin wince. Naruto still held Orochimaru's hand. He swung his sword cutting off Orochimaru's hand off its shoulder. He threw the hand way with along with the sword of Kusanagi. Orochimaru hissed in pain as he jumped away from Naruto. He reformed his arm for the second time. Naruto went through hand seals while Orochimaru was busy reforming his hand. Fire release, blazing inferno. Swirling extreme flames appeared in front of Naruto. They swirled their way towards Orochimaru and consumed him. There was no scream of pain from Orochimaru. Naruto had been expecting to hear such. If one was caught within his jutsu they would have their skin melted off their bodies and are cooked within the swirling flames. It would have certainly looked good if he had been hit by the jutsu Naruto thought to himself, I will just be quick next time. Naruto looked from behind as he sensed something. Wind release, great wind breakthrough. Orochimaru yelled a power wind gust rushed at Naruto. The wind hit Naruto and sent crashing towards the wall of the throne room. Like Orochimaru before, he broke through the wall. Orochimaru was very adept to wind jutsus, which made his wind jutsus a lot more powerful than they normally would. Unlike Naruto who gave him a chance to recover, Orochimaru dashed towards Naruto. He appeared in front of the blonde and punched him on the face followed by a swift kick on the blonde's chin. The kick sent Naruto in the air. He hit the ceiling of the hideout before falling down. Naruto got up and dusted himself up. Come on Naruto-kun show me what you can do. Don't tell me you plan to kill me with that strength you are showing me now. Orochimaru gloated with a smirk, his hands folded on his chest. Naruto did hand seals, fire release, majestic flame destroyer. Naruto expelled a wave of intense flames that spread out wide. The flames rushed at Orochimaru covering all hiding areas. The flames burned everything they touched as they traveled. They reached at Orochimaru's position and passed through. They hit a wall of the base that had been standing and melted it. The jutsu created destruction that left the area it touched in need of reconstruction. A part of the hideout began to collapse as Naruto's jutsu had melted the pillars that separated the ground from the ceiling. Without the pillars, supporting the above the hideout began collapsed as the hideout was built underground. Orochimaru used his unique escape jutsu to avoid the flames. He had seen how dangerous the jutsu was. He would have been a fool to allow himself get hit by the jutsu knowing how dangerous it was. I think I used too much chakra. Naruto muttered to himself. He did not use the jutsu's full power given that they were in a closed area. Had he used the jutsu at its power it would have destroyed the whole hideout. Still, the level of destruction the jutsu caused was not expected given the jutsu was not at its full potential. Earth release, mud dragon. Orochimaru yelled from behind Naruto who seemed to be still admiring the destruction of his jutsu. The mud dragon sped at Naruto. Naruto activated his eternal Mangekyu Sharingan. He summoned his Susano, which manifested in the form of a rib cage. The rib cage surrounded Naruto, shielding him from Orochimaru's jutsu. Naruto stood his ground as Orochimaru's jutsu hit his defense. The offensive jutsu did not prevail against the Susano. Naruto allowed his Susano to disperse. It was certainly interesting for Kabuto to watch the fight between his master and Naruto. Naruto was showing to be able to hold his own against his master. Naruto had improved in a way he never expected. If Naruto continued to grow strong in the way he was now, he would surely be a force to be reckoned with, well that was if he survived his encounter with Orochimaru. 
Naruto charged at Orochimaru and Orochimaru followed Naruto's example. The two lunged at each other, meeting in between and began a fiery taijutsu battle that created shockwaves all over the partly destroyed hideout. The shockwaves destroyed whatever was near them when they were set off. The two continued to trade blows until Orochimaru landed a hit on Naruto's face pushing the blonde back. Orochimaru charged at Naruto. Naruto watched the snake Sanin with his EMS. Once seeing what the snake was going to go. Naruto sidestepped Orochimaru and turned around with a powerful kick to the snake Sanin's back. Naruto closed his right eye that was hidden by his hair. His left eye focused on Orochimaru, Amaterasu. The black flames of Amaterasu ignited around Orochimaru setting him ablaze. Naruto's left eye began to bleed slightly due to the strain the black flames caused on his eyes. Orochimaru felt that the black flames were consuming his body. It was the most intense heat he had ever felt before. He was hit by the flames before by Naruto but last time they did not burn as much as they did now. Orochimaru felt that if he did not do something the flames would turn him to ash. There was nothing in the world that could extinguish the flames except by sealing them or the caster of the flames extinguish the flames with his Mangekyu. Not everyone could do that, not even Naruto. Orochimaru's mouth opened up wide. A pair of pale hands forced the mouth to open up wider as another Orochimaru stepped out of the mouth his breathing slightly labored. Naruto appeared in front of the snake Sanin just as he shed his skin. He grabbed Orochimaru's arm and kicked him on the chest whilst holding him. He kicked the snake Sanin again, this time on his gut never letting go of his arm. Naruto let go of Orochimaru's arm. He delivered a swift kick to Orochimaru's face sending the Sanin away. Naruto gave the Sanin no time to recover. He turned chakra inside his body into fire. Fire release, majestic fire destruction. Naruto expelled a stream of intense flames. The stream went towards Orochimaru who had no time to avoid the flames. The flames hit him and ignited spreading wide around him. Orochimaru bathed in the middle of a sea of intense flames. The flames destroyed another large portion of the hideout making the throne room unstable. Another powerful jutsu and it was going to collapse. It certainly does look good when it burns someone, Naruto said to himself with a small smile. Kabuto was starting to get worried about his master now. Even his master despite how powerful he was, had limits. He could not keep on taking on such high level of jutsus continuously. The fire died down and revealed a fourth degree burned Orochimaru lying on the ground. He looked half dead and not a part of his body was moving. The only noticeable thing was his wide eyes that seemed to be frozen in time. It was what happened when you were hit by an S-rank jutsu. Naruto rushed at Orochimaru. He was going to punish Orochimaru, allowing him time to rest was not something he deserved. Kabuto intercepted Naruto with a kick, which Naruto blocked by bringing both his hands. Naruto looked past Kabuto. Orochimaru had shed his skin his body looked like it had not been burned by intense flames. However, his chakra reserves were dropping. He was on one knee breathing rather heavily. Orochimaru, did you take the Sinigami mask from the Uzumaki clan mask storage temple? Naruto asked calmly. Orochimaru stopped recovering, his breathing became calm and grinned at Naruto, what do you want to do with such a valuable mask, Naruto-kun? Orochimaru asked with a gleeful grin trying to hide that now he was a bit concerned at the strength Naruto was showing. Do you have it? I might have it. Orochimaru responded trying to buy some time to think of a battle plan. He had underestimated Naruto and could not keep shedding his skin. His chakra would surely run out if he kept shedding his skin. So you have it, Naruto said knowing that Orochimaru was trying to buy time, where is it? It does not belong to you. And it belongs to you? Orochimaru asked. He knew that Naruto would say it belonged to him given that the masks belonged to the Uzumaki clan, a clan that Naruto belonged. Naruto narrowed his eyes at Orochimaru. His face took a different expression from his usual impassive. His face had annoyed written all over it. Naruto released large amounts of dense chakra with traces of malice in it. The chakra Naruto released was enough to blow up the unstable part of the hideout. The hideout crumbled down allowing light from the clear skies to enter. I grow tired of this. Naruto said. He was annoyed by the fact that Orochimaru was stalling him. Orochimaru and Kabuto were still shocked the level of chakra Naruto released like it was nothing. The dense chakra made Naruto dangerous. They did not think that would be to release that much chakra. The malice in the chakra released reminded Orochimaru of something but he could not place a finger on it. Naruto charged at Kabuto. 
he attempted to punch Kabuto on his face. Kabuto leaned back avoiding the punch and attempted to kick Naruto. Naruto caught his leg and held it tightly. Naruto raised his right hand, wind blade. Invincible wind blades formed on Naruto's fingers and began to spin around furiously. Naruto hit Kabuto with two of the blades launching the right-hand man into the fallen chunks of earth. Kabuto received multiple cuts on his body that were enough to make him bleed. Naruto expelled the remaining blades. Kabuto recovered God and walked for a moment calmly as if nothing had happened. Drawing chakra from his body, he activated his unique ability to regenerate damaged muscles. The ability would heal him of any wound he suffered at the cost of his own chakra. Naruto found himself fascinated by Kabuto's ability. It seems you admire my ability, Kabuto commented seeing Naruto look at him with interest, my knowledge in medical ninjutsu is the reason I am Orochimaru-sama's right-hand man. My unique ability allows me to reactivate dead cells and grow new ones. Kabuto said pushing his glasses. Interesting Naruto muttered before he was forced to leap to his left side to avoid a punch from Orochimaru. As Naruto landed down the ground, Kabuto was already at his side with his hands glowing chakra. It was Kabuto's ability called Chakra Scalpel. The chakra formed around his hands was like a blade capable of cutting through almost anything. Kabuto used this ability to damage his opponent's muscles and damage chakra pathways. Naruto drew his sword preparing to battle Kabuto. Kabuto lunged at Naruto in his unique way, which would confuse other people. Naruto raised his sword on his front and parried Kabuto's attack. He brought back his sword and attempted to kick Kabuto. Kabuto saw the kick coming and dodged it by jumping back. Naruto jumped in front of Kabuto attempting to kick Snake's right-hand man. Kabuto blocked Naruto's kick. Naruto brought out his other leg trying to kick Kabuto. The same process repeated as Kabuto Naruto's kick with his hand. Naruto placed his sword back to its sash. Naruto crouched down placing both his hands on the ground for support he attempted a leg sweep which Kabuto avoided by jumping up. While Naruto was still in a crouched position, Kabuto landed a powerful two-foot kick on Naruto's chest sending the blonde flying away. Naruto recovered quickly by flipping in mid-air and landed gracefully on the ground. You hit me. Naruto stated. Kabuto smirked, I was observing while you were fighting with Orochimaru-sama. I know how you fight which makes it easy for me to avoid your attacks and counterattack. Kabuto said confidently. Naruto said nothing, he ran towards Kabuto. Appearing in front of Kabuto, he spun around and tried to land a powerful kick on Kabuto's waist. Kabuto brought out his knee to block the attack. Naruto disappeared from Kabuto's front and appeared behind him. He had moved fast not giving Kabuto enough time to defend himself. He kicked Kabuto on his back sending him crashing towards the chunks of earth that were lying on the ground. Before Naruto could do anything else, Orochimaru lunged at him and opened his mouth. Many snakes came out of his mouth with replicas of the sword of Kusanagi in their mouths. The snakes extended towards Naruto. Orochimaru had picked up his sword after Naruto had thrown it away. Naruto placed his hand on his gun by before deciding against using it. If he burned the snakes, the attack would stop coming at him. He held a single tiger seal and gathered chakra, fire release, great fireball. Naruto expelled a large fireball from his mouth. The fireball sped towards the snakes, incarnating them. Orochimaru stopped his jutsu seeing the fireball come towards him. He jumped a distance away to avoid the jutsu. Orochimaru held his right hand and transformed it into large snakes that rushed at Naruto. Naruto jumped out of the hideout using the space where the hideout had collapsed to avoid the snakes. The snakes followed him out of the hideout. Naruto tried dodging the snakes for a few moments before finally he went through a set of hand seals, fire release, fire breath. Naruto breathed out a stream of intense flames that rushed at the snakes. The intense flames hit the snakes burning them. Snakes would always be weak against flames. Kabuto and Orochimaru followed Naruto outside the hideout. The outside created a more breathing space and a good space to use jutsus at their fullest abilities. Have you noticed it, Orochimaru-sama? Kabuto asked as he adjusted his round glasses. Orochimaru nodded, it doesn't matter though, Orochimaru said, with me and you attacking him at the same time we will take him out. Kabuto nodded. Both master and servant charged at Naruto flanking both his sides. Orochimaru went at Naruto left side while Kabuto went at his right. Naruto stood still his eyes calculating their movements. Orochimaru swung his right hand trying to punch Naruto. Naruto brought out his hand to block Orochimaru's attack. Kabuto attempted a high roundhouse kick. 
Naruto intercepted Kabuto's kick by moving his leg swiftly to block the kick. Orochimaru crouched down and tried grabbing Naruto by his leg. Naruto jumped up to avoid Orochimaru. Kabuto appeared in front of Naruto with his chakra scalpels at hand. He slashed his scalpels at Naruto but only managed to hit Naruto at the metal chest plate of his amour. The attack was unable to break through the metal armor. Naruto jumped back to create a breathing space between him and the two. Kabuto attacked him from the front. Kabuto attempted to cut Naruto at his head seeing that his chakra scalpels could not break through the other vital parts that were protected by the Amur Naruto war. Naruto leaned back avoiding the blow. Kabuto spun around attempting a kick at Naruto's chest. Naruto also spun around intercepting Kabuto with his own kick. Naruto's kick had more power than Kabuto's, thus he was able to overpower Kabuto. Kabuto was pushed back by Naruto's kick. Naruto moved closer to Kabuto and kicked the spy on his chest sending him flying. Naruto appeared behind Kabuto while he was still on flight. Naruto delivered a hard kick at Kabuto's back sending him crashing towards the ground. Before Naruto do to anything, wind style, great wind breakthrough. A powerful wave of wind rushed at Naruto hitting him dead on. The jutsu hit him and sent him flying away. The jutsu was so powerful that even Naruto was unable to recover immediately after the jutsu had hit him. Wind style, wind dragon. Orochimaru added another jutsu on his assault. The wind dragon rushed at Naruto at a rather fast speed. Naruto could not dodge the attack thus he summoned a Susanoo to shield him. The wind dragon hit his Susanoo but did nothing to break through the defense. Had Naruto not activated his Susanoo he would have surely received multiple cuts where his Amur did not protect him. Naruto landed gracefully on the ground and deactivated his Susanoo. He ran towards Orochimaru but Kabuto intercepted him before he could reach the snake Sanin. Kabuto came at Naruto with his chakra scalpels. He began his assault on Naruto. However, Naruto dodged all of Kabuto's attack before attacking Kabuto when given an opening. Kabuto had his right hand stretched out at Naruto. Naruto caught the hand, before catching another of Kabuto's arm. His hold on Kabuto's hands was tight and restricted Kabuto from moving freely. Naruto threw Kabuto's hand sideways making him lose balance. He jumped up and landed a powerful double foot kick on Kabuto's chest. Kabuto grimaced, as felt that a rib had broken because of the powerful kick. Naruto spun around in air and landed another powerful kick at Kabuto's temple sending him flying away. Before Naruto could land on the ground after kicking Kabuto, Orochimaru appeared above Naruto and smashed the blonde with both his hands to the ground. Naruto's impact with the ground created a crater. Orochimaru jumped at Naruto attempting to kick Naruto at the back of his leg. Naruto brought out both his hands while still lying down. He blocked the kick, however, the force of the kick compelled him a bit down than he already was. Orochimaru jumped back to catch a breather. Kabuto stood beside his master, clothes tattered and blood stains on his clothes, but otherwise no wounds on him. He was just running low on chakra, which was a big factor since he could not fight without chakra. It was not every day that he had to face such a tough opponent. His body was also getting tired, he could not fight for too long. Naruto got up and closed his right eye, Amaterasu. Black flames ignited on Orochimaru's right hand. He had seen the attack once, thus he had tried to change his position upon seeing that Naruto was going to use the jutsu. Naruto could not hit a moving target. Orochimaru cut of his right hand and grew another one. Naruto felt that using so many high-ranked jutsus was taking a lot from him. Nevertheless, he did hand seals and then held his hands together, would release, deep forest emergence. Naruto said the ground began to shake. A huge forest made of what seemed to tree branches began to erupt from the ground. The forest headed towards both Orochimaru and Kabuto. If Orochimaru and Kabuto did not move, the forest would crush them. With Orochimaru's abilities, he would survive. However, Kabuto could not survive. Orochimaru took hold of Kabuto and used his signature escape jutsu to sink into the ground. He appeared behind Naruto with Kabuto. It's perfect, still would have looked a lot better if it had crushed them, Naruto said to himself. Naruto looked behind where he had sensed Orochimaru and Kabuto. He rushed at the two. Orochimaru seeing Naruto come at him did hand seals, water release, water bullet. A water bullet came out of his mouth and rushed at Naruto. Naruto blurred out of the jutsu's path to avoid being hit by the water bullets. He continued to charge at Orochimaru. Orochimaru sprout out several more water bullets at Naruto as tried to halt the blonde from reaching him and Kabuto. 
Naruto dodged each of the water bullets skillfully. Naruto was able to reach Orochimaru. Before he could do anything, Orochimaru's mouth opened up wide and a snake came out from his mouth with the sword of Kusanagi in its mouth. The sword extended catching Naruto off guard as he had been running at great speed. The blade extended to great lengths piercing Naruto at his right shoulder. The sword had broken Naruto's metal plate of his shoulder to do so. The blade pierced Naruto on his shoulder but before it could wound him gravely, Naruto blurred away from its path. Naruto touched his shoulder. The gash the blade had created began to drip blood, my blood, Naruto said to himself, I was careless. Orochimaru grinned, the sword of Kusanagi is not just capable of cutting through anything but it can also inject poison to whoever it cuts, Orochimaru said, it's a very deadly poison. Only Kabuto and I are immune to the poison. The poison was not an issue for Naruto. He could handle it. His body was resilient to poison. His body had many secrets one of the secrets was not make him immune to poison. It would be damning to his pride should he be defeated because of a simple poison. Orochimaru was not the build his body to become immune to poison. Naruto charged at Orochimaru and Kabuto, again. Orochimaru moved to intercept him. Orochimaru attempted to punch Naruto only for Naruto to disappear. What? Orochimaru thought. Amaterasu. Naruto said as black flame ignited on Orochimaru. Orochimaru let out a pain scream as the jet black flames began to consume him. No matter how many times Naruto sees Orochimaru screaming in pain, he would never tire of it. Naruto wiped off the blood that dripped from his eye due to the strain caused by Amaterasu. He looked at Kabuto before blurring out of sight. He appeared in front of Kabuto and attempted to gut him. Kabuto jumped back to avoid being hit. Naruto appeared in front of him and the same process occurred again. Naruto appeared behind Kabuto and tapped his shoulder, you are moving slower. This means that you are low on chakra and are getting tired. Naruto stated as he gripped Kabuto's shoulder and forced him to face his direction. Kabuto stared at Naruto's cold eye for a moment. Naruto kneed Kabuto and delivered a punch to Kabuto's chest. He then gutted Kabuto causing him to hiss in pain as he coughed blood while he clutched his stomach. Naruto gripped Kabuto by his neck, tell me about that unique ability of yours. Naruto demanded. Kabuto refused to speak forcing Naruto to let him go and spin around before kicking him with a power kick to his chest. Naruto narrowed his eye from behind as he felt Orochimaru's chakra flare up. Kushios no Jutsu. Orochimaru yelled as he called forth his summon. A gigantic snake appeared in a puff of smoke. Orochimaru was now standing on top of its head, Orochimaru why have you called me? The snake summon hissed out. I need your help. Orochimaru replied immediately while standing on top of his summon's head. I will need 100 sacrifices for this, you stole owe me 50 sacrifices from the last time you summoned me. I will add another 50 for not paying up. Adding that you now owe me 200 sacrifices. The snake summon, Manda the snake summon boss hissed. Orochimaru frowned but nonetheless agreed, you will get your sacrifices, Manda as long as you deal with him. Orochimaru said pointing at Naruto. Manda looked at Naruto, an Uchiha. He hissed. Yes, he is proving to be quite troublesome. Manda said nothing. He sped his way towards Naruto looking at him with eyes of a predator. Naruto saw the snake coming and did hand seals, would release, hote technique. The ground began to shake as gigantic hands erupted from the ground. The gigantic hands tried to catch Manda. However, the snake was too slippery for them and evaded each attempt to catch it. Naruto sighed and cancelled his jutsu. Trying to catch a snake was a rather foolish idea. Manda came charging at Naruto with its fangs glaring at Naruto. Its raised head charged at Naruto as it tried to devour him. Naruto jumped away to avoid being food for the snake. Manda continued rushing at Naruto trying to devour him. Naruto dodged every attempt until, Manda moved faster than he had been. Naruto is unable to dodge the attack, he unstrapped his gun by and positioned it in front of him creating a shield. Manda's head hit the gun by but did not break it. Naruto tried to hold his own against the snake. However, even for him it was impossible. Naruto was sent flying away with his gun by. Naruto quickly recovered and flipped in mid-air before landing on the ground gracefully. Manda charged at Naruto and surrounded him. Naruto summoned his orange Susano. The Susano began to evolve into a more of a giant humanoid discarding its skeletal appearance. The Susano had two horns pointing front on its head. The horns were sticking out of the hood the Susano wore. 
On both its shoulders and hands, it had guards that resembled metal plates. Swords flared up to life on both its hands. The Susano fused both swords. Manda created some distance between him and Naruto, Orochimaru, what is this? A Susano, one of the Mangeku Sharingan's abilities, Orochimaru replied. He noted that it was a bit different from the Chunin exams. He was still wondering Naruto was still standing after he had injected poison on the blonde. He sighed remembering that Naruto was a Jinchuriki. That alone made things different. Orochimaru narrowed his eyes to where Kabuto was recovering. He was glad that his number two was alive and recovering well. Naruto Susano swung its blade releasing a wave of orange chakra that took the form of a blade. The attack traveled towards Manda. Manda moved quickly to avoid taking a hit from the attack. The attack peeled off chunks of earth it had hit. Manda was glad that the attack did not hit him or it would have been nasty. The Susano swung its blade releasing another attack, which Manda dodged swiftly. Manda charged at Naruto only succeeding in being stopped by the Susano. The Susano raised its blade high and brought it down trying to cut Manda in half but the snake snaked his way out of it. Naruto Susano dispersed and Naruto fell on his knees, breathing rather heavily. That only happened for a moment as Naruto got up to and went through hand seals, fire style, majestic fire destruction. Naruto expelled a stream of fire that sped towards Manda. This time the snake was not able to do anything as the fire ignited upon hitting it. Orochimaru jumped away from Manda's head to avoid being burned. The flames spread out wide upon igniting, bathing Manda in a sea of intense flames. Manda hissed in pain before shedding his and escaping the sea of flames. Manda glared at Naruto furiously for making him shed his precious skin. He began to charge at Naruto. Naruto closed his right eye. Amaterasu. Naruto said as black flames ignited on Manda's head making the snake stop charging at Naruto. Naruto did not stop there, Amaterasu. Manda's tail ignited in black flames making the snake shake violently as it tried to shake off the flames. Fighting a colossal summon as Manda was not on his cards that was he decided to end it quickly. Orochimaru, I will not forgive this. Manda yelled as he disappeared back to the summon world. Orochimaru charged at Naruto with his sword appearing from his mouth. Naruto brought out his gun by and blocked the sword from piercing him. Orochimaru retracted his sword. Naruto placed his gun by back to his back. Orochimaru made the mistake of blinking. Naruto went through hand seals gathering the chakra he needed. He converted his chakra into wind chakra, wind release, wind dragon. Naruto muttered as the he released a powerful two-headed wind dragon. When the dragon met its target, it would give the target multiple gashes causing them to bleed heavily. Without fast medical treatment, the target would die because of loss of blood. Nevertheless, despite that power, Naruto was not satisfied. Amaterasu. Jet black flames fused with the wind dragon. It took us some time of practicing for Naruto to get the ratio of fusing the jutsu. If things did not balance and there was too much of Amaterasu, the black flames would consume the wind jutsu. The combined jutsu sped at Orochimaru and hit him. Naruto smiled slightly at the power of his jutsu. If Orochimaru's girly screams were an indicator. He narrowed his eyes behind him to see Kabuto charging at him. Naruto was quick to sidestep Kabuto's attempt to hit with his chakra scalpels. Despite being given time to recover it seemed that Kabuto never did recover. Kabuto's movements were rather sloppy due to his tiredness and loss of chakra. Naruto landed a powerful kick on Kabuto's chest before quickly gripping his arm. Naruto slammed Kabuto to the ground creating small crater due to the impact. He placed his foot on Kabuto's shoulder and his left arm. Naruto snapped Kabuto's arm making Kabuto let loose of a pain scream. It was of no concern to Naruto. He wanted to see if Kabuto would be able to heal himself just as he had been doing. Naruto picked up Kabuto by his neck, tell me what I want to know. Naruto said like a commander. Kabuto struggled to breathe for a moment. Naruto lessened his tight grip on Kabuto's neck. This allowed Kabuto to talk, my unique ability? I cannot tell you that. I would rather die than tell you. Beside even if I were to tell you, you do not have medical ninjutsu knowledge to be able to replicate the technique. Moreover, I doubt you would be able to understand the complexity of the technique. Kabuto said with a smirk. Naruto did not think twice, Sukiyomi. A second later Kabuto dropped down to the ground like a lifeless core. Naruto looked at Orochimaru's direction. The snake was breathing rather heavily as he panted. It was obvious that continuously shedding his skin had taken a toll on his chakra. 
Naruto appeared in front of Orochimaru. He tried kicking him but Orochimaru quickly brought out both his hands to block the attack. Naruto quickly brought out his other foot trying to kick Orochimaru. The snake Sanin jumped back from Naruto. Naruto appeared in front of Orochimaru with his foot staring at Orochimaru's gut. Even Orochimaru had slowed down greatly, which made things easy for Naruto. Naruto kicked Orochimaru on his temple with a high roundhouse kick. He appeared above Orochimaru while the snake Sanin was flying because of the force of Naruto's kick. Naruto kicked Orochimaru down the ground. He landed beside Orochimaru and picked him up before slamming him to the ground again. Naruto slammed his foot on Orochimaru's chest before leaning down facing Orochimaru. Where is it? Naruto demanded. Orochimaru cursed Naruto for putting him in this situation. He opened his mouth wide but before anything could happen, Naruto drew his sword. Naruto cut through Orochimaru's neck, separating his body from his head and placed his sword back to its sash. Snakes came from Orochimaru's head, his neck and brought Orochimaru's head together with his body. After Orochimaru had out himself back together, Naruto slammed his foot on Orochimaru's chest. Tell me. Naruto barked. Orochimaru glared at Naruto. Naruto felt a spike of chakra and jumped away from Orochimaru. Orochimaru turned into a large hideous snake composed of many snakes. I will get you back for this Naruto-kun. Orochimaru yelled before he took off and took Kabuto. Before Naruto could do anything, Orochimaru disappeared from his view and no trace of his chakra was left. Naruto dropped to his knees, took out his gun by, and used it as support. The battle had taken a lot of from him despite not showing it to Orochimaru. It was as if he had even managed to hold himself from sweating from the tiredness he felt. He had also used a lot more chakra than he had thought he would. If the battle had continued, it would have been nasty for him. He had used too much chakra with the jutsus he used. That took longer and a lot from than I had anticipated. Naruto said seemingly to no one between his breaths. Zetsu appeared from the ground, that is because you were not serious. If you had been fighting fully serious, you would have ended the fight sooner. Zetsu did think that Naruto just wanted to frustrate Orochimaru and punish him. It was payback for what Orochimaru had done to Naruto at the Forest of Death. If Naruto wanted to kill Orochimaru he would have done it, that he had no doubt of believing. Naruto stood up his breathing relaxed and looked at Zetsu, his EMS was deactivated, I guess you are right. Regardless he got away. I will kill him next time and I will do it quick. I have seen enough of him, Naruto said, well let's go and get Karen. While you were fighting with Orochimaru I stopped watching and went to look for her seeing that if you had continued fighting within the hideout it would have collapsed. If that had happened while she was inside, she might have been crushed. Zetsu stated. So you did not find her. Naruto concluded. No, it appears that the moment you entered the hideout, Orochimaru had her escape to another hideout close by. Naruto nodded, good let's go and get her, we have to search at the other hideouts within this country auto for the mask. Naruto said placing his gun by back to his back. Otogakur was rocked with the destruction of many hideouts that day. It shocked the villagers as who could do something like it. Orochimaru was not someone one would like to make an enemy. Nobody dared to stand in the way of Naruto while he destroyed several bases. He was searching for the Sinigami mask and Karen. If anyone dared to stand in his way, they would have signed their death warrants. A week later. Tsunade was sitting comfortably in her office. Over the years, things had calmed down giving her less work to do. She liked the less work she had to do, it gave her more time to do other things. Given the free time she trained Sakura alone as she had taken her as her apprentice. She was proud of Sakura's progress, as the girl had become more like her in fighting style and short temper. Aside from dealing with the elders, Tsunade had nothing that could cause her a major headache. However, she knew that in a few months she would have more issues to deal with. Sasuke would be coming back to the village, the villagers would certainly make a lot of noise about it. There would also be marriage proposals that would only give her more paperwork to do. She just hoped that the Uchiha would have changed. If he had changed, he would be a less pain to deal with. There was also Naruto. Even the thought of the name gave her a headache, thus she chose to think too much about the blonde. She would think about it when he comes back, if he does return that is. Right now, she was not sure about anything given that Jiraiya had yet to find him. Jiraiya burst through her window. You damn pervert. How many times have I told you to use the damn door? Tsunade yelled. Tsunade saw a serious look on Jiraiya's face and knew that the pervert had something important to tell her, what is it? 
Tsunade asked adopting a serious look on her face. I was coming back to give you the report of Kakashi's training trip with Sasuke when I got news from my contacts in Odogakur, Jiraiya said, someone destroyed a total of eight hideouts of Orochimaru in a single day. Jiraiya revealed. Tsunade's eyes widened at hearing the news. That person had to be strong to accomplish that feat. So far, no one so far had attempted to attack Orochimaru like that. Not even Jiraiya who knew some of Orochimaru's hideouts had gone to destroy them. Dot and Orochimaru? I do not know so far. His whereabouts are unknown for now. His body was not found in any of the hideouts. Jiraiya replied still keeping his serious expression. Who could have done something like that? Eyewitnesses say that they saw a man, wearing a bright red armor like a samurai over a black suit and a war fan strapped behind his back, Jiraiya said, with that description you could say that Madara had returned from the dead. Jiraiya commented to his own words. Tsunade nodded, as history shows it, Madara appeared like that after defecting from Konoha. Here is the interesting part, Jiraiya spoke again, the person is said to have had long bright blonde hair which covered his right eye and wielded the Sharingan. gun, Tsunade eyes widened, by your reaction you are guessing who it is. Jiraiya said. Naruto Tsunade muttered. If the person was indeed Naruto, then it raised a lot more questions. Why would he attack Orochimaru's hideouts? How strong had he become? Another question was that if he was seen this time, it meant that he was no longer hiding. Jiraiya nodded, it has to be him, Jiraiya said with conviction, I will go to Otogakur and search for clues as to where he might have gone to. Jiraiya said. Tsunade could only nod. Just when she was enjoying her peace, this had to happen. Jiraiya took out a scroll and handed to Tsunade, my report on Kakashi and Sasuke, he said, I would recommend it if you choose to make Kakashi S rank in our books after reading the report. Tsunade looked at Jiraiya questionably. Jiraiya just shrugged having lost his serious expression. I will be going Heim. Jiraiya said and disappeared in a puff of smoke. Tsunade sighed and opened the scroll. Valley of the End. Naruto stood onto of Madara's head at the Valley of the End. The valley was located at the borders of the fire country leading to Odogakur. He had already replaced his damaged his amour and was in a perfect condition. Beside him were Zetsu and Karen, who was shifting nervously. He was not able to find the mask he was looking for. This only meant that he would have to make Orochimaru tell him of its location. Karen was a sensor type, thus she could sense the chakra within a person and get a feel from it. She could tell whether a person was either good or evil by sensing their chakra. The chakra she was sensing from Naruto was off the charts. Not even Orochimaru's large pools could be compared to it. She had fainted the first time she felt it up close. She was trying to get a read from it and the dense chakra overwhelmed her senses knocking her out. Zetsu, lead Karen to the hideout. Naruto ordered. Where are you taking me and what are going to do to me? Karen asked fearfully. Naruto was not generally a good person she could tell by his chakra but there was also light hidden within the dark and dense chakra. Naruto turned around and looked at Karen, I told you, you are a precious Uzumaki. You are valuable to me. Naruto said with a small smile. Karen could feel that he was being honest. Nevertheless, she had questions. Why? Being an Uzumaki was not that of a big deal. Naruto guessed what she was thinking, it appears that you don't know anything about the Uzumaki clan, Naruto said, Zetsu will tell you about it, I will tell you this, my mother was an Uzumaki, Naruto said. You are not a pervert, are you? An amused expression appeared on Naruto's face, not at all, he said. Have no fears, you will not be hurt. You are just going to the hideout and stay there for a while and I will come to fetch you, then take you to Konoha. Naruto said. Karen nodded, she really had no choice in the matter. Despite the fact that he was being honest and had been hostile towards her, she could not just trust him on the whim. Go, Zetsu. Naruto said. Where are you going now? Zetsu asked, Naruto just smiled at him and looked at the heavens. For a second his Sharingan disappeared and was replaced by a normal black eye instead of his deep blue eyes. Zetsu led Karen away from the valley going deep into the forest of the fire country. He did not need Naruto to say anything. He knew where Naruto was going. A week later outside of the wave country. Uzuki Yugao or rather Kataranbu codename was running for her life. Her body was heavily bruised and she had lost a lot of blood. Her body had wounds all over her body, some wounds were deep. She was on an S-ranked mission with her squad. They had been instructed to get rid of a bandit camp inside the wave country, 
the camp was led by a group of a rank missing nins. For such a dangerous mission, elite shinobi had to be enlisted. Her squad did not go near the camp, as before they could reach it the missing nins ambushed them. They had fought bravely against the assault but the 10A rank missing nins overpowered them using their ambush to their advantage. Yu Gao's comrades had her escape so that she could give the report to the Hokage since she was the leader of the squad. Yu Gao had been running for three hours straight, she did not sense anyone pursuing her but she could not stop just because she did not sense anyone pursuing her. Suddenly she came to halt, her body was refusing to walk further, her chakra was leaving her and her vision had become blurred. To sum it up, Yu Gao was worn out and was only able to walk so far by sheer willpower alone. Yu Gao felt that she could not continue anymore. She mistimed her steps as she was hopping on the trees. She began to fall down, helpless without power to save herself. She waited and waited to hit the ground but never did the ground. A realization dawned on her that she was not falling to the ground. Her heart raged in fear thinking that she'd been caught. Her consciousness started to fade away as she looked up. The last thing Yu Gao saw an unclear image of a man with blonde hair. The hair was the only thing her mind held on to for remembrance. Chapter 10, Kiri Adventures Part 1 Often people do say that there is no such thing as coincident. Things concur because it was by fate or because they were meant to be. Such ideals have led people to take paths that prove to be damaging to them, paths that devour them. It amused Naruto, when people spoke of fate and all the other crap. People did not understand that one could manipulate and force things into going the way one wants them to. Without even taking an active role, one could manipulate things effectively so that one could achieve what he desires. People form ideals to set up their principles, a standard of living. But regardless of how masterful and strict the principles are, things can always go astray from the way one wants them to be depending on who is manipulating the events. Fate does not exist, but it is the choices and ideals we take that lead us to a belief of fate amusing that some people blame their faults and miseries on such a belief as fate. If there was such thing as fate, one created his own fate. To think that fate would have something to do with Naruto saving Yugao would be amusing. Naruto believed that there was such thing as coincident. It happened because he was on his way towards the wave country and Yugao was heading back to the fire country. Things like this happen, there was no one manipulating events. It was his choice to move towards the wave that led to the encounter. The choices we make lead us to the path we take. What we come across in the journey that is life is dependent and influenced by our decisions. So, was saving Yu Gao something fated to occur? No. Yu Gao stirred up from inside a small boat that could only carry two passengers and a sailor. The sailor of this boat was a clone Naruto, though. Yu Gao groaned as she raised her head. The pain that had consumed her body had now faded away. Her head hurt though, and her mouth felt dry. She clutched her head shaking it as if there was something on it she wanted to shake away. She looked at her hands and saw that they were bandaged, most of her body was bandaged. As far as she could remember, her body had been covered with wounds and blood. She peeked inside her shirt and saw that she was also bandaged. She did not recognize the shirt she was wearing. That realization dawned on her alarming her. Her heart began to beat a faster rate than normal. Her mind began to compute scenarios she could find herself in. She remembered that she had been running away to save her life after her team had been ambushed. The mission had been one she would never hope to recall. Her comrades had sacrificed themselves for her to live. That was why she was running for her life when she passed out due to chakra exhaustion and the pain that reigned over her entire body. With thoughts that her pursuers might have captured her, she tensed and hurried to look up frantically at her surroundings. There was just water around her, a lot of water. She saw that she was inside of a boat. Her heart began to race a marathon as thoughts of being kidnapped and sold into another country to be a sex worker, maybe a slave for some fat rich man. Those kinds of thoughts ran rampant within her head. They were what she could think about given her situation and the fact that she was a woman. Women were being continuously kidnapped and sold to other countries to work as sex slaves. That could be the worst thing to happen to her. She certainly hoped that it was not something like that. Given that thought, she had a sense of hope creeping inside of her heart. Naruto found the situation amusing, seeing Yu Gao looking around frantically. She was obviously fearing the worst or imagining the worst. Well it would not be surprising though, given what the shinobi world had become. The strong devoured the weak. Women were seen as nothing but symbols of sex. Seeds of betrayals lay around everywhere. It was what the shinobi world had become. The shinobi world was a grim nightmare for the weak that had no one to protect them. You are finally awake. Naruto said with an amused voice, though his face expressed little emotion. 
Yu Gao visibly tensed as she looked at the direction, which the voice came from. The blonde hair, it was the same as she had seen before she lost consciousness. She looked at the figure. Bright blonde hair, Sharangan eyes, a barely visible Konoha forehead protector, bright red samurai like a moor and barely visible whisker marks on his cheeks. Her eyes widened as she got a clear look of person. There was no mistake about it. It was him. Naruto? As soon as she said the name, her fears became strangers to her. Yu Gao could not believe the image plastered across her mind. This was Naruto, the son of the Yondaime Hokage in front of her. Due to her Anbu status, she knew that Naruto was missing from Konoha's radars. To think that she could be the one to see him when she was not even looking for him was somewhat unbelievable. What were the odds? She felt somewhat relieved knowing that it was Naruto who saved her. The fact that he still wore a Konoha forehead protector meant that he was still loyal to the village. Seeing that he was still with Konoha made her feel at ease. Yu Gao looked at Naruto oddly. She studies him, the amour he wore in his long hair, the whisker marks in his eyes made him look admirable to her eyes. You are staring at me. Naruto stated simply looking at Yu Gao. Yu Gao looked away as she realized that she had been caught staring at him. Being caught in the act was somewhat embarrassing. However, it sounded like Naruto was neither bothered nor amused by her staring. How long have I been out? Yu Gao asked quietly. Two nights Naruto replied looking back to where the boat was headed. Yu Gao nodded with a sigh. Naruto was the one to have saved her, but what was unclear was who cleaned her upper wounds, bandaged and changed her clothes. Are you the one who did this to me? Yu Gao asked not narrowing her eyes at her body. Yu Gao had not noticed that Naruto was not looking at her. Naruto turned back to look at the woman. Yu Gao looked up at Naruto and figured that he did not understand what she meant. Did you bandage me? Yes Naruto replied his face having gone back to impassive. Bandaging her was not that much of a big deal. He did not think it was wrong or anything to do so, he did so because he did not mind. Yu Gao looked away with a blush spreading across her cheeks at the thought of Naruto cleaning up her wounds, bandaging her and putting on new clothes on her. He had to have seen her naked body. To have a male undress you and bandage you at your womanly parts was not comforting. He could have touched her inappropriately or done something perverted to her. She could never tell since she was out cold. Yu Gao looked at Naruto again seeing the blank expression on his face she scratched all her thoughts. Naruto seemed to be the kind of man who looks at her bare chest and not think of anything perverse or anything that was normal for a man to think upon seeing a woman's breasts. Perhaps he was just innocent, and did not understand such things. Yu Gao thought. When Naruto left the village he was still very young, even now despite reaching her height, he was still of young age. If that were the case he could have seemed uncomfortable, not directly face or blush when she asked him the question. Naruto's face was just blank as if he was not even interested in her body. Yu Gao sighed and thanked that she was alive. Her comrade's sacrifices were not for nothing. She was alive to see the days ahead. Thank you for saving me. Yu Gao thanked Naruto with a genuine smile. If you had been someone else I would have just left you there. Naruto said flatly. Why did you save me then, is it because I'm from Konoha? Yu Gao asked curiously. She was wondering why he would save her if he would have left her there had she been someone else. Even if you were a Konoha shinobi, I would have allowed you to die, Naruto replied, revealing that to him it did not matter if one was a shinobi from Konoha or not. If he did not want to help, he would not. However, you are like Kakashi. Both you two watched over me with concern and to your best of abilities each time you were stationed to watch over me the time the villagers used to get physical with me. Naruto stated. Even though he had never said anything to anyone, he never forgets what other people did for him during his younger days. It was why even today he can call Shikamaru a true friend given that the Nara heir befriended him just to help him get over his loneliness. Shikamaru was not forced or did not have any other hidden reasons to befriend him. Kakashi on the other hand kept a careful eye on him because he was the student of the Yondame. Kakashi saw the Yondame as a father figure, thus he thought of it as an important task to look after him given that Minato, his supposed father was dead. Yu Gao tried her best to fend off the villagers away from him simply because she thought it was wrong how the villagers treated him. She also cared for his well-being. Naruto had deduced that much from looking into her eyes whenever she was in front of him. She was also very close to Kakashi seeing that they used to work on the same squad. Yu Gao nodded understanding Naruto perfectly. If she was someone else, he could have left her to die simple because he did not care even though she was a Konoha Kunoichi. However, because she was someone else to have helped him in some way, 
he could not watch her die. Nevertheless, given the look on his face, she was sure he would not shed a tear if she had died somewhere he could not reach her. Still, knowing that he could save her life if he could, pleased her. Yu Gao smiled inwardly thinking that her senpai Kakashi would surely be happy when she tells him that Naruto would save him if he was about to be killed and Naruto was in a position to save him. Yu Gao looked around and asked something bugging her, where are we going? She asked. The hidden village in mist, Naruto replied. Kiri? Yu Gao said. Naruto was taking her to Kiri, the village is in the middle of a civil war and I have to go back to Konoha and give my report. Yu Gao said raising the tone of her voice. If she did not return to Konoha quickly, they would think she was dead and she was officially out of the village on a mission. She had to go back and make a report. I am of aware that Kiri is in the middle of a civil war. It is why I'm going there. Naruto said, Senju can wait for your report. You can return to Konoha after this boat reaches Kiri. Yu Gao nodded hesitantly, why are you going to Kiri? I'm going to test a few things. Yu Gao could have sworn Naruto's voice dripped with a bit of excitement. The way his tone sounded, she decided that she really did not want to know what he was going to test in Kiri. Some things were better left unsaid while some things were better off not known. A few minutes of silence ensured. The silence was unbearable for Yu Gao while Naruto did not mind it. Naruto would prefer the silence to a talking about things that he did not care about or things that would certainly bore him. Where have you been over the past two years? Jiraiya-sama has been looking for you and Tsunade-sama has had every Anbu outside Konoha on the lookout for your whereabouts. Yu Gao asked finding something to talk about. I was training somewhere safe. Naruto responded his eyes looking ahead of the sea. He was getting tired of sitting on the boat. The boat was not fast enough. There had not been any ship at the harbor. If there was any, he would have had to make a ship owner to take him to Kiri since there was no ship at the wave harbor that went to Kiri due to the civil war. All the ships had sailed off to somewhere and Naruto could not wait, thus he decided to take a boat. The trip would be longer when taking a boat but it beat having to wait for a ship to return. Waiting would have also given an opportunity to whoever was looking for him to get to him. At this moment, Naruto preferred not to deal with annoyances. Yu Gao was quiet again. She thought it better to be quiet and just endure the ride. Looking at Naruto, he seemed to enjoy the silence. She found it curious that Naruto was not asking her how things had been in Konoha. She could not tell whether he just did not care or he knew how things had been going. On another note, his amour gave him the look of a warrior. Not that in his Janan days he did not look like much of a fighter. One could tell he was a serious shinobi in his Janan days. Now he felt strong, looked strong, and with the amour and the war fan that lay beside him, he was not someone you would underestimate. In all her years as an Anbu, Yu Gao had learned that appearances could be deceiving. Naruto's appearance did not deceive anyone. That much she could tell. He appeared strong, and it was indeed true that he was strong. Two days of traveling in the ocean with Naruto were surprisingly interesting and relaxing for Yu Gao. She had learned a few things about Naruto while she conversed with him. He was very calm, even when large sea waves threatened to sink their boat, she never saw him panic. He remained as he was and just looked ahead. If there was anything he displayed because of the large waves, it was an annoyed expression. She could only guess that he was annoyed that the waves were disturbing his peace and making it hard for the boat to move on further. It was a situation to be alarmed and making plans to abandon ship but he was just annoyed. Instead of the waves making him panic and fear for his life it only managed to annoy him. She had been alarmed thinking that they would sink in the middle of the ocean. However, when she saw that Naruto was not even looking the slightest threatened she calmed herself down. Her outward appearance had remained calm due to her many years as Anbu, but she was panicking slightly due to the danger. Surely soon enough the waves passed and the boat continued on its path. Yu Gao was sure that Naruto would fall asleep in the middle of a battlefield without any worries. She really could not tell what was going on in his head. He was impossible to read when his face went blank. For someone trained like her as an Anbu, she should have had little trouble in reading him but it was impossible. Despite his calmness, she could tell that he was easily annoyed. From the way he spoke, she figured that he was proud. Yu Gao had asked Naruto a few questions about his father and she had found that he did not acknowledge the Yondaime as his father. Even if the man was still alive, Naruto would not waste a breath speaking to him. As soon as they reached port, Naruto took his gun by placing it to its comfort zone and started walking towards the clouded mist. Yu Gao followed Naruto, as she felt drawn to follow him. Naruto intended to help the rebels in their war against the Mizukage. 
He spoke as if he could end the war by himself something that was impossible to achieve in her belief. Nevertheless, she felt that she had to see what he could do. She would go back to Konoha as soon as she was done observing him. In addition, she had never been to Kiri before, this also gave her a chance to see the once great nation that was feared for its power. Kiri had a more bloodlines wielders than any other village. However, that now has all gone due to the civil war, which the bloodlines wielders are fighting against those without bloodlines. Kiri also had an elite force of shinobi that was called Kirikagir's Seven Great Swordsmen of the Mist. They were truly strong shinobi, who were known throughout the shinobi world for their power and achievements. The village was truly in chaos and has been like that for years now. Naruto noticed that Yugao was following him. He guessed that she had decided against going back to Konoha and give her report to Tsunade. He had expected her to go back to Konoha given that she would get into trouble with Tsunade for following him. She was also healed of her injuries. With her injuries gone, she could travel safely to Konoha. Naruto walked calmly within the mist, his armor singing as if it were announcing his presence. Naruto knew where the rebels' camp was located. He had Zetsu come to the village and collect intel on the conditions of the village. Kiri has so far secluded itself from the elemental nations. It was mainly due to the civil war that has seen many lose their lives. The other villages did not seem that they wanted to get involved with the civil matters of the village. Naruto could only think it was because of how other villages would react or fear that they might support the wrong side and create an enemy. Kumo could rid of these given their love for Bloodlines users. It was known everywhere that Kumagakura craved for Bloodline wielders. Naruto did not care why Kumo had not stepped up though. It was not worth his time to think why other villages did what they did. This unfortunate situation to the village has presented a good chance for him to test his strength and he would take it. Yu Gao walked closely behind Naruto listening to the sound as Amor conceived when he walked. Her senses were on high alert given that she could barely see within the thick mist. She did not know which direction they were taking. With the mist so dense, it was easy for them to be ambushed. Yu Gao was not taking any chances despite that Naruto seemed to be walking without care in the world. He did not seem to be on alert and did not even look around. His head was always facing the direction he took. Naruto narrowed his eyes to his right. There was a nuisance that was following them. Kiri Shinobi might be experts when it came to hiding in the mist but some of them that was all they could do. Beyond that, they were pathetic. The person following them was surely a Chunin level. A Chunin level Shinobi was an annoyance. Naruto wanted to just leave the mist and make it to the rebels camp. The Nin following Naruto and Yu Gao suddenly lunged himself in front of Naruto. Yu Gao visibly tensed upon seeing the Nin. She was ready to battle if things got out of hand. Unlucky for the Nin, Naruto was waiting for him. Despite his Sharingan not being able to see clearly due to the mist, his other senses were sharp as a needle. Naruto's right hand moved quickly and gripped the Nin's neck tightly. The Nin struggled to catch his breath because of the cold grip. Naruto held a ram seal. Obey! He muttered putting the Nin under a Genjutsu to control him with his Sharingan. The man's eyes took the form of a Sharingan. This signaled that the hypnosis was a success. Hurt yourself. Naruto commanded. Yu Gao did not understand what was really happening but she did not like the situation in front of her. Naruto was just being cruel. The man hesitated to do as he was told. Naruto snapped the man's neck, threw him away, and continued walking. Was that really necessary Naruto? Yu Gao asked. Yes, Naruto replied. He hesitated what he was told which meant my genjutsu was not perfect, he said flatly. Imperfection was not acceptable to him. The man might have been their enemy as he attacked them but killing him simply because something was tried on him and the results were not what was expected was just cruel. Moreover, he had a good reason for attacking them given that they were not in their territory. They were in his territory. Yu Gao kept her thoughts to herself and decided to let it go before she annoyed Naruto by questioning his actions. After what seemed to an hour of traveling through the mist, the two finally left the company of the mist. Yu Gao no longer walked behind Naruto but now she was at his right side. The large gates of Kiri welcomed them. From the intel Zetsu gathered, Naruto knew that the rebels controlled this side of the village. Where the gates were located, but their camps were not near the gates. The entrance was just one of their territories. A territory they claimed after defeating the Yondaime Mizukage's forces. The Mizukage's forces were not that of quality shinobi but rather boasted quantity. They had more shinobi than the rebels did. Their numbers would certainly overwhelm the rebels. Their numbers gave them an advantage, which was why the war had dragged on for so long. 
the rebels were now destroying piece by piece of their enemy's forces. It was a slow progress but it got them the results they needed. Patrol Guards Ow, the rebel leader's right-hand man, narrowed his eyes at the mist. His right eye hidden under an eye patch was seeing two people walking towards the gates. His right eye was an implanted Byakugan. He could see everything within the mist. There are two people coming towards the gates, a man and a woman. Ao said to his men. The men Ao was with got ready for an attack. Yaguras the Mizukage forces had a habit of trying to ambush them and take out their strongest to lower their morale and confidence. None of the attempts has been successful thus far. Nevertheless, it would surely end badly for them should they underestimate their enemies because of their previous failures. As the two people walked out of the dense mist, Ao's eyes widened when his Byakugan saw the chakra coils within the man. He had never a person with such large coils before. Not ever since, he got the implanted Byakugan. With those large chakra coils, there was no telling what how much chakra the person held. Ao studied the female. Judging from her chakra and movements, she was definitely Jounin level Kunoichi. Get ready, they are getting close, Ao said in a serious tone. Should they be our enemies I will take on the male, you take on the female. Hi. Naruto and Yugao walked towards the gates in a rather relaxed pace. They had already reached Kiri, it was no use running now. Naruto knew what to expect at the gates. Zetsu had given him all the information he needed about the rebels and their leader. Halt! Ao yelled, state you business. Ao commanded. Naruto and Yugao were just in front of Ao. His men were hiding in the shadows waiting to take action should there be a threat posed by the two. Ao recognized the Konoha forehead protector on Naruto's forehead. He recognized the Sharingan. Last time he heard about Uchiha was that the clan had been massacred. The person in front of him was not Uchiha Itachi, the man responsible for the massacre. It made him curious just as to who was the young man in front of him. He could clearly see that Naruto was a young. The woman was not wearing a forehead protector but she was defiantly a ninja. Take me to your leader. Naruto stated his eyes looking directly at Ao's eyes. Tell me who you are. Uchiha Naruto, Uzumaki Naruto, call me whatever that pleases you, I don't mind. Naruto replied. Yu Gao noted that he did not mention his other name, Namikaze. Naruto was never going to accept that name despite it being his birth name. What does a Konoha Shinobi want with my leader? Ao questioned. He was not going to allow anyone to get to his leader without finding out who he or she was. He wants to take part in your war against the Mizukage's forces. Yu Gao replied having got the feeling that Naruto did not like being questioned. Ao narrowed his eyes suspiciously at the two, why? How do I even know that you are not trying to assassinate our leader? Ao, Naruto said revealing that he knew the man, I do not assassinate, that is just a weak man's way of killing someone. If I wanted to kill Mei, I would have simply just killed you here and match into your camps and kill her. Naruto replied. Ao looked at Naruto carefully. He knew about their leader in him it must mean that he had intel on them. Back in his days young man at Naruto's age were not so blunt like Naruto. Naruto had just said he could kill him if he wanted to. Ao looked at Yu Gao, to his eyes she seemed like a good person. Looks could be deceiving but for someone like him who has lived for many years, it was hard to deceive him. He could not say that Naruto was a good person. If he really wanted to help, it was not for him to accept or refuse. What is your name? Ao asked looking at Yu Gao. Uzuki Yugao Yugao replied with a smile. Fine I will let you see Mei-sama, Ao said and then moved closer to Naruto, if you attempt to do anything to Mei-sama, I will kill you and the young lady. Ao threatened dangerously with a fierce look on his face. Naruto would have been amused if Ao had threatened him only. However, the man threatened to kill Yugao, the woman he had saved. If something like that happened his efforts would have been proved useless. Something like that was unacceptable. Naruto's left eye looked dangerously at Ao. If you say things like that again, you will not be okay. Naruto stated in a rather calm tone but dangerous nonetheless. Ao felt shivers down his spine. Back in his days, young men were respectful on their elders and did not threaten them. Follow me. Ao said and turning his back on Naruto and Yu Gao. Yu Gao followed closely beside Naruto. She had heard when Ao threatened Naruto. She was just glad that Naruto or Ao did not end up fighting over the threat Ao had made. The Rebels Camp The place was crowded with men and women. Despite the situation that has fallen in their village, they all seemed to be happy. They had hoped that one day they would be free from oppression from the Mizukage. 
Not everyone in the camp was a bloodline holder. The camp was composed of those who were against the Yondaime Mizukage's rule. Bloodline holders were seen as nothing more than monsters, abomination in the eyes of the Mizukage and his followers. They were viewed as such only because they were blessed with special abilities. Abilities that made them different from everyone, abilities that made them stronger than other people. One could only say that it was greed that led non-bloodline holders to side with the Mizukage's deranged beliefs in eliminating every bloodline holder. Despite this, they still laughed and smiled within their camps with the belief that one day they would return to their village under a new rule that will accept everyone, a rule that would allow them to live in their village in peace without fear of being killed. While the three walked towards the tent of the rebels' leader, people often sent glances at them. It was not every day that they had visitors and seeing Naruto and Yugao walk with their second and command them wonder. For Naruto everyone could see he was a shinobi given his attire. Yugao noted that some women were looking at Naruto with strange looks on their faces. Not that she could blame them anyway. Naruto just walked calmly his eyes looking around the camp. Even without any support from any other villages, the rebels still held on in their belief. They did not seem like people without hope. They were people filled with courage and confidence. Their courage was admirable given that their enemy was a Jinchuriki of the Three Tails. Yagura is rumored to be able to fully control his Baiju's chakra. Going against a Jinchuriki who could wipe out an entire army should he use the power of his Baiju was admirable given that they were not wavering. Ao stopped Naruto and Yugao as they had reached the large tent in the middle of the camp. The tent belonged to the leader. Ao walked towards the entrance and announced his presence before walking inside the tent. Mei was sitting rather comfortably. Without Yagura showing up to face them himself, the civil war would take long to be over. The village would not be able to survive more years of the war that is raining on it. Mei was relaxed because for a few months now there have not been any major victories over Yagura's forces. It was not that they were being defeated it was just that they had retreated to their bases. Given their numbers, they could not just storm into their faces to fight. They would be massacred if they did something like that. Mei looked at her entrance as she heard Ao speak. Ao, Mei said, are you done with your patrol duty? She asked. Ao shook his head negative, no, I left my men patrolling. He replied walking closer to Mei who was sitting on a rather large comfortable chair behind her desk. What brings you back then? Mei-sama, Ao said, there is a Konoha shinobi outside with a young woman. He said he wants to see you. Ao said, drawing Mei's complete attention. Ao was giving Mei a look she knew better than anyone did. What is it, Ao? I do not trust him, you should be careful around him. Just in case he tries something, I will stay with you. Mei smiled at how Ao was concerned for her health. He was always like this, always thinking as if she could not take herself. Ao, are you suggesting that I cannot take care of myself? Mei asked in a rather sweet tone. Ao shifted uncomfortably, and no, Mei sama he replied. Mei smiled, good, now bring them to me. Ao walked away from Mei quickly to take Naruto and Yugao to her. Mei was rather interested in hearing what the Konoha shinobi wanted. She always took Ao's concerns seriously, if Ao said he did not trust the Konoha shinobi she would certainly have her guard up. Mei quickly rose up from her seat as soon as her eyes were upon Naruto. She walked over to welcome him and Yu Gao. God was he handsome, she did not see such handsome young men often. Naruto looked at Mei. She was a slender woman with green eyes, and ankle-length auburn hair styled into a herringbone pattern at the back, a topknot tied with a dark blue hand, and with four bangs in the front. Two bangs were short, one covering her right eye, and two other were long, crossing each other at her bust, just below her chin. She wore a long-sleeved dark blue dress that falls just below her knees. It was closed at the front with a zip, and was kept open at the front right side from the waist down. The dress only covered her upper side of her arms and the underside of her breasts. Underneath she wore a mesh armor that covered slightly more of her upper body than her dress. She also wore a dark blue short skirt underneath her dress, and underneath her skirt, mesh leggings reaching down over her knees. She wore a belt around her waist and high-heeled sandals. Zetsu did not describe her in the way he was seeing right now. She was quite different from Zetsu's description. Mei Terumi, dual bloodline holder and the leader of the rebels. Naruto said. You know of me? Mei stated with a warm smile, you are? Naruto Naruto said. Mei waited for something. Uzumaki, Uchiha call me whatever that pleases you. I will call you Uchiha Uzumaki Naruto, if that's okay with you. Mei said with warm smile that would melt any other man's heart. 
Naruto had no objections with what she was calling him. Mei stretched out her hand inviting Naruto for a handshake. Naruto welcomed the invite. Mei studied Naruto for a while as she shook his hand. She was rather surprised by the fact that he was not checking any part of her body, his eyes were firmly on hers. That did not occur, even her own man always checked her out whenever they were looking at her. She let go of Naruto's hand, and looked at Yugao, Mei Terumi. She introduced with a smile. Uzuki Yugao. Yugao could very well say that Mei was a beautiful woman. She was the kind of woman that any other woman would feel threatened. She was just exquisite. She was sure if Jiraiya could just look at the woman he would stop peeping if she promised to allow him to explore at her for as much as he pleased. Mei wondered if Yu Gao was the reason Naruto was not checking her out. That aside, Ao had said Naruto wanted to see her, Ao, Mei called out, take Yu Gao san to see around the camp while I see our visitor wants. Are you sure Mei sama? Leaving her with someone who wielded the Sharingan would be irresponsible for him. Their enemy, Yagura is rumored to be controlled with a Sharingan's genjutsu. Ao. Mei said warning Ao not to question her orders. Ao nodded, albeit reluctantly. Yu Gao was not sure if it was okay to leave Naruto alone with someone like Mei alone. She was not sure what the woman might try to do to Naruto while she was not present. The woman had a smile that would hypnotize most into doing what she pleased. She did not want Naruto to be put under the woman's spell. Naruto had saved her life, it was hers time to protect his. Let's go Yu Gao san. Ao said to Yu Gao. Yu Gao stood still for a moment not sure what to do. Naruto looked at her with a blank expression. She sighed and followed Ao outside the tent. Mei showed Naruto a chair in front of her desk. Naruto unstrapped his gun by and placed it beside him. He eyes moved on to Mei. Mei still had her smile planted on her face. It did not bother Naruto, it did not matter to him if she smiled or not. So, Naruto why did you want to see me? Mei asked looking at Naruto. I'm offering my services to you. Naruto replied. Services? You are from Konoha, were you sent here to help by your Hokage? Mei asked curiously. No, the Hokage does not even know I'm here. Naruto replied. Then why? I want to test my strength in a few jutsus, I also do want to put an end to Yagura. He is making Jinchuriki and the Uchiha look bad. Naruto replied knowing about the rumor that Yagura was being manipulated by a powerful genjutsu casted by a Sharingan. Naruto was not yet sure if it was indeed true but all the information Zetsu had brought back to him proved that the man was not himself. At first Yagura was a peaceful man, but that changed overnight and he became what he was today. Those are your reasons? You have no hidden agendas? Even if he had other agendas he would not tell her but it did not hurt to ask. No. Naruto replied simply. Mei nodded, you are just one young handsome man, how do you think that will change things for us? Numbers are of no concern, what matters is quality. You people tend to underestimate the power of Uchiha. Naruto replied calmly. No, not at all. I am not underestimating the power of Uchiha. I am just curious as to how you can be able to make things to be in our favor. Mei stated honestly. Naruto thought for a moment. He did not boast about his power alone without actions. He let his power do the talking for him. Still it did not matter if Mei believed him or not. He was going to enter the war and entertain himself. I know everything that has been going on in this camp. I know that you have been trying to force Yagura into coming out and fight himself with no success thus far. Naruto stated not bothering to convince Mei that his strength alone could change things into their favor, I can do that for you. How? I have my ways. Naruto replied with a smile as he thought of a better way to force Yagura into battle. Mei noticed Naruto's smile. It was the first time she was seeing him smile ever since he came into her tent. Care to tell me this way of yours? Mei asked, curious, although bothered by the fact that Naruto was not giving her any answers she was looking for. Naruto looked at the woman for a moment. She was not going to let it go unless he told her what she wanted to know. Releasing a sigh, he motioned for Mei to lean closer to him. Mei did as instructed without any worry, I have the Kyubi by my side. I can summon it to destroy Yagura's forces. Naruto whispered to Mei's ear. To make the woman stop her questions he had to tell her that. Mei's eyes widened as she heard the name Kyubi. Last time she heard of the Kyubi it was when it attacked Konoha. It was when the Yondaime Hokage died sealing it. The Yondaime, Naruto did look like the Yondaime except for the Sharingan eyes. 
The Cubi was known by many as a natural disaster. It was the most powerful of the Baijus. If one had such a Baiju in their side, the war was guaranteed to be won by them. Tell me are you related to the Yondaime Hokage? You look like him. A lot of people do say that. Naruto said, no. I am not related to Minato. May noted that Naruto called the Yondaime by his name in a detached tone. Which made her curious, but she was not going to ask about it for now. I find it hard to believe that you can summon the Kyubi, last time I checked it was sealed. It was indeed sealed, but not anymore, Naruto said, you will get to see it in a few days. Mei was quiet for a moment. Naruto did not seem to be the kind of person to make jokes. He also sounded truthful. Though she could not guess what he was thinking, it bothered her greatly. Fine, I will take your word for it until I see the QB, Mei said leaning back to her chair, to tell you the truth I would have accepted your help regardless of how strong you were. Right now, I need all the help I can get for the war to end. Mei said truthfully. I few discuss a few things with you tomorrow, right now I'm sure you might want to rest, she said, will you and Yu Gao San be sharing a tent? No. Oh, I thought you and her were, never mind that, Mei said, so you are single then. Naruto raised a brow at her question but nodded nonetheless. Good, Mei said with a wide smile and a gleeful look in her eyes, it is very rare these days to find handsome young man single these days. Naruto chose not to let his mind wander at Mei's words, thus he did not comment. Follow me, I will show you where you will be staying. Mei said getting up from her chair. Naruto picked up his gun by and followed the woman. As they walked around Naruto observed that the rebels held respect for Mei as their leader regardless of the fact that she was a woman. Some men were even glaring at Naruto for merely being in the company of their beautiful leader. It was a wonder how Mei could live with so many men and few women comfortably. She was always surrounded by men, who looked at her with lust. Mei showed Naruto his tent and went back to her tent to get some things done. An hour later. Naruto lay at the bed inside his tent. He was not wearing his armor, instead, he wore the black suit worn over his armor. He had decided to take it off since he would not be fighting. Not a lot of thoughts were dancing inside his head. He wanted to test out a few jutsus and the limits of his strength. It would be a rather foolish for him to believe that his strength had no limits. Everybody has their limits, it is just a matter of knowing them and finding a better use for them. However, Naruto doubted that there would be anyone within Yagura's forces that would push him. Nevertheless, fighting out his limits was important. A man who did know his own limits was bound to see himself as a god, a man above everyone. Naruto did know those that were below him, he just needed to know where his limits were. A knock on his tent's door snapped him out of his thoughts. Come in. Yu Gao entered Naruto's tent. She saw Naruto lying down with his head resting on both his hands, eyes looking at her for a moment before going back up. Yu Gao was not sure where to sit as the tent had no chair and the only place to sit was on Naruto's bed. It would make her uncomfortable sitting on Naruto's bed while he was lying on it. She looked at Naruto, it was rather hard to tell whether he was oblivious to her thoughts or he just did not care. She doubted that he was oblivious though. Sighing Yu Gao went to sit on Naruto's bed. How did it go? Well Naruto replied, it was obvious that she was asking how his meeting with Mei Terumi went. Yu Gao nodded her eyes firmly on the ground. She was finding the moment rather uncomfortable sitting beside Naruto on his bed with just the two of them. Naruto might be younger than her but he was still a male, a rather desirable male. The fact that she thought he was desirable disturbed her. She had known him ever since he was just a kid. She had always cared for his well-being. After his transformation, she had thought he would grow into a fine young man. Regardless of those thoughts, she never actually thought that she would find herself being uncomfortable by just being alone with him. Aren't you concerned about what the council will do after they find out you helped the rebels after they had refused to help them? Yu Gao asked deciding to rid of her troubling thoughts. No, Naruto replied. There was nothing that the council to be precise the elders would do that he could not handle. If they were proving to be more troubling than they were worth, he could just make sure that they were not okay. They had lived enough already. I was not aware that the rebels asked help from Konoha and were refused. Not a lot of people know about it. I doubt even some council members are aware of it, Yu Gao said, Mei San went to Konoha a few years ago asking help from Konoha. The civil war had just began at that time, but the Sandai Mei and the elders refused to help. Refusing to help the needy, that sounds unlike the Sandai Mei but then again, one could never really tell what the old man was thinking, Naruto said, either way their decision works better for me. 
Had Konoha helped the rebels, Naruto would not be having this chance to test a few things. Yugao decided not to comment on Naruto's last statement. Ever since the transformation, Naruto lost all the connection, he had with the Sandaime. She knew that the Sandaime may have been a kind man but he was not above manipulating others and things for the good of Konoha. You don't seem to fear the council, to be more precise the elders like every other shinobi. Yugao commented. Naruto did not seem to be worried about what the elders might decide to do about his actions. He was here in Kiri intending to fight with the rebels as shinobi of Konoha without approval from the council. On top of that, there was still another issue about his departure from the village. Not anyone was willing to disobey the council in fear of their wrath. That is because unlike any other shinobi they cannot do anything to me and I don't actually care what they say. If they banish me, I can just live the village and return once they are dead. Naruto responded calmly. Yu Gao took her eyes off the floor for a moment and looked at Naruto. She could not believe that he had just said something like that. Not even Jiraiya was willing to do something that would get him banished from Konoha. Konoha was his home, it was what he lived for, and Konoha was his heart. Some people would rather die than be exiled from the village. It was why many did not do anything against the wishes of the council. However, Naruto was willing to and had done things that did not please the council. He was certainly an interesting person. How long are we going to be here? We? Naruto asked with a raised brow, but did not wait for Yugao to reply, I will be here for two or three weeks. He said. Yugao nodded, are you going back to Konoha you are done here? No, I still have other things to do before that. He had about three months before he could return to Konoha and face the annoying music of the council. It would certainly be interesting to see what they had planned for him. Yugao nodded, it was not her place to tell him to return to Konoha, not that it would make any difference if she did tell him to return. She would be in trouble though, for not doing anything to make him return to the village when all Anbu were instructed by the Hokage to force him to return if they did come across him. I guess I should get accustomed to the weather of here then, Yu Gao stated. The weather here was different from Konoha. In Konoha it was mostly sunny, but here it was rather cold. When you found me, did I have my sword with me? Yu Gao asked. If she was going to stay in the village, she had to train to make sure that her skills did not dull. Anbu always had to be in their top fighting condition. Yes. Naruto replied. Is it of value to you? He had a weapon that was of value to him, his gun by. Madara had given it to him as a gift. Should it somehow disappear, he would do anything to get it back. Yes. Yu Gao replied after a few moments of silence. The late Hayate who she had trained with in Kenjutsu had given the sword to her. Do you have it? No. It is in the wave country at Kasara's weapons shop. You will get it when you go back to Konoha. Naruto replied. Yu Gao let loose of a breath she did not know she was holding. She was relieved to know that her gift was not lost. Thank you for taking it there. She said with a genuine smile. Naruto made no comment. I'd better be going to my tent. With that being said, she stood up and left Naruto alone. Naruto sighed and closed his eyes. Just sitting without any activity being done did not dwell well with him, well that was unless he was enjoying the peace around him. Where he was, there was no peace. People around him carried the weight of a civil war, they carried hatred for the forces of Yagura. There could never be peace where hatred was found in abundance. May's tent. May was a bit pleased to have found help despite it being one person. Even if was just one person, that person was a Uchiha. The Uchiha clan was known to be one of the most powerful clans beside the Senju. It was those two clans that made Konoha what it is today, the strongest of the five great hidden villages. Tomorrow, she would have to test his strength and see what he could do, though she doubted he would allow her to test him. Another thing was that he had said that he could summon the QB. She did not know what to think about it. She would believe it when she does see the QB. It was not very often that one would just say that he or she could summon the QB. If it was indeed true he could summon it, they could end the civil war overnight. The QB alone could win the war for them. However, from stories she had heard the QB was not a fan of humans. It hated humans with all its being. There was something about Naruto that made her want to believe that he could summon the QB. She might not have been able to read him but she could tell that he was not the one to joke around. She could not tell if he was being honest or just lying. His voice was blank along with his face. Al walked into May's tent. May smiled warmly upon seeing him. He had taken long to return, she guessed that after showing Yu Gao around he must have gone back to his patrol duty. Anything new? 
Al shook his head, no, I don't think they will make a move anytime soon unless we provoke them hard enough. May frowned, the bastard Yagura was not even trying to attack them. He was just leaving them alone. It was as if he did not care if they build their military strength. She hated the fact she was not strong enough to defeat him by herself. Yagura was a cage-level shinobi on his own without the use of his Baiju's chakra. Ao saw the frown on May's face and decided to tell her something good. Kujuro will be returning tomorrow, I got the word while I was with my men patrolling. May smiled at the news, well that's good to know that he will return safely, she stated, what did you learn? May asked getting on to another subject. The woman is fairly honest and seems to be trustworthy, Ao said, she also revealed that Naruto brought her here with him after saving her from being captured by shinobis who were chasing her. I can say that is the truth. May nodded and smiled afterwards, well I'm glad I decided to accept his help, May stated. I figured you might do something like that, Al said taking a thoughtful look on his face, back in my days woman did not just allow men to enter their house without taking them through a series of tests to see if they were trustworthy. Al, shut up. May said, no threatened in a rather sweet tone that made Al pale. Normally when she spoke like that, her words ended with kill you. Anyway, I had some of our best man spy on Naruto and Yugao san one can never be careful. May nodded, though she wished he did not do it. Still, it did not hurt if he did it. May and Ao discussed a few things before Ao went away as it had gotten late. Three nights later. Things had been rather quiet at the rebels camp ever since Naruto had arrived. He was getting bored with having nothing to do. He always liked to keep himself busy by doing something useful. However, here, he could not do anything. Over the past days, all he did was converse with Mei and Yu Gao. He ignored everyone else as they were of no interest to him. Mei had introduced him to Kujuro a young lad who wielded the twin sword Haramkare. Kujuro had confidence issues, he was the same as Hinata in many ways. Both are shy, timid, low self-confidence and personality problems. The full moon illuminated the earth as Naruto sat peacefully on top of a hill just outside of the camp. At the bottom of the hill, there were four men and a woman lying on the ground peacefully. They had been knocked out because Naruto them annoying. They had been spying on him for a while and he just got tired of letting them continue. He was still without his amour and gun by. His blood-red eyes scanned around the hills that surrounded the camp. After the hills there was nothing, it was just a clear landscape like a field. Naruto narrowed his eyes behind as he sensed someone. The chakra signature had become rather familiar to him. Mei climbed on top of the hill holding a small container. Naruto noticed the dark blue, color of the cloth the woman was wearing. She was not wearing the clothes she had been wearing during day. What she was wearing was like a nightdress, Naruto could not really tell. The only thing he could tell was that it was blue, a color the woman seemed to favor. What happened to them? Mei asked referring to her shinobi lying beneath the hill they sat. They are just sleeping. They must be the shinobi Ao sent to spy on you, Mei said, I brought you some food, I was told you did not collect your meals. She said handing Naruto the container she was carrying. Naruto took it and placed it beside him. The view looks nice from here, and the gentle breeze is refreshing. Mei said. Yes, it does. Naruto replied. You know every man I have met always stare at me. They often look at me with looks of lust. However, you only looked at me once, you did not even stare while I was looking away. Mei said getting to what was bothering her. Your question being? Why don't you act like other men? Naruto looked up to the heaves as he replied, that is because I have no interest in seeing what is under your dress and I do act like others because I don't think like others. Perhaps it is because you are young and are innocent when it comes to woman. May said with a teasing smile. My age is of no consequence, Naruto stated, I am not innocent. That being said, I know everything about a woman's body. May seemed interested in what Naruto had just said, you know everything about a woman's body? Yes, Naruto replied with a disinterested expression. Are you talking about a real woman, fully developed women? Mei asked finding it hard to believe that Naruto has looked at a woman's body and has no desire to do it again. A real woman, you mean one such as yourself? Mei nodded, yes, I have found myself at the receiving end of what is called pleasures of a woman's body. Naruto replied with a blank expression. Mei stared at Naruto with a rather large question mark on her face. How does anyone speak about the pleasures of a woman's body and still look like that? There must be something wrong with you. Mei said, when was that? Two years ago, Naruto replied, it was part of my training. 
one of my goals is to restore the Uchiha clan, I cannot restore a clan if I do not know how to, thus I went to a brothel to learn how I will be able to restore a clan. Naruto replied calmly. It was his purpose to restore the Uchiha clan. Madara had told him everything about how children were made sex and he had read about it himself. However, he never actually tried it to for himself. One did not read a jutsu scroll and not practice how to use it. You had to try perfecting the required hand seals and chakra to be able to use the jutsu perfectly. With that mindset, Naruto went to a brothel to test the jutsu for restoring the Uchiha clan. Mei chuckled lightly at Naruto's revelation, you do know that sooner or later you are going to have to be interested in what is beneath a women's dress to be able to get someone to restore your clan with you, right? I am aware of that, Naruto replied taking the container Mei had given him. You are leaving? Yes, I can no longer tolerate this subject. Naruto responded as he began to walk down the hill. Are you just uncomfortable with talking about it with me? Mei asked with a teasing tone, not that it worked on Naruto. No, my current mindset is not programmed to find such subject enjoyable or interesting. What it is programmed to find interesting is what I came here to do. Naruto replied. You speak as if your mind can be programmed like a machine. Mei said following Naruto from behind. At the bottom of the hill, the shinobis Naruto had knocked out were already awake and gone back into their hiding positions. To achieve perfect results one's mind must be treated as such. Naruto replied without look back at Mei. I cannot allow distractions to lead me astray to my goal, you are proving to be quite a distraction. Mei followed Naruto from behind. If he called her a distraction, he must have had some thoughts creeping inside his head. How am I being a distraction? She asked with an innocent look on her face. You flirt too much and are rather blunt about what you desire or your interests. Naruto replied. The woman was always flirting with him whenever she got the chance. Even a blind man would notice. Had it not been for his self-control, he might have already started flirting with her too. Well that is because I'm a woman who knows what she wants. Naruto raised a brow, has such a tactic work for you? Mei shrugged, so Naruto continued. Oh? So you have yet to use such tactic because you have yet to find a more suitable mate. He said. As soon as those words left Naruto's mouth. Mei froze, mate, husband, husband, husband. She began to think in her frozen state. Naruto did not bother to wait for her. He continued on walking away leaving the woman standing alone. 